Good morning, and I think we are fresh and ready for yet another day of exciting lectures, good procedures, wonderful interaction. Some of you have attended the breakfast sessions, which were packed, and I, I, the feedback that I got, they were really enjoyable and made you wiser than what you went in with. So we are ready to start today's program Jayanti is there on the chair but before that I have just one announcement to make there is a survey and one of our uh, residents will be carrying an iPad to some of you who have not filled it up it's just regarding women in GI endoscopy very brief very easy to fill up she will come to each one of you with an iPad and it's my sincere request that all of you kindly do the needful, give your opinion so that we can progress further. The program for today is the same. We have a set of lectures till just before lunch and then we have a live workshop for four hours with lunch splitting the workshop in two halves. With these few words, I think Jayanti, we can call the first group of people. Shannon has already loaded her slides. We are ready. Good morning to one and all. Uh, we start the first session today. I call upon our moderators for this session, Dr. Sharada, who is the senior consultant at Yashoda Hospital, Hyderabad, and Dr. Pallavi Garg, who is a senior consultant from Max Super Speciality Hospital, Haryana. And we request them to introduce the speaker. Dr. Mukta. Come, 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 come. You can also join here. Yeah. Dr. Sharda, please come. Please introduce the speaker. Okay. 
So good morning everyone it's a pleasure to invite Dr Shannon Melissa Chan she is currently the assistant professor in the division of upper gastrointestinal and metabolic surgery in the Chinese University of Hong Kong she completed her general surgery training and re received fellowship of the college of surgeons of Hong Kong and Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh she did her overseas training in National Cancer Center Tokyo Her special interest is GI cancer mainly focusing laparoscopic and robotic approach. Dr Chan has also devoted herself to humanitarian aid work. In 2014 she joined the Medicine uh, MSF which is the international humanitarian non-governmental organization working in war torn and underdeveloped regions. She joined her surgical missions to South Sudan from October 16 to December 16 and Yemen from December 19 to Feb 20. and she affirmed her commitment to providing humanitarian aid to the less developed parts of the world so over to you dr chan uh, thank you for a kind introduction and once again thank you dr uh, uh, nagi of course coming to our workshop every single year to hong kong and also for organizing this impeccable uh, workshop and also thank you for having me uh, being the most junior faculty um, today so i feel very honored and at the same time very humble to be presenting this topic in front of my seniors and uh, and all the endoscopists who are more experienced than i am so if you have anything to add i'd be happy um, uh, to to uh, to discuss and, and to learn from you all also um at the end of the talk so i was given the uh, mission uh to talk about eos guided biliary drainage do's and don'ts so uh back in to uh in uh 2018 the asian eos group actually published its consensus guideline on the optimal management of interventional eos procedures which includes eos biliary drainage and if you have time um this is a very informative um paper to read from So in a in a slide uh, let me introduce the different uh types of US biliary drainage procedures that you can choose from so you can either do a cholecysto um duodenostomy with a fully covered um biliary stent or you can use a hot axios and a plus or minus a double pick towel within or uh, you can do a hepatogastrostomy with a geobore or uh, you can also do gallbladder drainage with the axios or a aspexis Uh, you can also uh, deal with benign uh, diseases with uh, anti-grade uh, balloon extraction or anti-grade metal stenting. So US biliary drainage was actually first uh, published by um, uh, Professor Giovannini uh, back in 2001. The reported cumulative technical success rate is very high, but of course it also comes with its adverse events and complications up to 17%. So this is uh, one of the um videos uh that was done uh by me quite some time ago uh so you can see here this is a cholecysto um cholecystoco duodenostomy procedure i use the hot axios this is the 6 mm hot axios stent uh it the needle went in the guide wire went in well and the hot axios went in well So at back in those days um we were told to look for the black mark. So you can see that the distal flange was deployed very nicely. So um I struggled a little bit to look for the black mark in the luminous side. And um you can see here uh that the distal flange was actually pulled out of the CBD. So uh how do you uh, prevent these situations and uh, how do you uh, manage these complications? So of course there's like the do's and don'ts that you prepare yourself with. So um according to a uh, Hara Sensei's uh uh paper in 2016, uh these US interventional procedures should only be done by an experienced endoscopist who had done 20 procedures um under tutor supervision and who are both well trained in EOS and ERCP. Of course you have to be proficient in EOS uh, FMB and all these things and start from simple procedures like a pseudocyst drainage one drainage and move up to um biliary drainage procedures. So the do's before the procedure is to understand the indication, read the CT, know the anatomy, know your options, know your different cards, know your instruments and always do your early procedures with very experienced nurses and technicians and get supervision if you need. 
So when you talk about indication, um, you realize that the most un un unindicated procedures are actually usually the most difficult procedures when the bowels are not dilated enough, when the gallbladder is not dilated enough, there is ascites and things. So these are cases which are most unindicated, but they have the most high chance of complication. So you should always avoid um, putting yourself into these situations and uh, hurting your patient. Second, you need to understand the um, indication, whether it's a benign indication or a malignant um, indication to decide what kind of biliary drainage procedures you want. So for biliary obstructions and you're draining the bowel duct, are the ducts dilated enough? And if you're draining the gallbladder, is the gallbladder distended enough? So before the procedure, always read the CT. So of course you read the anatomy, you read whether the ducts are dilated, you read about the, um, the cancer, how invasive it is. But there are also specific things that you might want to look for. For malignant biliary obstructions, a lot of these cases has portal vein uh, thrombosis, and so they also do come with gastric viruses and esophageal viruses, which can be evident on CT scan. Of course, during the procedure itself, you'll be able to see it, but knowing beforehand uh, will give you a heads up and to be precautious about these, um, avoiding these viruses. And if you're doing an HGS procedure, um, always try to look for presence of left lobe liver metastasis, which might be in your way when you try to puncture the duts and of course always look for ascites which you would want to drain uh, before the procedure itself. So each time when I do an EUS biliary drainage um, I always think of the different plans that I have in case plan A fails you have plan B and plan C and plan D. So when you talk about these plans you need to know your options and the anatomical considerations. So if you drain the bowel duct you can actually consider doing it the transhepatic route uh, but which is like through the lesser curve to the left lobe of the liver or the um, extra hepatic route through um, the duodenum. You can do it transmirally or transpapillarily or you can drain the gallbladder. So the transpapillary drainage would include um, home rendezvous technique usually for benign indications or the anti-grade um, metal stenting. Um, for the transmural options, it includes the CDS uh, and the HGS, and of course, you can always drain the gallbladder if all of these options fail you. So you need to know first the level of obstruction. So if it is a distal obstruction, and then the second question is, is the papilla accessible? So if the papilla is accessible and there is a distal obstruction, first thing you do, of course, is an ERCP. So for EOS fanatics, they think of uh, whether CT, CDS can be done as a primary procedure to replace ERCP. So you think of the uh, potential benefits of it. So if you do a CDS in, for example, a CA head of pancreas causing biliary obstruction, the benefits is that you can avoid the traumatic papillary manipulation that might lead to um, acute pancreatitis. So you may be able to avoid pancreatitis with a CDS. And the ability to access a bowel duct even when the papilla cannot be accessed. And you're actually placing the stent away from the tumor. So theoretically, the stent ingrowth and re-intervention should be lower. So is this the case? So there are actually several, uh, three RCTs out right now. I'm trying to study whether primary drainage through EOS is better than primary ERCP. So I quote this paper from G, one of our faculty um, in this conference. Um, back in 2018, they randomized um, 60 uh, patients, 30 in each group, and they actually found that for um, ERCP and primary um, EOS drainage, there are similar technical and clinical success rates, and to our surprise, the adverse events are similar. So in in terms of pancreatitis, in terms of reintervention, they are similar. So also in this recent uh, abstract that we presented in ESGE, so is this uh, study was uh, performed by Professor Anthony Teo from our center. So we also randomized um, cases with distal biliary obstruction to CDS versus ERCP. So the result was that CDS um, achieved a higher technical success rate. It was a quicker procedure, but in terms of outcomes, there was no difference. So when you look at the mortality, uh, the 30-day adverse events, which include pancreatitis, and we did do a subgroup analysis on pancreatitis itself, there was no difference. And there was also no difference in the re-intervention rate in one year. It was actually quite a surprising result, but this is the um, result of um, a well-conducted RCT. So the conclusion is, if you are good at uh, EUS CDS, you can consider it as a primary drainage, but ERCP is easy 
equally good. So this is a flowchart that you may um, consider in your mind when you are referred a case of biliary obstruction who requires an EOS drainage. And of course, you see here the first sign you should always try ERCP. So if ERCP fails, then you need to think about your indications, whether it's malignant or benign. If it's malignant, you think whether the duodenum is accessible. If it's accessible and the obstruction is distal, you can do a CDS. You can also do a gallbladder drainage. Um, if the duodenum is not accessible, uh, then HGS and integrate stenting would be your options. If it's a benign indication, for example, stones after a gastrectomy or Whipple's operation, uh, you can consider um, EOS anti-grade stone extraction. You can consider HGS with a fully covered stand as a bridge. So you can do um, anti uh, stone extraction anti-grade um, through the HGS. Or, of course, you can always do the enteroscopy-assisted ERCP. If the papilla is accessible, then you can consider the EOS rendezvous ERCP. So this is uh, quite a straightforward uh, video on a uh, CDS using a biliary, um, normal biliary stent. So the procedure normally starts with examination of the, um, of the CBD and the primary tumor. And you see all these um, hypervascularity around the tumor, which sometimes may make CDS um, difficult, uh, if not impossible. So this is actually quite a dilated um, common bowel duct. You puncture with a 19 gauge needle, you feed in a guide wire, and then uh, you dilate the tract uh, with a six French cystotome. So you see here that uh, the cystotome is uh, going through. And with um, there are two options of stents that you can use. You can either use a straight biliary stent or a um, axial stent. So if you in, in this case we chose a straight biliary stent, so you would need a good cholangiogram to make sure that your straight stent doesn't cover um, the hyla. Um, of course, it will cover the cystic duct, but the chances of cholecystitis after this is quite low. So now you see that the stent is um, the distal flange of the stent is opened, and now we switch the luminal view. And uh, this is what it's supposed to look like um, after uh, the procedure. So how about if the papilla is not accessible? So if the level of obstruction is distal, but the papilla is not accessible, then you need to think of why the papilla is not accessible. So it can either be due to duodenal obstruction due to tumor invasion, or it can be due to um, post-surgery like altered anatomy after Whipple's or a run y gastrectomy. The success rate of ERCP in these situations depends on whether the side view scope can reach the papilla, which is not possible in up to 40% of the patients. And so your options would be either an HGS or an anti-grade metal stenting. So this is um, also a um, straightforward video on a HGS procedure where you puncture the um, segment three duts, do a nice cholangiogram, um, insert the guide wire and manipulate it um, through to the distal CBD. So uh, this was a special stent that we used, which is called the Dew stent, uh, where we did not have to dilate the tract with a cystotome. So you see that with the um, tapered tip, uh, the stent went in. And this is where um, the uncovered portion of the stent is and followed by a full length of uh, covered stent at the back. So you deploy it under um, initially under fluoroscopy to keep the uncovered part of the stent within the bowel duct. And then you continue to deploy it within the um, liver parenchyma here. And once um, the liver part stent has been deployed, then you continue to deploy it um, within the channel. and switch to the luminal view and uh, gradually uh, push the uh, stent out while you uh, pull the uh, scope backwards. So this was a dew stent that uh, we used with a, um, <clears throat> with a, with the, without the need for a tract dilatation and there's like an anti-migratory flap um, on the stomach side. 
So um, this is a what, what it means by an anti-grade stenting. So you, the initial part of the procedure is very similar to HGS. So you puncture the uh, either segment two or segment three dots, pass a guide wire, and the prerequisite of an anti-grade stenting is that the guide wire has to go through um, the papilla, which may not be possible in in some cases. So you would need you can do an HGS if the guide wire does not pass through the papilla, but if it does then you can either consider um, doing an anti-grade stenting, which in this case, I inserted an uncovered biliary stent, um, a four centimeter to cover the biliary structure, or you can still do an HGS in this um, situation. So if the obstruction is at the higher obstruction, uh, then uh, you do not have much options but to do an HGS. So when the obstruction is distal and uh, CDS is not an option, uh, either due to anatomical, uh, like a lot of viruses around the duodenum, you can always consider a gallbladder drainage. And I quote this paper from one of our, one of our faculty's ream, uh, which showed that with the gallbladder drainage, the technical success rate is 100% and the clinical success rate is 93%. And you can see here in the graph that the pre-procedure bilirubin and ALP actually drops drastically um, after the drainage of a gallbladder from malignant biliary obstruction. So this also works if you're more comfortable with it or a CDS or HGS procedure doesn't work for your patient. Of course, also do know your instruments, your guide wires, your dilators and the stents that you have available. So for the puncture part, uh, needle, usually you would use a 19 gauge needle. Um, there is not a lot of debate on it. For guide wire, um, everyone would tell you the um, go-to wire would be an 025 wire, an angle tip because you would need to manipulate through a lot of curves and to get your guide wire down to the distal CBD and also use the long wire because um, you do not have a lot of uh, room for exchange uh, if you use a short wire and um, a long wire would keep your scope and uh, your access stable. For track dilatation, um, we're very lucky in Hong Kong to have the six frame cystotome, and I believe AIG also has a six frame cystotome, um, which may not be available in other countries like the States. So um, for cautery uh, um, enhanced a um, track dilatation, if you don't have the six frame cystotome, um, in the old days, people tried to use the needle knife, but this is completely out of uh, uh, use now because needle knife has been shown to be associated with increased adverse events and so your other option would be non cautery um, track dilatation which um, some centers would use balloons so in Japan they always have these uh, specific accessories that is only um, exclusive to Japanese so this is like the ES dilator which is uh, I stole two of the ES dilators when I went to Japan and this is a very very good um, dilator that you can use because the taper tip um, fits conforms uh, very well to an 025 wire. So the, um, the, it's very tailor-made and there's no gaps between the tip of this dilator and a 025 guide wire. And it gradually tapers um, until um, at the end, this is six French. So this is like a perfect um, dilator, but uh, it's only available in Japan. So in terms of the stents, um, in the old days when EGBD was first um, uh, published, um, plastic stent was used. But nowadays, when you do this EOS uh, biliary drainage procedures, um, plastic stents is uh, almost um, very uncommonly used because um, studies have shown that uh, plastic stents have an increased, um, it's associated with um, increased adverse event rates and also increased uh, incidence of uh, cholangitis. So if you do have a choice, uh, use metal stents over plastic stents. And trying to use cautery fitted stents where possible, because if you imagine, uh, for example, doing an HGS with a geobore, um, the process that you would have to go through is a puncture, a cystotome, balloon dilatation, and the insertion of stents. So this is very cumbersome, and there is many er areas of a potential errors. So designated stents for EUS belly drainage, although they're expensive, is most of the time worth it. So I'm sure everyone here knows about the luminal 
balancing stents, which um, the, um, the stents that we have, of course, the Nagi stent, uh, the hot and the cold Nagi stent, uh, the Axios stent, which comes also with the hot and cold version, and also the Spexa stent, uh, which is also very um, easy to use, and all the other Sue stents and Hanaro stents that now also come with a cord refitted version. For well, these hybrid stents, they are usually for um, um, CDS or HGS procedures where the medial part is uncovered and the end of it is a covered stent. So during the procedure, um, of course, it's important to understand the anatomy. Um, before you puncture anything, look for a backup plan and, um, and in case a plan it doesn't work, uh, choose the optimal puncture site and use guide wire and deploy in channel. So um, by understanding the anatomy, um, I just mean that you need to measure the, um, the tumor, look at the dilatation of the bowel duct, and you see here there are a lot of um, um, varices and uh, um, vessels around um, the tumor, making CDS very difficult, so then you would want to examine if um, gallbladder puncture is um, feasible. So when you do an HGS and CDS procedure, you would need to think where is the best site um, to puncture. For an HGS procedure, you can either choose to puncture the B2 duts. It's easy to puncture. The guide wire passes down easily because the path is a straighter path. But then um, I would avoid doing HGS through a B2 dot puncture because it is very close to the OG junction and it is associated with mediastinitis after the procedure. So if you are to do um, an HGS procedure, um, always go for the B3 duts. Um, although it's more torturous path down the bow duct, um, have uh, the guide wire manipulation uh, would help you get yourself down to the distal CBD. And also choose the optimal side of puncture. So for CDS, you can see that um, the puncture, you would want to aim for the hilum. So this is a good direction. But for example, in this case where you can see the initial uh, puncture um, direction is actually um, okay. You can see that the tumor is here, so the scope cannot, um, cannot place itself um, better towards the hilum. But if the puncture direction is not um, optimal and the patient struggles around, you can see that passing the stent here um, could be very difficult. So you see that the stent direction when you push, it goes down and the stent actually has to make a U-turn up the CBD. So this is um, a difficult situation um, to pass a stent through. So always choose your puncture site wisely. And if you do not like the direction, um, always repuncture before you dilate the tract. So also the use of guide wire, especially in CDS and HGS procedure is um, important. So this procedure was done by uh, one of our visiting fellows. Um, this was an EGBD procedure. You can see that the gallbladder isn't exactly very um, distended. So um, he did the right thing, puncture with needle, guide wire, and the guide wire was in. So um, he lost somehow the guide wire during the procedure and then um, decided uh, maybe uh, the guide wire can take the hot axios through. So he actually punctured um, the step one um, through the gallbladder, but the step one didn't go in very well. So he kept pushing, but you can see that the stent actually is hitting against the back wall of the gallbladder. And um, he pushed um, step one all in. So he thought um, that step one was completely all in, but in fact what happened was the stent actually pushed against the back wall and the scope was actually pushed away from the duodenum. So he thought like step one was all in, but the duodenum was pushed away instead. So um, the distal flange was um, fired because he thought like it was all in. And you can see here luminally um, that this is the distal flange of the stent. So in this situation, it's very handy to have a guide wire in because you then have options of placing a double pigtail or placing another axios or even a spexis stent. So at the end, um, uh, the guide wire was adjusted. So initially the guide wire is pointing upwards and turning down. So that's why the, there was difficulty for the stent to turn this um, U-turn. So um, to salvage this, uh, you would have to adjust the guide wire so then it points downwards and there is space for the stent to um, pass into the gallbladder. And then subsequently another um, axial stent was uh, deployed. 
So guide wire is very, very important um, when you're not very familiar um, or in your early stages of these procedures. And of course, um, deploy the stent uh, within the channel. So I hear the ding ding sound, so I will skip this uh, video. And also after an HGS procedure, I would always give um, prophylactic antibiotics for um, at least two days because to do an HGS procedure, a lot of contrast has to go in. So sometimes sepsis would flare up. So I would always give prophylactic antibiotics for at least uh, two days. And the don'ts is that don't limit your imagination and don't panic. By don't limit your imagination, I mean that for some situations, for example, this patient had a total gastrectomy and a recurrence of the porta. Um, look at the CT scan to see if the rule limb is close to the CBD. So in this case, um, uh, I attempted to do a diagnostic EOS to see if it's feasible and lucky enough um, I was able to see the CBD in the rule limb and uh, then subsequent procedures are the same as other biliary drainage procedures where you puncture, guide wire and in this case um, the hot axios was used and a plastic pigtail then was inserted within uh, the uh, metal stent and uh, don't panic so i uh, if you have been to the breakfast session uh in the complication session this morning um you can see that reem and also problem would tell you don't panic of course it's difficult um to not panic when you have a um, difficult situation but it is always the key to uh, managing these difficult situations so this is the same video which i showed at the beginning of the um lecture where the 6mm hot axial stand was actually um pulled out. So in this situation, because you have a guide wire inside you, uh, you actually have a lot of options. Uh, you can, uh, through the wire, deploy another hot axios, uh, deploy another luminar opposing stent. You can deploy a fully covered biliary stent, or you can put in a plastic stent. So in this situation, um, a 8mm uh, cold axial stent was passed um, on wire and uh, the stent was nicely deployed and the patient did all right. So I would uh, like to end by quoting this uh, a uh, guidelines from the paper, um, the consensus guidelines, is that always have IR um, and a good anesthesiologist in your department and also um, if you're not a surgeon yourself, have your surgical friends at hand and always have a, a supervisor or a, a supportive tutor with you when you do the initial procedures. And here I would like to conclude that um, still ERCP is still the standard treatment for palliative malignant biliary obstruction and ESBD is developed as an alternative when ERCP fails and the most appropriate um, drainage uh, procedure needs to be tailor-made to the individual patient. And here I would like to thank all my mentors uh, who uh, actually given me the opportunity uh, to learn and develop um, EOS uh, drainage procedures. And here again I would like to thank uh, Dr. Nagi and AIG for organizing this um, wonderful meeting and uh, welcome to Hong Kong in June where we have the Asian US Congress and we have a Indian symposium where we have invited a lot of um, Indian speakers um, to our symposium and there is also a hands-on workshop in this Congress so um, hopefully I'll see you all again in Hong Kong thank you Thank you, Dr. Shannon. That was a very elaborate lecture. I think we're running short of time, so we'll have questions at the end or maybe during live session when you will be performing. Do you want to make any comments, okay, thank uh, you. the moderators? Any one or two comments you can just make? Sorry? Any comments you would like to make on the talk and then we can take a I believe uh, after seeing this uh, workshop, uh, a lot of uh, younger uh, endoscopists in the audience, so more and more uh, people would be interested in doing this, despite having a very strong uh, HPP backup and an interventional radiology backup also because this seems very exciting and quite doable. Thank you, Dr. Shannon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, moderators. And thank you, Dr. Melissa, for that wonderful session. We now move on to the next session and that will be moderated by Dr. Deepika, um, who is a consultant gastroenterologist at MRI Dakuria Hospital, Kolkata. Dr. Deepika. Dr. T.S. Chandrasekhar, who is a gastroenterologist of Med India Hospital, Chennai. Request the moderators to take over and introduce the speaker.
Um, good morning. The next speaker uh, is Dr. G. Young Bang. Her topic is U.S. Guided PFC Drainage, the Current Paradigm. Dr. G. Young uh, Bang is both certified in internal medicine and gastroenterology. She earned her medical degree from University College London Medical School and completed a Master of Public Health degree at Imperial College of London. She completed her residency in internal medicine at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And she became a dedicated researcher and was awarded the Young Investigator Travel Award for the American Pancreatic Association, as well as the Distinguished Time R, which is Trainees in Internal Medicine Mentored Experience in Research Award. She completed her fellowship in gastroenterology in India, at Indiana University School of Medicine in Indianapolis. And she's a member of ASG, AG, and ACG. And she's an interventional endoscopist at Digestive Health Institute Orlando Health USA. So Dr. Bang, please. Thank you. Thank you so much for the very elaborate introduction. Um, I want to thank Dr. Reddy and the entire staff at AIG for this tremendous honor. Um, and it's been a really inspiring meeting all our very intelligent and strong colleagues. So um, thank you so much for having me here. So without further ado, my talk is going to be on eos guided management of pancreatic fluid collections. Okay, good. So, oh. Audio has to be louder. Oh, okay. Is this better? Oh, this is better, yeah. So, <laughs> the main thing to distinguish uh, when dealing with a patient with pancreatic fluid collection is to decide whether they have a pancreatic pseudocyst or a Waldorf necrosis or a necrotic collection. And the reason this is important is because we have shown in a study that the treatment success rate, uh, the rate of complications, the rate of reinterventions, and length of hospital stay differ significantly between pancreatic pseudocysts and necrotic collections. So the main treatment options we have when dealing with patients with pancreatic fluid collections is surgery, interventional radiology, of course, and then endoscopy. And so if we're talking about pancreatic pseudocysts, which are essentially simple collections which have a, uh, a wall surrounding a fluid-filled collection, technically with no necrotic debris. Um, the management is more simple than a patient with Waldorf necrosis, which uh, these patients tend to be more sick, um, and the management is going to be a little difficult, which I'll go over in uh, just a second. So we performed a randomized trial. Uh, this was 10 years ago, where we compared US-guided drainage of pancreatic pseudocysts and compared that with surgery, which in our, in our study was a laparoscopic cystogastrostomy. And what we found was that although there was no difference in technical success, treatment success, rate of complications between the two uh, treatment modalities, the length of stay was shorter for endoscopy, cost was, mm -hmm. as, was less by 8,000 US dollars, and the quality of life was better in patients who underwent endoscopy. So it looks like when dealing with pancreatic pseudocysts, U.S. guided drainage is the way to go. And what we wanted to do with the increasing use of metal stents at the time, we wanted to um, investigate whether it was better to, better to use metal or plastic stents in a systematic manner. So first thing we did was a literature search. We looked to see, uh, we looked at studies uh, draining pancreatic fluid collections with metal and plastic stents and performed a systematic review. Now, this was before the days of luminoprease metal stents, so these are just traditional fully covered metal stents. And we basically found that there was no difference reported in treatment outcomes between um, plastic and metal stents. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, as you can see with pancreatic pseudocysts, mm -hmm. the US guided drainage is the drainage modality of choice. Mm -hmm. and Endoscopy is comparable to surgery, but it was um, cheaper. Uh, you have better quality of life and shorter hospital stay. So next is Waldorf necrosis. Now, Waldorf necrosis results from acute necrotizing pancreatitis. Traditionally, they have a more complex disease process and patients are sicker. So when you're managing Waldorf necrosis, you have to think about it in two phases. First, you want to drain the collection and achieve clinical success, so treatment success, successful drainage of this collection. And phase two is doing whatever you can to minimize recurrence. 
So um, what do we do? La lambs or aluminum-based metal stents versus plastic stents. So this is how uh, we would drain a uh, collection with plastic stents. So the collection, as you can see, uh, is punctured with a 19 gauge needle. A curved 0.025 guide wire is inserted and then allowed to coil several times. The tract will be then dilated, first using a sister term or something similar, and then by a CRE balloon. There is some controversy on how aggressively you should dilate the tract. Personally, we opt for something a little bit bigger, 12 to 15 millimeters, um, to ensure complete drainage uh, of the collection, and you're going to be inserting plastic stents. As long as the plastic stents are double pigtailed to prevent migration, we've shown that the size and the length doesn't really matter. The number also doesn't matter. Traditionally, I think the easiest thing to do is insert two seven French four centimeter double plastic stents. I'll just shorten this a little bit. There we go. All right. Now, I'm sure everyone's already familiar with this now, but we're going to be using lumen, lumen, lumen opposing metal, stem, uh, metal stents. The only lambs available in the United States where I work is an Axios. So again, we have identified the collection, um, the hot Axios, which is currently what we use most commonly, uh, has an electric quarter enhanced delivery tip. You can freehand it, puncture the collection directly. The proximal flange is then uh, deployed, um, and then you deploy the distal flange, and it's actually very, very simple compa compared to the multi-step process involved with plastic stents. This is a walk in the park. Um, so we did end up uh, performing a randomized trial comparing lambs and plastic stents. Um, but what we wanted to do before we embarked on the randomized trial was to do a case control study. We took 20 patients with, um, who underwent drainage using lambs, and then we matched it with 40 patients who underwent drainage using plastic stents. And we were surprised to find that there was no significant difference. LAMS, as everyone's already aware, has a theoretical advantage because of the wider lumen diameter and has those flanges, which are supposed to prevent migration. So we were surprised when we conducted the study that there was no significant difference. The only thing that we saw was that the procedure duration was shorter, uh, which we were not surprised by, but it's 8.5 minutes for LAMS versus 25 minutes for plastic stents. And so we finally uh, completed our randomized trial. It was published in 2019. And we took 31 patients and uh, used lambs, and there were 29 patients in the plastic stent group. And as you can see, again, this randomized trial showed that there was no significant difference in lambs between lambs and plastic stents. Also, there was no difference in the number of intervention required. There was no difference in the recurrence of Waldorf necrosis. Um, but as you can see, the procedural cost was cheaper, uh, was lower with plastic stents compared to lambs. But if you look at the overall cost of a patient's hospitalization uh, when they were admitted uh, for management of Waldorf necrosis, there was no difference. The cost was about 50,000 US dollars. Um, what we did notice that was important uh, discovery as part of this randomized trial was that we were seeing um, kind of unique and novel adverse events that were uh, only really happening with aluminum paste and metal stents. What we were doing initially as part of the study was that we were following these patients at six weeks post intervention, uh, which is what we were doing customarily for plastic stents. So we kept that same follow up period for lambs. And what we were noticing was that we were experiencing these adverse events. Now, these included bleeding, biliary stricture, stent migration. So this is a patient who underwent drainage of multiple collections, multiple necrotic collections using aluminum piece of metal stent. We came back um, because the patient had gone readmitted with hematemesis. And as you can see, the entire stomach is filled with blood. The necrotic cavity is filled with blood. The patient underwent a CT angiogram, and um, what was happening was that the proximal flange of the lambs was eroding through one of the vessels, and the patient ended up receiving embolization of the left gastric artery. This is the patient's EGD after the embolization. As you can see, there's no blood. It has stopped, but that was reassuring. 
So again, we hypothesize that this happens with lambs very specifically, and it doesn't happen with plastic stents, and it's not something that we had noted with plastic stents, was that with the double picture plastic stents, when you drain the necrotic collection, as it collapses, the, um, the wall uh, is not collapsing completely around the stent, and there is some room, and there's no erosion of the vessels against the plastic uh, stent. However, with lambs, it causes um, complete collapse of the collection around the stent, um, and it was resulting in some erosion through the vessels that were surrounding the, the necrotic collection. So the other adverse event that we noted specific with lambs uh, was phenomenal called buried lambs. That's when the stent um, migrates completely inside the, uh, the collapsed cavity of the necrotic collection. And it's very, very difficult to remove. And some people actually need surgical removal of these stents. So with this patient, we were finally able to remove uh, the stent. Um, unfortunately, as you will see, we had to yank on it pretty hard. And when we went back, um, the trauma from removal of the stent had resulted in quite significant bleeding. We placed a clip around the stent insertion site to mark it for our IR guys, and the patient underwent embolization. Uh, another adverse event that we noticed with lambs was biliary obstruction. Uh, this patient um, was readmitted with jaundice five weeks after lambs placement. And what was happening was that the proximal end of the lambs was causing an extrinsic compression on the distal bile duct. So this patient required an ERCP. We had to place a, a plastic stent for the biliary stricture and we remove the, uh, the, the axios. Okay. And so the, what we were noticing about the uh, adverse events is that they were happening more than three weeks after the insertion. So only happening in patients who had undergone uh, the insertion three weeks or more after. So what we did was we changed the protocol so that everyone who underwent LAMS insertion underwent um, repeat endoscopy at three weeks, not six weeks, which is what we're doing with plastic stents to remove the LAMS if the collection had resolved. And after we'd made this um, protocol change in this randomized trial, we noticed that there was no significant difference in the procedural related complications or stent related complications. So there's uh, three randomized trials so far comparing surgery and endoscopy uh, for uh, necrotic um, collections or acute necrotizing pancreatitis. One was done a long time ago, 2011, the sample size is small. So um, the Dutch pancreatitis group performed a randomized trial comparing endoscopy and surgery, comprising 51 patients in endoscopy versus 47 in surgery. Now, what is unique about this study is that they're comparing US guided drainage and they're also comparing the surgical step up approach. So they're comparing this um, kind of the treatment um, phenomenon. So patients who were assigned to or randomized to surgical step up group, 49% didn't actually undergo surgery because what they were doing was the concept of surgical step up, which is the insertion of percutaneous strain. And patients who then didn't, um, who required further treatment, then underwent VARD, um, i.e. surgery. So um, nevertheless, what the study did show was that compared to endoscopy, uh, there was no significant difference or superiority of surgical step-up approach compared to endoscopy uh, when they looked at the primary endpoint of major complications or death. What they did notice, though, which was not surprising, because you have to remember uh, about half these patients only underwent percutaneous strain insertion, there was a significant increased uh, incidence of pancreatic fistula in the surgery group compared to endoscopy at 32% versus 5%. So we also performed a randomized trial. It was finished probably a little later than the tension trial by the Dutch pancreatitis group. And what we found was a little different. Our study was a little different to the Dutch pancreatitis study group uh, in that everybody that was assigned to surgery underwent laparoscopic cystogastrostomy or BARD, uh, and everyone who was assigned to endoscopy underwent US guided drainage. And what we did find was that we 
that there was some difference between surgery and endoscopy. We found endoscopy to be uh, superior in the primary composite endpoint, which was major complications of death. And the reason that our study, uh, we believe, showed that endoscopy was superior is because we included um, pancreatic cutaneous fistula as one of the major complications. Um, and as you can see from this table here, that if you break down the incidence of major complications or death from the, major, from the composite endpoint, that there is um, a significant uh, increased risk of um, pancreatic cutaneous fistula with surgery compared to endoscopy. Uh, in the study, we also found that the quality of life that the patients reported was better for endoscopy compared to surgery. And uh, endoscopy, not surprisingly, uh, was cheaper compared to surgery by uh, almost, it was almost um, $75,000 versus $120,000 or so for surgery. So when looking at the present evidence and when dealing with Waldorf necrosis to achieve... Dr. Bang, can you sp yes. speak a bit louder, please? People at the back cannot hear you. Yes, it might be a microphone problem. I can't actually talk louder. So um, maybe someone can just increase the volume on the microphone. Technically, I shouldn't have to talk louder. The microphone's on. Yeah. Is that possible? Okay. Can she be heard at the back? Hello? Hello? Somebody has to adjust the mic. People yeah. at the back cannot hear her. Can the volume be turned up? Okay. All right. Okay, better. All right. So the present evidence is that endoscopy is preferable to surgical and radiological approaches uh, with treatment success of greater than 90%. And lambs and plastic stents are comparable. However, lambs may be preferable uh, in sick, unstable patients due to shorter procedure duration. So, what we uh, wanted to do is improve on what we're doing now. So, um, what we wanted to do uh, was look at reinterventions, length of stay, recurrence, and costs, and make sure that we are um, those parameters um, are optimized for patients with necrotizing pancreatitis. So um, when you're trying to improve outcomes in necrotizing pancreatitis, uh, we wanted to look at reinterventions, length of stay, and recurrence. So if we're looking at reinterventions, um, the size of lambs may be important. So if you are anticipating uh, performing endoscopic necrosectomy, uh, then we, advo we advocate the use of the widest available diameter of lambs possible. So for axios, which is what we have available for our work, 20 millimeter diameter is ideal because it allows uh, easier access into the necrotic collection if you're performing endoscopic necrosectomy. Uh, also, if the collection is more than 10 millimeters from the uh, GI uh, wall, then you can use a longer saddle length lens. Um, so we have a 15 by 15 millimeter hot axios available, so that would be the stent of choice. Uh, stent placement, uh, so the location where you put in the stent is also important. If you're anticipating um, performing endoscopic necrosectomy after placement of lambs, um, it is always easier if uh, the stent is placed in the distal stomach, so in the antrum area rather than the cardia. As you can see in this video, the only window we had was in the proximal stomach because the collection was in the tail. And um, as you will see, this is the axios being deployed. Um, because of the angle, it's extremely difficult to, to access the collection of the stent's been deployed. And what we have to do is try and dilate the uh, opening of the lambs. Um, and it would be much easier if we're able to place it in the distal stomach. All right. Um, another thing, uh, another technique we use, uh, we don't have data for it, but to us it makes sense, is after Axios has been uh, deployed, um, we insert a catheter, a tandem catheter is very easy, through the lumen of the Axios, and we irrigate uh, the collection. And the, re the reason we do this is that, um, as you can see in this patient, after drainage, you can have 
um, parts and pieces of solid material actually occluding the lumen of the axial stent. Um, and so um, we find that irrigation um, helps the collection to drain um, optimally after stent, uh, after stent placement. Yeah, I'll show you just that part. So you can see it very clearly on the EOS here. You see this necrotic debris that's uh, occluding the lumen. Um, this is a study that we published last year. We wanted to look at um, how we can optimize uh, the usage of lambs in patients with pancreatic flow collection. So we came up with a algorithmic approach. So what we were doing is patients who had um, pseudocysts, we placed lambs um, if available and if possible. And what we were doing is reserving plastic stents in patients with disconnected pancreatic duct um, for pseudocysts. For necrotic collections, we wanted to be more thoughtful in how we approached the collection. So everybody underwent um, placement of aluminum piece metal stents, except if you had more than one collection, we would insert more than one uh, lambs. Uh, it's called a multi-gate technique. If they had an obstructed pancreatic duct, such as disconnected duct, um, we would um, try and replace the lambs with plastic stents after uh, lambs removal. Or if they had a large collection, we would create something called a modified multi-gate multi technique, uh, which is the insertion of lambs into one tract and plastic stents into a second tract. Um, the geomodality technique is when an axios or lambs is inserted transgastrically or transenterally, um, and you also place a percutane strain into the portion of the collection that's difficult to access endoscopically, um, and that is called a dual, a dual modality technique. So what we did find was that when we approached the collections in a thoughtful, systematic, algorithmic uh, way, that actually the treatment success could be optimized. We saw a treatment success rate of 95.6% uh, when we um, undertook this integrated LAMS approach. And, and this uh, variable also lit up uh, when we performed a, um, a regression analysis as well, looking at factors associated with treatment success. Um, one thing also one has to remember is that collections, uh, these uh, flow collections or necrotic collections, are multiple in 15% of patients. So if there are multiple collections, um, then several tracts should be uh, created. This is a patient where we could see a large collection from the small intestine. And when we came back up into the stomach, we saw a second collection. Um, but it seemed to be joined to another collection. Um, and then when we looked at a different site uh, adjacent to the stomach, there was another collection. So what we did was we placed two um, lambs um, into the stomach, uh, one into the first collection and then one into the second collection, as you can see here. And so we have two lambs inserted through the stomach, as you can see. And then we went into the small intestine to drain the third collection that we saw initially. And when we did that, it looks like that collection was connected to the uh, to one of the gastric collections, uh, perigastric collections. So uh, we didn't have to drain from the small intestine. Next. Uh, is the need for uh, endoscopic necrosectomy. The important thing to decide is, number one, uh, does the patient need endos endoscopic or surgical necrosectomy? And then number two, timing. So we actually um, just completed a randomized trial with um, with uh, AIG here with Dr. Laktakia. Uh, we are just um, analyzing the data uh, from our follow-up and we're hoping to have at least some sensible answer to that question. Um, but the need for necrosectomy is pretty simple. If the patient um, is, if you're not keen on performing an endoscopic necrosectomy immediately after insertion of lambs, then you watch the patient. And if they don't clinically improve within 72 hours, then that would be a good indication to perform endoscopic necrosectomy. Um, next, looking at uh, length of stay and timing of drainage. 
Um, the, the current wisdom is that it is ideal to wait three to four weeks uh, when the collections have matured before draining uh, the collection. But is it impossible to drain these collections before the three to four week period, especially if the patient is sick or severely symptomatic? The answer is, the answer is no. Um, so as you can see here, as long as there is some, um, you know, some wall of some kind, then it is possible to drain safely. Uh, as you can see in this patient, uh, the patient underwent an ERCP and had a pancreatic ductal leak from trauma. So we performed an ERCP with the placement of a pancreatic stent, which in our eyes, you know, went fine. And uh, the patient was complaining of abdominal pain, so we repeated a CT scan four days afterwards, and we found that there was a small uh, pancreatic fluid collection. And this is obviously an acute collection because it was not present prior to our ERCP. And the patient was uh, clearly infected. She was septic. Um, she was severely symptomatic. So we placed an axio stent. Um, luckily, um, this went fine. And the patient uh, responded well clinically. Um, so um, I think the evidence uh, does you know, show, as in this study, that um, the outcomes seem to be poorer when patients undergo earlier drainages. However, if clinically needed and safe to do so, then I do think it's a dogmatic rule. Uh, next is just a, a slide on internal nutrition. Um, internal nutrition is important for these patients. They often cannot uh, really tolerate much of an oral intake at all. So we customarily place a feeding tube, either nasodejunal or um, PEG-J. If the patient's acutely sick um, and you're worried that the patient may develop an acute compartment syndrome during the hospitalization, uh, the nasodejunal feeding tube is a safer option um, because the PEG tubes can migrate and essentially result in a gastric perforation. Um, this is a quick slide just showing um, a study that was presented at, ES, uh, sorry, EUGW last year. And um, it does confirm what we had suspected, that percutaneous drainage is inferior to endoscopy in multiple um, variables, uh, that it does seem to result in significantly higher mortality, hospitalization, um, increased length of stay, and also seems to be more expensive. Um, so percutaneous drain really should only be reserved for patients who have a collection in an area that cannot be accessed endoscopically. So, for example, in the left or right flank. And a good thing about inserting drains is that then it gives us access to the collection, either endoscopically or surgically. And uh, this is um, us performing a percutaneous necrosectomy. So um, uh, a guide wire is inserted into the uh, percutaneous drain, the drain is removed, and then the, uh, the tract is dilated using savory, uh, savory dilators over the guide wire. And once the tract is dilated to 45 to 48 French, then it gives us enough room to pass the um, gastros gastroscope directly into the collection. As you can see here. Then you perform endoscopic necrosectomy exactly as you were doing when uh, performed transgastrically. Uh, this is us kind of uh, going through the uh, tract and into the collection. Oh, okay, another thing. So uh, <laughs> there is the necrosectomy there. Um, don't really have much more except I think the only important point that I do want to make is um, it's important to determine whether these patients have a disconnected duct um, because uh, it does seem to influence how much intervention is going to be needed, um, their treatment uh, outcomes, their hospital stay. And this can be done either with MRCP. Uh, you can find, um, you can do a pancreatogram via ERCP. And actually, uh, it can also be uh, determined through EUS uh, even. So in conclusion, uh, treatment success of water necrosis can be 90% if you uh, attack it with an algorithmic approach. There seems to be no difference between lambs and plastic stents, um, but lambs we advocate removal at three to four weeks, and uh, presence of DPDS is important um, because this will affect patient outcomes. Thank you so much.
thank you uh, dr j n bang i really appreciate and congratulations and most of the talk based on your original publications it is admirable and since we are running out of time uh, any burning issues on this uh, one or two questions alone with it is fantastic that i, I enjoyed your lecture with the original publications uh the thanks for a nice talk uh, in your algorithm we look at it the first you 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 say that for pseudocyst you're suggesting a metal stent uh, the algorithm that you published in can you speak to mic uh, nagi not uh, no. uh and <laughs> i want to know the intriguing questions you are asking okay. <laughs> i thought it was loud okay now so in your algorithm you suggested that the first uh, uh, drainage for pseudocyst was uh, metal stent would you still suggest that i thought this not not cost effective we would put a plastic stent with pseudocyst and not a metal stent yeah i think um with pseudocyst and wart of necrosis all the evidence state that there is no difference yeah. i think the advantage of lambs and this is why in the united states because it's easier and convenient we like to use lambs um and the cost of the stent is usually covered by patient's insurance or swallowed up in their hospital stay um so it's not uh, an economical really uh, way of doing things um but yes there's no difference at all um so if uh, plastic stents are available and you know they have the expertise then yeah it's absolutely fine dr g i have very two brief questions which is your choice of lambs uh, and my, what basis uh, my choice of lambs would be for wart of necrosis a 20 mm diameter and it only comes in one saddle length which is 10 mm and at orlando protocol everywhere it was lambs one place where you have mentioned plastic stent where they upsetted that what is your uh, yeah so the reason we uh, do that is because um the axios or lamb stents um cannot be left in indefinitely unlike plastic stents in patients with disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome the reason this is important is that can you speak to the mic oh. once <laughs> we are so eager to uh... yeah the reason um dpds is important because it increases the patient's risk of uh, necrotic collection recurrence so traditionally the the way to do it is the patient comes back after their lambs insertion you remove the lambs at 3 to 4 weeks and then you have to replace the lambs with plastic stents and those plastic stents will stay inside you indefinitely Now sometimes when the collection has resolved uh, axios has done such a good job that the collection is completely closed and collapsed and there is no space to place plastic stents so what we advocate is that if the collection is big enough then you put in basically two tracks one where lambs will go and a second track where plastic stents will go and all you have to do then is not worry about the cavity collapsing you just go in and remove the lambs and those plastic stents that you placed in the second tract can just remain indefinitely and minimize the patient's uh, risk of recurrence last no, question, uh, i think she has almost answered all the question but it does uh, 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 as you said there is a technically difficult to remove the lambs and by the time you remove the lamb the cavity is gone and it is difficult to pr- put a plastic so Do you think putting plastic and metal together and removing selectively metal is possible? Yeah. That is much better. And two, uh, my question is whether leaving plastic stent for long is serving purpose of reducing the recurrence or salvaging the tail of the pancreas? Uh, is, is there any data on that? Um, so the first question, um, there is some controversy on whether placing plastic stent through axios is beneficial or not. I do know there was a study on it recently. I cannot recall the all the outcomes, but my feeling is that probably plus doesn't make too much of a difference. I think the whole purpose of placing lambs is that it's convenient, that it's easy. You can drain a collection within 5 minutes and you can get on with the day. So the kind of concept of placing another plastic stent through your very easy procedure, I think now becomes more complicated. In the video that I showed you the stent still became buried inside the the cavity despite us having a plastic stent through the lumen because I think we were trying that out. And so um I don't know if it's going to make a huge difference. It probably doesn't do any harm either. So without all the evidence available probably best just to do 
you know, what you feel comfortable with. We traditionally don't place plastic stents through lambs, and um, as long as they were removed in a timely fashion between three to four weeks, we haven't had any more of those significant differences in adverse events between lambs and plastic stents. The second question with uh, plastic stents and disconnected duct, we believe that it probably decreases the rate of recurrence because it provides a continuous tract through which these kind of leaking pancreatic juices can drain into the stomach. Whether it salvages the tail of the pancreas, I don't know, to be honest with you, Moen. Um, a good topic for us to study yeah. together, maybe. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Bank, for that. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. G. You are so soft in your speech, <laughs> but your data are very hard. <laughs> I must congratulate and along with Deepika, I have a great pleasure in congratulating and thanking Dr. Nagi and his team to be a part of this historical meeting. It's going to be a, going to be a trendsetter all over the world. Thank you, Nagi. Thank you. Thank you, moderators. And it was a wonderful session with a good interaction. We now move on to the next topic. And uh, to moderate this session, may call upon Dr. Revati, who is Professor and Head Department of uh, gastroenterology at Stanley Medical College and Dr. Malti Satyashekran, Senior Consultant Pediatric Gastroenterologist from MGM Healthcare Chennai. Dr. Revati, uh, kindly introduce the speaker and please start the proceedings. Malti, you can just start. Good morning. It has indeed been a great time this from yesterday and we've all enjoyed and learned together with the faculty from abroad and from our own country. Uh, the topic now is exploring the small bowel, the entroscopy way and the explorer will be Professor Mariana Arvantiki. We've seen her yesterday in action and today she will be uh, speaking to us about the topic. She is MD, PhD, Associate Clinical Professor at the Department of Gastroenterology, Hospital Arasemi. And uh, the, she is a renowned gastroenterologist at the Arasemi University Hospital, Brussels. She is specialized in endoscopic management of pancreatico biliary diseases and nutrition. And she is involved in several guidelines. She is highly involved in ESG and UEG where she initiated the ESGE Young Endoscopist Group, chairs the SG, ESGE Educations Committee and is member of the UEG Scientific Committee. Thank you, Mariana, and we are just waiting to now listen to your talk. Thank you for the, for the kind introduction. So um, let's uh, see what the small bowel can, uh, can uh, disclose. So this is the, the, the agenda of, the, of my talk. I'm going to talk about the modalities that we have to explore the small bowel, uh, indications for deep enteroscopy and the different uh, devices that we have, uh, a special focus on the motorized spiral, and uh, a very short comment on ERCP enteroscopy and altered anatomy. Uh, so we have, uh, we are lucky to have many guidelines here, the European guidelines, uh, but we also have uh, uh, Asian and American guidelines on this subject. And this is the, um, the, the first guideline that was made in 2015. It's been recently updated uh, from the ESG, so the clinical guideline on small bowel capsule enteroscopy and devices enteroscopy, and also the technical review and performance measures because it's very important to keep uh, quality uh, even in this uh, type of procedure. So what have we been doing up to now? So uh, to 20, 30 years ago, we just pushed a bit further down with long uh, enteroscopes, which didn't really provide a lot of uh, input. But uh, the revolution came with video capsule endoscopy, where we, for the first time, we were able to explore the small, the whole uh, uh, small bowel. And uh, we started uh, diagnosing uh, things that we wanted to treat and wanted to get there. And uh, we started uh, developing device-assisted enteroscopy, first with a, a simple double balloon, then the manual spiral and this anchoring systems, uh, and uh, lately with the motorized uh, spiral. So the most usual indication to explore the small bowel is suspected small bowel bleeding, which is when uh, upper GI and lower GI, gastroscopy, colonoscopy, uh, have shown no uh, significant findings. So this is an algorithm that's already been uh, um, uh, developed in, in, the, in the guidelines of 2015, where you can see the suspected small bowel bleeding. 
most of the time you will go first for a video capsule enteroscopy. This has to be done quite quickly after the bleeding episode, if this is overt. Um, so uh, in the first guideline, it was before between less than 14 days. Now we show that it's even better if you go uh, less than 48 hours. Uh, so of course, if you have only uh, iron deficiency anemia, you don't have an index uh, bleeding episode to, be, to base stuff, so you still go for video capsule endoscopy. In some situations, when you have overt brisk bleeding, uh, you can go first for the CT angiography, and then if you find uh, bleeding in the proximal uh, uh, jejunum, for example, then you could go directly for um, untergrade enteroscopy. But most of the time, you will go from capsule, and based on the capsule findings, you will uh, offer specific management uh, uh, involving uh, uh, probably uh, device-assisted enteroscopy, and uh, if there is no findings, you can follow up and you can also include in the algorithm uh, cross-sectional imaging as a CT or MRI cross-sectional enter or CT MRI. And you, this recent studies have shown that by combining uh, capsule endoscopy and cross-sectional imaging, you will probably increase the diagnostic yield. You might catch those small bowel tumors, which are rare, but can be seen and might be um, misdiagnosed with a negative capsule. So the findings will depend on the, the age. If you have a patient uh, with uh, or, or suspected small bowel bleeding in young patients, you will find mechanism of reticulum tumor, polyps, uh, erosions related to Crohn's disease or NSAIDs, and in uh, all elder patients, you will have more vascular disease with telangiectasias. So this is uh, images of cross-sectional enterography, CT and MRI, that will give you also um, a very uh, uh, useful uh, findings. So when do we go for deep enteroscopy? Well, if you have a significant findings on a capsule, for example, telangiectasias, uh, if you have a, a suspected small bowel or blurred bleeding for um, um, hemostasis, if you have that patient where you did a CT scan in the ER and he has a jejunal bleeding, you can go immediately to a antero, um, anterograde device assisted enteroscopy. If you have a suspicion for small bowel uh, Crohn's disease, to go for biopsies. If you have uh, seen a tumor, either on the, the capsule, either on a, a CT, you go for a biopsy and a tattoo to guide uh, the surgeons. Suspicion of a submal causal mass. Polypectomy for inherited polyposis syndromes, like the patient with the pitch jerkers uh, syndrome we had yesterday. And if you have to do biopsies in the small bowel, such as in refractory celiac disease. So we talked about the, uh, uh, what we had until now regarding device-assisted enteroscopy, and uh, this is the bal double balloon enteroscopy, a very uh, well-known technique. It requires two uh, operators, one that's progressing and one that's holding the overtube with the two balloons, and there's a specific technique with uh, an alternative um, inflating of the balloon on the enteroscope and a balloon on the overtube. This has been out for a long time, and you can see that it's uh, quite safe with uh, a very low uh, serious adverse events rate, a panteroscopy rate of uh, 44%, but in expert hands, and a very satisfactory uh, diagnostic yield, as you see here. Simple, simple balloon enteroscopy use the same uh, approach, the same uh, um, uh, progression technique, but the, there is a, only a balloon on the overtube, and you use the scope uh, handling to anchor your small bowel to progress. So the, the comparative studies uh, comparing the two types of the balloon system show that uh, they both have uh, si uh, similar diagnostic yields, but uh, complete enteroscopy was higher with the double balloon system compared with the simple, simple balloon system. So spiral enteroscopy, first we start with the manual spiral, which uh, used an overtube on, uh, on enteroscope, but this was um, uh, used, uh, and uh, this is a, a meta-analysis showing that uh, the uh, diagnostic and therapeutic yield were uh, comparable with balloon enteroscopy with an equal depth of insertion, but finally the spiral, even the manual spiral, had a shorter procedure time, as we see in this meta-analysis. So this is the summary of what we had until now, so no large-scale uh, perspective RCTs, uh, but uh, the uh, spiral seemed to be the quickest, the simple balloon easiest to perform and the double balloon seemed to be the deepest. 
Then we had this, uh, this, this novel motor, a spiral enteroscopy that we showed yesterday that uh, really transformed uh, uh, the, the manual system with the motor, which is controlled by a foot pedal. And these are the first uh, um, clinical trials that we had. This is what was done with um, uh, our friends from uh, Dusseldorf. Uh, this was from the anterograde approach only for 140 procedures that showed the good uh, technical and diagnostic yield. Um, and 14% uh, uh, of adverse events, but only 1.5 of serious adverse events. This uh, second trial also included uh, the retrograde approach as well. So we saw that it was easy to go there also from the colon. And there we saw that we can all obtain total enteroscopy in two thirds of the patients. This, uh, the study came uh, from, uh, from this center. This was the first uh, study outside of the, of the of the two uh, centers that have uh, initiated the, 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 the trials. And this was uh, interesting because uh, there was different kind of patients, mostly uh, there was some obscure gestational bleeding, but also some patients with IBD, uh, so with diarrhea and unexplained abdominal pain, and showed that the, the, the similar results could be found in this real um, uh, world uh, experience. So this is the, the, the third study that we did with, with Düsseldorf um, and also some other centers that were added, 14 centers altogether. This was really a registry to, to see um, how it's performed in altered gastrointestinal anatomy and really to focus on uh, adverse events. And this was almost 300 patients in 14 centers. And uh, we saw that um, there were 2% of uh, serious adverse events, but uh, these uh, adverse events seem to uh, decrease with the training. So there is a learning curve and things get better with the learning with the learning curve. And also we can see that we still had very good diagnostic and therapeutic yield. Um, this is the, the latest publication that we had. This is a meta-analysis of the, the performance and safety of motor or spinal enteroscopy. So we can see uh, panenteroscopy in 51%, good diagnostic and therapeutic success rates, but still we have to underline that we have to work on the adverse events. They uh, get better with the training, but still we have 17% uh, of adverse events, only 1% of major adverse events. Uh, this is also a, a, a comparative study um, from, uh, from here, from this center, uh, where the population is Crohn's disease, and uh, it was a, a, a prospective comparative study with a single balloon enteroscopy. And uh, they showed that uh, they had similar um, technical and diagnostic yield, but the motorized spiral was shorter and also had a higher uh, rate of uh, total enteroscopy. And uh, this is uh, finally another uh, case match study uh, where there were 31 patients with motorized spiral and 62 with double balloon. And uh, they say that this, uh, the, the technical and diagnostic success was, was comparable, but still uh, they underline the, the, the concern about the adverse events, so it seemed to be higher for motorized spiral. Uh, we talked about this yesterday during the live, that the, 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 the esophageal lacerations, uh, and sometimes uh, we can have a perforation in the small bowel. So uh, the training, um, training uh, curve is important uh, to, uh, to avoid these um, um, these adverse events, and also uh, selecting the patient. So uh, ongoing anti-aggregation coagulation, we will prefer a balloon system. Uh, for the retrograde approach, uh, I think the motorized spiral is uh, very handy. It's quick. It can even uh, be applied in a difficult uh, long uh, colon. Uh, so it's, uh, it, can, it can really uh, replace uh, the anterograde double balloon. Of course, if you have esophageal viruses, strictures, and is um, Isonophilic is, is is on, is esophagitis, we avoid the, the, the spiral and we prefer double balloon system. And of course, um, the preparation for the uh, spiral is very easy compared to the, um, to the double balloon. So some uh, uh, additional questions. It's always uh, important to uh, decide which route you're going to go from, from the anterograde or the retrograde approach, and capsule can really help us uh, to, uh, to, uh, to decide by uh, decide to, to identifying the lesion and the ratio of the time uh, between the, um, the pylorus and the lesion and the, and the lesion and the, and the uh, ileocecal valve. 
so if it's less than 0 0.6, we will go uh, from the uh, anterograde approach. What about sedation, general anesthesia? You saw yesterday that we did the procedure under general anesthesia with uh, uh, endotracheal intubation. I think that we should completely forget midazolam in this setting and go for either deep sedation or even better general anesthesia with intubation. And especially for the anterograde approach, I think there should be a low threshold for intubating the patient. A retrograde approach can be considered with, with deep sedation only. What about uh, estimating progression? Uh, uh, this is uh, still uh, very uh, cumbersome, counting the folds or counting the pushes with the double balloon. It is very important to mark with the two the deepest point of insertion, and this will guide you for your further uh, interventions if required. We have shown that this is a um, uh, meta-analysis showing that uh, using carbon dioxide is more uh, is more beneficial for the patient with a better progression and less procedural pain. If even better, water exchange can even help in this uh, recent uh, randomized trial. Just uh, two uh, slides for the uh, the possibilities of using enteral ERCP. Uh, this can be uh, considered in patients with Alter's anatomy as the Whipple here. We see a uh, uh, gastric resection with the ruin Y or the gastric bypass. Um, this is a different modalities that we have, edge, laparoscopy assistant, and enteroscopy assistant. Uh, this takes longer. It, we know that it's, uh, there's less, um, there's a higher risk of failure, but it's the one that has the less uh, adverse events. So it can be uh, chosen if you have a very uh, frail patient. So in a nutshell, a deep enteroscopy is still a challenge. Motor spoil is promising, but we still have to uh, uh, place it in our algorithm com uh, compared with the balloon systems and be very careful about patient selections. These modalities are complementary. And of course, if you want to work in this area, uh, you need passion, patience, and a very good collaboration also with the surgical and the radiological team. Uh, we still have to increase our diagnostic and therapeutic yield. So Patient selection is very important. All these techniques need training, and uh, we still can improve enteroscopy with the RCP, maybe with uh, the new motor spiral. So uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, ma'am. That was an excellent and fantastic lecture. Um, for the beginners, we would like to uh, ask few questions. How depth you go in the entroscopy and how do you identify or estimate the depth? Some clues. Yes, so um, uh, with um, with the deep the double balloon and the motor spiral, we can go uh, uh, the, the average uh, uh, maximum depths were uh, four to five meters. Uh, and um, But it's still very difficult to um, uh, to to measure this, and uh, so the um, for the spiral, it's counting the folds, which can be very cumbersome and not very precise. For the double balloon, the balloon system, it's the the progressions that you make. So we say that every progression is about 20 centimeters, but still are very gross evaluations. So um, uh, we're still not very good at this. So I think it's very important to mark. The, the deep, deep, deep point of insertion uh, to, to keep it as a landmark in, in, in uh, either if you go back uh, to evaluate the patient, either if you have to uh, take into surgery. I have one question. So when we uh, do Thank it you. for a uh, cult GI bleed or obscure GI bleeding, small bowel bleeding, endroscopy, uh, sometimes we have to be uh, very slow and we go in and out of a segment to search for the bleed because most of the time we have either some something like a uh, you know a CT scan or something to guide us to tell us where the bleeding is going on so in that segment if we don't find anything we go in and out for a few hundred centimeter we usually find it do you think that in time uh, like a colonoscopy withdrawal time will there be an enteroscopy withdrawal set time coming up something to make sure you catch the bleed because most of the time when we come back fast we don't find the spot and we turn out we just find some few injectaceas which don't explain the bleed what do you uh, suggest yes it's a very very good question i think that um, you need uh, you need time you need patience um, if you usually what you you find you have either capsula either the ct scan that gives you an idea mostly if it's proximal or distal and even that 
sometimes you get surprises. But when you find some blood there, that's the first thing that you, there's a difference. You see all of a sudden there's a segment with blood and that's where you're going to, to work. And usually um, you can use clips as well. You put the clip in the beginning and then you go down, you, you wash, you need a water pump, take your time. You see usually it's a Dulafa lesion because the angiomas, they don't bleed a lot. So a Dulafa lesion, that's really tricky to find. So you take your time. Sometimes you won't find it, but at least you will mark your section. So you put the clip in the beginning, you clip at the end, or you, you can tattoo. Um, but this is important if you go back or if you have to go to interoperative uh, uh, enteroscopy. So this is very important. And when you come back, you take your time. So there's no, still no quality indicator saying like in colonoscopy, but patience and taking your time is, is, very, is crucial. Yes. Thank you. I think, yeah, we can. Thank you, Mariana. I think we have to stop because of the want yeah. of time. Please, uh, you can weave and answer their questions during tea. Thanks a lot for the talk. Thank you very much, moderators. And thank you, Dr. Mariana, for that wonderful talk. We now move on to the next topic. And uh, we can call upon our moderators <laughs> for this session, Dr. Radhika who is a gastroenterologist at Anj Ahmedabad, and Dr. Zaheer, a senior consultant at AIG. We request you to... Uh, speakers have already been introduced, so we can start with the presentation. We call upon Dr. Roberta to kindly take over the... Roberta, we... You can come up. Yeah, they have introduced you already. Okay. <laughs> Hello, good morning to everyone. Also from my side, as everybody, I really feel very honored to give this presentation to be here with a lot of very wonderful females. Uh, so my topic will be the third space endoscopy and ESD. What's new? But before going the new things, let's start from the whole one. Let's say that everything started. Here is 1999 when um, Professor Yamamoto, this is a courtesy from him because uh, initially it was published in Japanese, so you won't find on PubMed this one. And this was the first case of ESD never done. It was assisted by snaring. The fact is that he found this lesion in the upper rectum and he wanted to remove it and block. And he had no device or no technique to do this. So he just used the tip of the knife to cut just below the, uh, the lesion in the submucosa space and from that point it has opened the door to the third space. So we discover a new space that is a submucosa, the so-called third space. So what is in ESD? Let me say that the ESD is a surgical technique with a selective resection that is indicated for superficial neoplasia but really it requires strong and precise manual skill it should be always part of a multidisciplinary context, but because it's so complex, it can be associated to increased risk of complication. And here you see, we are working in a different space than uh, what we are doing with EMR. And they are different because, let me say, the EMR is easy and established, but not all the time is so easy. With standard devices that you can find all the time in your endoscopic unit is short, Clarity is short with low risk of complication, but the fact is that do your pathology won't have just one piece, but different pieces. It's like you're giving all the pieces of the puzzle and then you're asking to him, please put all that together and give me the truth. Is that air zero or not? You cannot say in this way because we have to send him just one piece to check for lateral and deep margin. But this one is related to much more complication. So how can we arrive to, how we can progress our skill? What's the learning curve? We should start all the time with the prediction of histology. So you must be very skilled in understanding the right indication on how to remove that lesion, if it would be piecemeal or in block. Then you go in advanced skill in MR, and only after this you can approach the SD. And step by step, you will be able to resect bigger and bigger lesion. You see that my face is getting tired and tired more and more depending on the size of the lesion. But anyway, it can be very satisfied if you can cure the patient in this way. The other concept is the nodes, is the natural orifices transluminal endoscopic surgery. So what we are doing is try to mimic the surgical procedure doing transanally, transorally, or, you know, um, using the natural orifice that we can have in the body but at the same time then close that gap that 
holes that we are creating could be very difficult. This is why this concept is just a concept, it's not really applied. The only notes that they are routinely performing nowadays is poem, and we'll talk about this. So what is the third space again? Let me say that the first space is the endoluminal space, the one that endoscopically we face every day. The second space is something that we are trying to avoid, that is the cavity, the peritoneal cavity or the thorax cavity, the surgical point of view. The third space is everything that is in between these two, so it's the submucosal space. Later on, we'll see that the new concept is the fourth space. I, I don't know if it's a real space, but we'll see. Just let's talk about one different fact. The fact is that I want to have the control of this. How can I? So this was a recurrent lesion in the rectum. After three attempts of removing this lesion, but it was only adenoma. So talking with the surgeon, he said, if you're able to remove it endoscopically, it's much better because it's scar and adenoma. And you see that in the center is really attached. So we knew from the beginning that we should have cut also the muscle. We were using at that time the TRS, is the tissue retraction system, where you have two operators working. One is doing the ESD or the resection and the other one is working on the grasper because this is a surgical concept where you have to grasp the tissue and to expose the plane you want to cut. See that we are cutting full thickness and we are facing the uh, rectal fat just over the muscle. This is a surgical procedure definitely done transcendently done with flexible endoscopy. So this is definitely flexible endoscopic surgery. And still we are looking for the best devices to overcome also the limits and the complication that we can achieve. Because believe me, you will find very big vessels and very big bleeding. But in the end, we must be also able to close this very big and full thickness defect. So you also need to suture and to close this gap. So learning from our surgery, we just clean the field with some bathing and then with the running suture, we close it. And again, we are mimicking a surgical procedure, so we know that all the time that transcendently the surgeon is closing a gap is doing from the oral side to the anal side, never in the opposite way. Otherwise, you will create a stricture. So we are not inventing anything. We are replaying in a different way what they are already doing in a different setting, let me say. And this is the end and the closure. And the patient went back home the same day. So with the MR and ESD, we had this muscle layer, the untouchable layer. So don't touch the muscle, otherwise you will create a perforation. But then we are going behind, and with the third space, now the muscle is our target. For example, with POEM, when later on we'll do the myotomy, or for example, with STAIR, when you have these tumors lying in the submucosa or in the muscularis propria, and you have to cut it. So again, we have one more pioneer, again from Japan, this is Professor Inoue, that for the first time really opened the door to notes. And again, POEM is the only routinely performed uh, notes uh, in, in worldwide in all the world. So the first publication is 2010 and from that point of view yesterday we already saw the poem so I don't want to go deeply in the details of the procedure because you already know but let me say that from that point we have the so-called poem revolution. So this is just uh, searching in PubMed for two words, poem and achalasia. You will see how many how many um, papers have been published since that time. 
let me say that we, we you know now a lot of uh, uh, things about POEM. It is a surgical procedure. It's done in general anesthesia, CO2. You have mainly two types of approach, posterior, anterior. You can do full thickness, partial. You can do anterior approach, posterior approach. Here we have a video, but I think that we are running out of time, so you already saw the video. And at the beginning, it was just for standard achalasia. Nowadays, we'll do it for all type of achalasia with excellent results, with a success that is 100% does not exist in medicine, let me say, almost there. Uh, and also, you can do after failure of different treatment, not only Heller, but also after Botox, after dilation, and also repoem after poem failed. Adverse events are not so high, although at the beginning it was very, may, maybe the most scary procedure in the world because you were, if you were in the interior, you will see all the time the pericardium bumping just in front of your face, and you were facing with different structure that usually we don't, we don't have in endoscopy. But then later on we understand that it's a very safe procedure with a low risk of complication. And even if you have complication, most of them you can manage endoscopically or conservative. Well, nowadays we also have long-term outcomes that are still excellent. That will depend on the type of. But the great thing is that the main complication is reflux because we are not able still to add some anti-reflux procedure during the procedure itself. And this is why I want to show you the POEM F. This is again coming from Professor Inoue. So after the myotomy or even after some, uh, in a second session, you could try to reply a fund application done by flexible endoscopy. You will be able to see this case report, the POEM F on the video GIE. I put some I hope I will be able to control this because it's a long one. I don't want to show you all of this. I don't have the control. Hmm. No, I have the bookmarks and I want to... No, it's not... No. Ah, only try to go there. Ah, it's working only with you. Okay. Um, so let's see how the procedure is done. This was four months post poem, so you see that it was good, and so they thought that it was nice to. Uh, try to make a fund application endoscopically. So after, in the anterior wall, they've done the mucosal incision because every time you need to have the access to the third space, they will make a full thickness uh, incision to have the to gain the peritoneal cavity. Oh, come on. It's difficult to... Okay, very short myotomy to gain the access. We are now in the peritoneal cavity. And then, this is the greatest part. You have to prepare the suturing device. The fact is that you don't have a real suture device, so they use a prototype that the company made for him. And this is the big question. Still, we don't have all the device needed for this complex procedure. Because in this way you need, you have a suture line, but then you need something that can rotate uh, to make uh, a real uh, suture. And uh, you will make the distal stitch, here is the endoscopic view to check if it's a full thickness or not. And then you have to retract and to pull out the stitch to make then the second one. So it's a real complex one to make a full thickness bite and to try to recreate a valve that is not working in this way. And you can see here the morphological changing during, before and immediately after. Here is the algorithm of the center if to, uh, for refractory gear to do the fund application after the first initial poem or to add directly the fund application during the same session of poem. It is not completely clear when we have to do this. It's just something we are at the beginning. We'll see in the future the real data and the long-term data. But coming back to the third space endoscopy, we said that poem is not the only one done. With this approach, you can for sure doing something for a 
Calasia, but also we said for stir, but also the G poem for refractory gastroparesis, for Zenka diabetic and the Z poem, or also the poems, but also for the esophageal stricture. So let's talk a bit about Zenka diabetic. You know that endoscopically, by flexible endoscopy, you should go for a classical septotomy, that means cut directly the mucosa, submucosa, and muscle all together, or the Z poem, when you create a submucosa space to enter in the submucosa and then to face directly the muscle to cut down all the muscle to the um, cricopharynx and then after all you will close the gap by clips or this is a new approach that we recently published that is the poest peroral endoscopic sectotomy once you do the same you approach the third space but not creating a tunnel two centimeter above but just on the septum just to make it simple and faster because all the time we are doing this type of pores without any tracheal intubation. So you'll face something like this one. You have a submucosa space in the diverticulum uh, um, side, but also you have the muscle and then again a submucosa in the um, in the esophageal side. We're having great results, but this approach in our center is only for sure septum diverticum. Otherwise, you will have the mucosa that would lay behind you and you will create a sort of a step and the, your patient still have dysphagia unless you go there and then you cut also the mucosa remaining. But then you're making the procedure very complex. So in that case, why not to go directly for a standard septotomy? So still we are a little bit in debate who, who, which one is the best approach. But basically this is the concept of the POAS. We are just injecting and cutting in the same orientation of the septum just to enter in the submucosa and to face directly the septum and to clearly cut fiber by fiber the muscle and uh, let me show you a short video and again this was the first time was done this procedure so we were so let me say um not very uh, safe because it was the first time we, we just was con, uh, consider it and we create uh, this cap. Uh, this is not a standard cap because we were using, you will see here, the, the numbers, a 2.4 channel scope. This is a pediatric scope because we thought that the space was not big enough. So this is a um, tracheal tube. 7.5 that we just cut it to create the cap this is why you cannot see any holes again sometimes you have to invent new devices just uh, um, simplifying what you have in your unit because not everything we need is still there ready for you but with this one we were able step by step to make the incision in the mucosa and to enter in the space. As soon as you enter, you'll see and you'll face the muscle because you are directly there on the septum. Nowadays, we're performing poise with standard scope, but that one was the first time, and I'm happy to share it with you because sometimes you have a new concept uh, and you have to adjust even your devices to try to do this. In this way, you have a stable, complete access to the muscle. And we always use hook knife or similar knife with this shape to grasp the fibers. You can use with the top just to tap and the muscle and cut it or to grasp it and pull it to have a nice cut. In this way, the diverticulum pouch will disappear. The diverticulum is there, but the septum in between will disappear. And you simply have to close by clip. Uh, what about, for example, MED? It is the middle esophageal diverticulum. Fortunately, they are rare because if you talk with a thoracic surgeon, they would say that there's no space for uh, a, a flexible endoscopic surgery there. But still, some groups they are trying to with excellent results, but we don't have a very big series around the world. Uh, something coming more is the G-POEM. Also, yesterday, you uh, seen Amrita performing it. I don't have any video, otherwise this presentation will be too long. But even in this case, we are having not excellent, but good results still, because we need to understand which is the right patient for the right treatment. So it's something still we are trying to understand very deeply. Finally, we have this set, the submucosa tumor endoscopic resection. When you want to uh, remove a tumor that is lying in the submucosa or in the muscularis propria, let's talk about it just showing a video. 
this was a gist that was in the uh, gastric side and just above the uh, esophago gastric junction. So it's the easiest stair for the endoscopic point of view. But if you speak with the surgeon, you will say that it's completely difficult and horrible procedure because it's difficult to dissect and to arrive there exactly in that point. But from inside, it seems so easy to make the tunnel as in poem, to expose the tumor, and step by step to dissect the fibers that are connecting the tumor to the muscle and remove from the mouth completely and block the lesion. Again, this must be done by expert hands in a multidisciplinary complex with the patient intubated, ready also to fix and to manage complication in case you have and you can have. What's new? Endoscopic adventitial dissection. So now they're talking about a new space for space. I don't know if it's a real space because we said that the third space is everything is between the submucosa and the second one that is the cavity. So, but they say that if you want to dissect just uh, under a lesion inside the muscle, you could still preserve the adventitia. For example, in case of the stomach, you cannot do it in the esophageal side because you have no adventitia in the esophagus. In this way, this is the muscle layer this is the adventitia, and you are trying to preserve this tiny layer of adventitia. So you are going to cut very deep in a very deep layer. In this way, so this was the side where the tumor was really attached to the muscularis propria, and you are cutting the muscularis propria, just trying to avoid touching the adventitia. But then we are in the rectal space. You can leave it in this way. But if you are in the gastric side, and I'll show you a video of the gastric side, you have to close it. So again, some bookmarks. Here we are with the diagnostic part. So they made after injection the first incision to expose the layers. Then here they use a combination of different devices because after this one, they put a clip in the flap they created and they put a snare attached to a second clip to have the traction. So as you can see, even with the other video I showed you, what we are missing in endoscopy is traction, is the, your second, uh, second arm. It's like you are working just with one arm, but you need sometimes really need a second one. And this is why the tunneling technique, the stir technique is so useful because you have the stability and you don't need traction in that case. But in case you need, you have to figure it out how to have it. And they're using here a snare. And after this, you will have your layers very well exposed and step by step. You should be able, never done this, is something really new. You should be able to dissect over the lesion to dissect the muscle and try to prevent dissecting also the adventitia. That is a very tiny layer. And for this one also, you need not only skills, but also knowledge about layers is a surgical knowledge because most of the time we don't know which layer is that one we are facing. They are different, but still we need to understand if it's the right way to go for us or not. Sometimes surgical procedure for this could be easier and faster. So we must admit that we have a limit. And after resecting all and block, they will close the gap, clipping, suture, whatever you have, whatever you are able to do. So here we have the concept of this first base uh, uh, surgery. They call it surgery because it is it's a flexible surgery originating for tumors originating from the muscularis propria layer. And uh, one something new coming is the concept of the endoscopic intermuscular dissection for that tumors that they are not very superficial, they are invading the submucosa and uh, you want really to go deeper to remove only the submucosa is not enough. So you want to also cut the first layer of the muscle. 
Uh, the fact is that you can't do this in all the tract of GI, only in the rectum, maybe in the stomach, I'm not sure. And for this one, we really need some long-term data because I'm not sure about the oncological outcomes of this patient. So I'm not understanding why we are doing this. And what else? Everybody's looking for this, for robotics. So this is from uh, uh, Professor Chu from Hong Kong. <clears throat> Let me say that nowadays it's still complex, but we have to start in one point. And you know that you have a console and you are um, from remotely um, administering all these devices that seems very surgical device because you have this when inside you have the scope and then you have two channels with two different instruments that can grasp and cut and coagulate. And finally, it's like similar to what the surgeon are doing transcendently, but you're doing with flexible endoscopy. And this is my last video. And uh, this is just one minute. So let's enjoy Professor Chu performing this nice procedure. This is really surgery to me. And uh, I hope that one day everybody can do this. We have to fight with a surgeon finally, I know. It will be a very big fight. Still, we are in the initial phase, but even if you encounter some complication, like for example, bleeding, you will be able to fix it because definitely you have two arms working, not just one. And in this way, they were able to complete the procedure and block. What we need? I'm not advancing. <laughs> okay, take what you need. What do we need? We need training. They are complex procedures. So how can we train on this? If we look at guidelines, so the, the, the best could be have one-to-one -one person that stay there and just point it out where you have to cut, which layer is that one, but this is not possible everywhere, every time. So if we look at the guidelines in the train curriculum, the curriculum is only for ESD because up to now was the uh, more difficult procedure to be done, but we are moving to the first space, third space, a lot of spaces are there, and still we are missing training. So they say that you should go, for example, for ESD from simulators to animal models to patients. But for example, simulators are coming just now on the market. So what can we do? Still, we don't know. And just remember that we don't have all the devices we need. Uh, remember that the first ESD was done just with the tip of the knife or for the fund application endoscopically done. Professor Inouye you know, had a prototype from a company. So we still need a lot of things. But just remember that underlying all of these facts, we need to think about the safety of this procedure. They can be very complex and you can have very big complications that you must be able to fix all of them. So some open issues, a great evolution, great things that are coming, but what's about training cost, uh, not only for money, but also for time and energy, maybe some national, international certification, and also think about complication. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. That was an excellent talk. In fact, we saw you yesterday performing an excellent ESD, and today we have a case as well. We'll take all the questions uh, while she is performing because we are running out of time and what uh, I want to conclude is uh, third space endoscopy is a field in evolution we have a lot of good procedures but the best is yet to come so with that we will conclude uh, the session thank you thank you thank you Radhika and Dr. Zahi we now move on to the next topic and uh, to moderate the session call upon Dr. Neelam who is a Director, Hepatology and Liver Transplant at Medanta, and Dr. Parani, who is a consultant gastroenterologist at Apollo Hospitals. Come, come, run up.
I wanted to take the timer from you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Reem. Uh, Shari, I was going to talk on endobariatric and metabolic endoscopy, and I think this there could have been no better way to take things away from the surgeons <laughs> because they've been pretty fond of the endobariatic the bariatric surgery. So let's move over to Reem to see what new we have in this field. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, uh, and it's uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, so when we think of the obesity uh, paradigm, in the U.S., you have over 101 million people who have a BMI of greater than 30. So those are the obesity class uh, twos and threes. And those are the ones where you can do something about. The ones that have uh, where surgery is indicated, those are BMI of 35 and above with comorbidities or 40 and above, although the, the surgeons are changing their guidelines to do them for le lesser people. And only about 1% to 2% undergo surgery each year. So you're left with a big uh, treatment gap. So that's sort of this little red dot. And then when we think about patients that you can treat with pharmacotherapy, so they're 27 and above, you still are only treating about 5% um, of those that are eligible. So again, you're left with um, a big treatment gap, and that's where endoscopy can come into play. Looking at this worldwide, uh, you have 1.3 billion overweight or obese people, 2.6 million die each year as a result of being overweight or obese. And it's soon said that uh, there are more obese patients or patients with obesity than hungry patients in the world. And the burden will soon become unaffordable to society. When you look at the data here, and I wanted to add uh, sort of a, the Indian experience, there are about uh, 20% of uh, people in India who are classified uh, as having obesity and 25% of females that are having obesity. Now, multiple reasons for that, and we can talk through this um, uh, later, but you can see here that there's also a rise in children with obesity, and there are about 14 million um, people in India, uh, children, who have obesity as well. And obesity doesn't just come alone. You have NAFLD and NASH with this, and then you also have diabetes. So you can see here that there are very different uh, treatment paradigms for this. You have diet and exercise, you have medications, and then you have the different surgeries, and this is where endoscopy can come in. Now, with lifestyle and pharmacotherapy, you can still get good treatment options. But what we're going through is the uh, surgical outcomes that uh, Roberta just talked about. So if you think about where we've gone from surgery, it went from open to laparoscopic to notes. Endoscopy went from seeing a polyp and referring it to surgery to sort of removing it ourselves. And we're sort of meeting where the third space meets. And that's where bariatric endoscopy, and, and you know, we, we heard a great uh, talk just before me uh, all about that. So everything is meeting in the middle, and, and hopefully uh, we can convince you that bariatric endoscopy is going to be a combination of both. So the advantages of bariatric endoscopy is that it's less invasive, it's less costly, it's an outpatient procedure, it can be repeatable, reversible, and it can have multiple purposes. Now, there are different ways of classifying uh, things. There's a menu of options that will take you through them. Ones that affect the uh, stomach, those are causing more weight loss options, and the ones that affect the small bowel have more of an anti-diabetic uh, NASH effect. Now, there are multiple balloons out there. There are swallowable balloons, double balloons, single balloons, balloons filled with fluid, air, nitrous oxide, a combination of both, uh, balloons that you put in endoscopically, balloons that you swallow, and then balloons that dissipate on their own. Um, there are different balloons that are available in the world, but in the U.S., these are the three uh, FDA-approved balloons. Um, and then Reshape got bought by a different company, so was shelved. Obalon lost a lot of their sales force during COVID, and so they're shelved now. And so Obera is the one that is uh, available in the U.S. Now, they had randomized controlled trials. Um, and what you see here is that the weight loss is roughly about 10% total body weight loss. 
the FDA was worried about a lot of these balloons because you can get complications. So even though it's a very simple procedure and we're going to show you one um, today, you can still get hyperinflation, you can get pancreatitis, and you can't put a balloon with anyone who's had any other um, procedure in the stomach. So a peg, a tiff, a fundoplication, poem, you can't have a balloon. The SPATS balloon was the uh, last balloon that got FDA approved. Uh, not last week, this is uh, sort of an older slide. But basically, it's an adjustable balloon. So, it, uh, And we're going to see this, so I won't belabor the point. Um, but it had 14.9%, so a little bit longer uh, weight loss. Now, the thing is with the balloons is that this has an adjustable strap so that if you have too much nausea or pain, then you can go in and take some fluid out. Or if you're not losing enough weight, you can go in and put some fluid in. But then you start doing an endoscopy for insertion, endoscopy for removal, and endoscopy for adjustment, so it may not be cost uh, effective. Uh, the last thing, this is the last balloon that's sort of getting a lot of buzz, is the Elurian balloon. It's basically you put it through like an NG tube and you fill it in with 500 cc's of fluid. Um, there's a valve here that has a suture and that dissolves after four months and so it basically opens up and dissipates and passes through the GI system. Uh, the weight loss is similar to other fluid filled balloons so it's about 10 percent. They initially had bowel obstructions because the balloons didn't deflate completely and so they have techniques where you have an IR needle that punctures the balloon in the stomach to, to um, push it through. So we know the weight loss is about 10%, but does it have any other impact? So uh, Barham at the Mayo Clinic did a paired liver biopsy study um, in, pa in patients. And what they did show that they did a biopsy at the time of insertion, a biopsy at the time of removal. You can see here that although they also lost weight, they had fibrosis that regressed and the NAS score also improved. And based on this, um, the AGA sort of said that for patients with NASH or NAFLD, you should use uh, balloons as an adjunct uh, uh, with lifestyle therapy for the treatment or NASH or NAFLD. And there is now a code for that for insurance purposes. And I know uh, that a at AIG, they're also doing a study with uh, SPAT, so a similar study. Gelesis or plenity is another device that even though it's a capsule, you basically, it's methyl cellulose cross-linked with citric acid. So it's like Metamucil. And basically you take two or three capsules half an hour before a meal with a glass of water. It expands in your, in your belly and so you eat, you feel full, you eat less theoretically. In the randomized uh, uh, therapy, you can see here that the, the Gelesis group had 6% total body weight loss. The sham control group had 4% total body weight loss. So it wasn't great, but it was statistically significant, and the FDA approved it. What I tell my patients is have a glass of water half an hour before a meal, and you'll have 4% total body weight loss. Um, what you can see here, though, is that there is a group that had uh, super responders. So some people respond really well and had 10% total body weight loss. Moving on to the endoscopic sleeve, you saw this yesterday, so it can be durable. This is obviously a procedure that you can do. Patients go home the same day. We showed that at five years, you can have a durability of about 15.9% total body weight loss. We also showed that you have um, improvement in, in uh, fatty liver with, based on the hepatic steatosis index. And then uh, lastly, last year at DDW, not as many publications as G, but um, you can see that you also showed improvement in um, LDL, ALT, uh, systolic blood pressure at five years, um, sort of showing that if you sustain your weight loss, then you can also get improvement in comorbidities. The largest study to date is from Saudi Arabia, and what they did is an inferiority study comparing a laparoscopic sleeve to an endoscopic sleeve. And here you can see that the weight loss with the endoscopic group is 14% versus 19%. But in both groups, you get improvement in comorbidities, similar adverse event rate, and that they all can have revision, sort of suggesting that there is a role for an ESG in, in a treatment population. AIG also has had um, uh, publications on NAFLD and obesity with uh, at the endoscopic sleeve. 
So on their 26 patients that they uh, published on, you can see significant improvement in um, all the ALT, the HSI index, and then the FIB4 scores, APRI scores, and uh, the NFS score. The randomized trial uh, that we did uh, um, in conjunction with surgeons and gastroenterologists um, uh, in, uh, in the U.S. last year was basically a randomized study versus li lifestyle. And you can see here that the uh, ESG group and the lifestyle group, when they crossed over, have similar weight loss, around 13 14%. Um, low risk of adverse events. But what was more important is that you do also have improvement in comorbidities with these groups. There was no increased risk of reflux, which is important because you get that with uh, surgical sleeves. You can get new onset Barrett's and new onset reflux, which doesn't happen with an ESG. And on the heels of this, the FDA approved the uh, Apollo ESG for the treatment of obesity. A lot of people ask about the learning curve. It takes about 35 cases to get this done under an hour, and it can take about 10 cases to get it done under two hours. Obviously, you have to be proficient with uh, suturing, and you have to have a good team with you. There are other suturing devices out there. Um, there is the POSE, which is the endoluminal uh, suturing apposition that basically causes serosa to serosa apposition. Now, this is still in its infancy because people are trying to still define um, the endoscopic technique. But in 44 patients, they had a 15.7% uh, total body weight loss with also some improvement in, in NASH and NAFLD. And uh, the uh, Thompson group also showed improvement in portal pressure measurements as well as weight loss when you do it. Jacques Devier's group um, developed another suturing device called the Endomina. The advantage of this is that you could put over any type of scope, so it doesn't have to be a double channel scope. And in their randomized trial that was also published in GUT, you can see that the weight loss was about 13% um, in their treatment group. Um, it's a little bit slower than the Apollo overstitch because you can't do running uh, sutures as, as easily. Now, how about uh, changing it and doing a motorized system? This is a group from Israel doing the endozip device. And basically, you put in a scope with the overtube that has the endozip suction. It does a motorized two or three uh, sections, and um, you get an endoscopic sleeve. And Ivo Boskowski um, and Spain are part of a trial, and they published sort of their first uh, immediately after, and then six months later. You can see this looks like a surgical sleeve, so maybe robotic sleeve is the future. So moving on from the stomach devices, there are other there, uh, treatments there, but they're no longer FDA approved, so I didn't include them. So moving on to the small bowel, you have the uh, duodenal jejunal barrier. So it basically copies a long limb bypass. And in a meta-analysis of 14 studies, you had improvement in A1C about, by about 1%. They initially had a lot of adverse events, and the trial was held on hold because they had a high rate of uh, abscesses. But the Thompson group uh, put together the publication um, that was held initially. And what you can see here is that you get improvement in A1C in, in that group. Now, if you look at the duodenal jejunal barrier, AIG sort of took it a step further and let's do the metamodex, which is sort of axios on speed of uh, having like a similar to what a lumen opposing scent uh, looks like. So this is the uh, delivery and um, the removal of these devices. Um, and so we're waiting to see the clinical data for this. Um, there's been some issues with stent migration, and so um, we're, they're using sort of pledgets and anchoring and suturing of this device. But you can see here that because of the way the stent is, you might have less complications than the barb device that the uh, duodenal jejuno uh, barrier has. And so this is what it would look like. Um, and you can see here that you'll get improvement in A1C and, and fatty liver as well. And the th whole theory behind this is that if you uh, buy into the foregut, hindgut hypothesis with diabetes or with NAFLD, the duodenal mucosa becomes hypertrophied. And so you want it to go back to basics. And so this is where mucosal resurfacing comes into play. 
And so um, Fractal or uh, uh, Revita is one of the newer devices out there that's now there have been several studies. And it basically ablates the duodenal mucosa going all the way from the um, uh, ligament of trites to the just beyond the ampulla. And so you inject to prevent any complications and then you heat or ablate uh, the duodenal resurfaces. And so um, in a, a prospective study, they showed improvement in A1C, improvement in ALT, improvement in HOMA IR, and this was independent of weight loss, sort of suggesting that this mechanism has an independent effect as to weight loss. And so then they did a randomized controlled trial uh, in Europe and also in Brazil. And what they showed is that you get improvement in uh, A1C in those groups and some improvement in, uh, in fatty liver. Um, and there are other devices out there sort of uh, trying to do similar things um, like extracorporeal uh, ablation. This is laser ablation, but it's still very new data. How about doing uh, anastomosis? So we saw a GJ yesterday, but um, this is from the Thompson group trying to use uh, magnets cause end-to-side anastomosis. Initially, they tried to make this an endoscopic treatment going from above and from below. And we heard from Mariana's talk how hard it is to sort of do spiral enteroscopy. So they've been that idea, and now it's a laparoscopic and an endoscopic procedure together. So it's probably going to still needs prime time, but you can see from their initial data um, from Prague, they had an improvement in diabetes, an improvement in A1C, in diabetics and all comers. What about other bypasses? So we talked about using the luminoposing stent uh, for, uh, for gastric outlet obstruction. This is proprietary uh, scent, similar to the luminoposing scent, but looks slightly different. Um, and this uh, was published uh, by uh, Marc Barthé. Um, and here is the video. And so it's not, uh, it's still a procedure that is going to, um, it's going to evolve a little bit. So you're doing a notes procedure to uh, dilate through the stomach. Uh, making an incision, grabbing um, uh, grabbing a loop of bowel that's at a certain distance of, of uh, 160 centimeters, sort of copying the surgical data, and then deploying the uh, distal flange and then the proximal flange of the stomach. And then you can do this in combination with uh, closing the pylorus or an endoscopic sleeve. You can get uh, similar procedures. So what you can see here is that we're still um, trying to perfect this procedure. It's going to be uh, hopefully uh, something that we can all do um, and not just a few people. And that's the key thing with these procedures. But we want to make sure that it has less uh, complications because it has to be better than surgery or has to be less complications than surgery. There are other devices out there. So this is half an axios that sits in the stomach, um, causes increase in accommodation and it makes you feel full. There's been some issues with uh, migration. There are other suturing devices out there. So this is from the Thompson group trying to find new suturing techniques. And then this is another coding of the uh, small intestine that was published early last year in science, uh, also causing uh, improvement in weight loss. So in conclusion, it's important to have uh, an important, uh, importance of a multidisciplinary program. You can add medications for inadequate weight loss or weight regain. We've heard there's so much about Wigovi, Ozempic, semaglutide, there's Monjaro. You can convert to another endobariatric procedure. So balloon, then ESG, or balloon, then pose, but you can't go the other way. You can also convert to surgery, so you have to keep on to have good relationships with surgeons. And you have to ensure that you have compliance with nutrition and ensure that patients understand that they're going to be your patient for a long time. Not like IBS, but they're going to see you for different, uh, different procedures. And they need to understand that this is not just a one-stop shop. They have to understand the tool com uh, uh, concept for weight loss. So the benefit ratio is important as well as the risk. You don't want to do something that's going to cause too many complications. You have to manage obesity as a chronic condition. Repeatability is important. 
you work well with surgeons, well, well with endocrinologists. And at Cornell, we also work well with our hepatologists. So we have a fatty liver center where patients come in, they get a fiber scan, liver biopsy, they see a cardiologist, and we work all together. So remember how I said only 2% undergo surgery each year, and you have 19% of those that are eligible for surgery who don't have any option. And then you have 88.6 million, this is just in the States, who so have a BMI of 30 and above. So you can use endoscopy for early intervention as a bridge to surgery for revision, primary alternative to treat metabolic diseases. So a full spectrum of care is essential to optimally treat obesity. And endoscopy is important as uh, early ob obesity revision for non-surgical patients. Surgery clearly has a role and medicines are important moving forward. Thank you very much. No dings. <laughs> But anyway, you have been born on the top. Neelam will announce. Yeah. Uh, for those uh, who did not uh, get to hear the introduction of uh, Reen, she is at the <laughs> Will Medical College of Cornell University. And she is not only the director of interventional and therapeutic endoscopy, but also for bariatric and metabolic endoscopy. And we are going to soon have the privilege of seeing her do live. So though we are excited to uh, ask you a few questions, but... Uh, there will be one pressing question which I have to ask you because I'm a pediatric uh, a gastroenterologist and I've been trying to ask for the other speakers too but lack of time. Now there are papers which have come a lot especially I've seen one paper of 109 patients from uh, you know I think it was Saudi with New York uh, which was very interesting because they took one of the youngest patient 10 but the average was between 15 to 19 years and uh, in that they talked a lot about the endo uh, endoscopic sleeve uh, surgery versus and the outcome was for two years so what I want to understand is that we to get reversal, we talk about 5 to 10 percent of the weight loss to get metabolic reversal. And we are looking at children. So how in the long term it's going to be useful? And uh, we have studies which are very short term that have been published. So what's your impression is the university been doing because you're heading the uh, bariatric endoscope? So I, I think that's a great question. I think uh, the key thing is to pick the patients well. So sometimes, especially if they're 15, 16, and their mom or dad brings them in, and they're not ready mentally for a procedure or how to eat, then it's never going to work. Um, but uh, balloons are probably the easiest thing to do in, in, those, in, 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 in younger patients. The endoscopic sleeve is good, and it's something that you could repeat later on if they need to, or you can convert to surgery or, or anything else later on. Um, but, and, and it has less complications as well, but it's not just the kid as well. I mean, in, in peds, it's a little bit diff different because you're dealing with the whole family. And yeah, so, so which is the procedure that you would, uh, do in case the whole thing is ready for and the family is accepted to go for a procedure? So it depends how much they want to lose. If they want to lose more than the five, ten percent and it want, they want it to be durable, then the endoscopic sleeve. Um, if, because with the balloon, once you remove it, you're going to regain back the weight unless you add medications or things like that. Um, there's been data now on giving patients, younger patients, medications, but we don't know the long-term side effects of that, so I think a lot of people are still hesitant to recommend that. And in the adults, what is the... Uh success rate long term in terms of 10 years I think so can, uh, Dr. I only started doing it um, nine years ago because uh, I was pregnant with my daughter when we first started doing it so I always counted as she's going to turn 10 in October that's I'll have my 10 year data then so we have up to eight years now where I've looked at it um, you have durability and you have uh, about uh, 15 to 14 percent total body weight loss. But like with everything, they lose weight, they plateau, and then you start seeing the regain. So at that regain, we either offer medications or we offer a reduced sleeve. Some people don't need anything and they're amazing, but it's a small group of people. I think long term, you're going to see probably an attrition rate of about 30%, which is what you expect and what you see with surgery as well. I get you. 
I get it. Thank you so much, Reem. And uh, I've been requested by the host to request you to go to the live endoscopic uh, you workshop on the top. Yes. Okay. On the top. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Neelam and Bharni, for taking us through this session. Uh, we are straight away moving on to the live workshop. In fact, they are ready there. And for the first session, I'd like to require, request Dr. Janavi. The ladies are called first. Thank you. They'll come forward. Yeah, for I just wanted to thank uh, Dr. Nagesh for ready for this amazing opportunity uh, to me and to Bharani. And uh, nice to know that she's from Hyderabad too, and I'm a Hyderabadi too. Yes. Thank you so much right. for having us over. Thanks. Uh, and Janavi and Setu, Dr. Setu Babu needs no introduction. Many of you have heard him on various seminars all over the country. And he, and actually I and he were colleagues in AIMS. He is going to take us through the session. Setu, the cases are ready. They will just. There is no tea break. I will request if anyone is interested to just go across and come in again because we have got a wonderful set of cases. Nagi, we are ready to receive the live. Janavi, between the two of you, you can take over. Setu, come this side. You can't see the screen otherwise. Well, uh, tea is going to be served one by one, so there's no hurry there. And we request everyone to be back here. And introduce him. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Nagi and Dr. Manu. Uh, I don't know how much uh, actually I'm suitable to be here. And when I told in my house, I said, what business you got to go there? It's all women's endoscopy. Then I think it's amazing that we, we are doing the wonderful program. And uh, I'm so happy to see so many women doing the procedures. And uh, we stopped actually doing all these complex procedures just because it takes a lot of time. So I'm one fellow impatient. Uh, we, I, I think the bariatric surgery. Uh, are you ready, uh, Nagi? Yeah. So good yeah. morning, Setu and uh, yes, Janmi. Thank you very here. much. I have with me Rabata who did that wonderful resection last evening, and it turned out to an R zero resection. Congratulations, uh, Rabata. Very happy for the patient. Yeah. And uh, so we've had a variety of very interesting cases that we saw yesterday, and today we have 20 more interesting ones. So we have a whole day, sit tight, and you can uh, watch all these cases. Uh, Robert, I hope you enjoyed your... Yeah, uh, I'm having a messages. great time really here in Adarabad with all of you, and thank you and all the staff for what you're making. This is really something unique. And uh, I want to say something, because my feeling from the, let's say, this point of view, the internal point of view, at the backstage is that, that really there's less competition than usual. I've done some other live endoscopy and sometimes, you know, you are looking and watching what the other colleagues are doing with some critical aspect. But here, there is a nice group that is working together. Everybody is so supportive and it's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. I think you've had a fantastic group, the best women endoscopists. Not only women, I think the best endoscopists in the world. So naturally, you expect <laughs> the best you. results. And I think uh, uh, we're uh, discussing with the audience. All of them are not only happy about the skills that are shown, but the explanations that are given, the teaching uh, methodology. They're all very happy. And I'm sure uh, this would be like everybody said, a historic moment and hopefully continues. And we'd like to thank your group for being here and support you of this. Uh, thank you very much. Thank I you. think we should start with the first case today because uh, Dr. Amruta is waiting and we'll have uh, the first case presentation. Thank we you. start with the first case. It's a 54 year old male thank you, thank you. who presented with dysphagia, halitosis, and weight loss. His barium swallow showing a Jenkins diverticulum. Here is an endoscopic image showing a large diverticulum in the upper esophagus. Barium swallow showing a large diverticulum. The plan is to perform a Z poem on this patient. The learning objectives are to understand the endoscopic assessment of Jenkins diverticulum. Selecting appropriate patients for Z poem and to understand the technique of Z poem. So here is a multicentric uh, study comparing the three techniques that is Z poem, 
flexible endoscopic septotomy and a rigid endoscopic septotomy. So basically there was no difference in the outcome between the three procedures. Uh, whereas rigid endoscopic septotomy was associated with highest rate of complications. Recurrent swollen ZPOM was similar to the other two procedures. Over to Dr. Amrita for the demonstration. Hi everyone. Um, it's great to be back with this uh, uh, superb uh, team here, Dr. Santosh, Dr. Rama, and Madhu. And we're going, and I'm here with Nandli, um, and we're going to show you uh, the Z palm. So, just to define it a little bit, coming through, um, oftentimes anchors can be missed on routine endoscopy, but you can see here, this is quite evident. You can see why this patient's having problems, and I understand actually now is having quite a bit of problems with aspiration. Um, you can see by preference, actually, it's to go right into the diverticulum here. And so one of the important things we need to do when we're deciding which method uh, to use is to measure. Um, and we just did a little measurement here. It's about three centimeters. Um, and so that's right on the border of this controversy about whether we should do septotomy or Z-palm. Um, my preference is to typically do Z-palm, and so that's what we're going to do today. But one other reason I think it may be beneficial in this case is you can see there's quite a bit of uh, hypertension right here. Actually, on both sides, you can see that the blanching that happens with the vessels as you're going through. So um, what z palm allows you to do is also even extend the esophageal myotomy a little bit past the base of the zenkers um, with safety because you're closing the flap afterwards. Um, and so that's, uh, that's how we're going to proceed. So the first step is going to be the um, injection. And this is also a difference in techniques that have evolved. So when z -palm was first described, the um, technique was to perform the injection about two centimeters above the septum, um, kind of very similar to the tunnel in um, for esophageal palm. But what has evolved is that now we can really perform the incision along the septum, and that is known as pose as uh, Roberta described in her talk, and as actually was described um, out of Humanitas. And um, the benefit of that is that you don't have to create this long tunnel, so it saves time, as well as the closure is quite efficient because you're really just closing that flap above. And uh, you can start to actually dissect and do the myotomy um, at the same time. So needle out. So, Amrita, uh, what if the patient has like esophagitis or esophageal ulcers, things like that? Yeah. Can we still do this procedure? Uh, we can. Stop. Um, well, it depends where mm -hmm. the patient has the esophagitis. If we see erosions here, then we wouldn't really want to do a tunneling technique because we would there be concerned that there could be mucosal lack of mucosal integrity and there could be a leak afterwards. Mm. If that were the situation, then I would say a septotomy would be appropriate okay. because the purpose is really just to cut the muscle. So, um, but yeah, you do want to clean out um, both the diverticulum and the esophagus. Knife out. Can Can I ask you a question? Sure. Yeah, but. Do you differentiate people who go for surgery and people who go for endoscopic? So I think um, that surgery is honestly not really indicated anymore um, because, uh, because this has, technique has now been shown to be so effective and safe. So I, I don't really see a role for surgery, but you know, I only see patients who come to me. Um, patients, I have now started to get patients uh, referred by surgeons, uh, ENT surgeons who um, are sent patients and feel like they may be better served by an endoscopic technique. Um, again, because with these new techniques, we can really decrease a few things. We can decrease the rate of um, complications, and we can also decrease the rate of recurrence, especially with the, um, especially with the Z-palm technique, where we can do a complete septotomy as opposed to the actual septotomy technique, where we have to leave a little bit of the septum in order to make sure that we are not um, having a perforation and mediastinitis. 
I don't know what's uh, what what's your thought, Natalie? No, I completely agree. I think that um, now we're leaning towards more of the um, endoscopic treatment. Um, unless, you know, you don't have the expertise of doing that, then obviously surgery is always an option there. Yeah, and one thing we're also seeing is treating patients who had a surgical technique and have a recurrence, similar to Heller's, actually, yeah. is that you know, because we can, again, go in and really cut as much as we want to with degree... Um, to the septum and the myotomy and with and close the flap afterwards that those scarred down um, patients uh, can easily be treated. So I'm using an I-type hybrid knife very similar to um, what was used yesterday during the poem and saline with uh, some indigo carmine. So we have a little bit of a bleeder here. So I'm going to first try to see if I can treat that with the knife itself, and if we can't, then we'll use the coag graspers. So one thing you can do is to inject here. The injection itself helps tamponade the bleeder and helps you identify. You can see there right, right where the source that is. Right there, yeah. Uh, we're using precise sect, which may not be good for a focal. Um, so let me have the coag uh, graspers, please. Grasper. So we're going to switch to the coag graspers. One thing we want to do is, again, you can put a little tamponade with the cap right here and, and irrigate so we can see the actual source of the bleeding as much as possible while we switch over to the coag graspers. We change our settings for the coag graspers to soft coag. And you can see the source right there. Um, when we irrigate, right down at the bottom, you can see the little pulsating yeah. vessel. Right about six o'clock, yeah, it's, yeah. So the it's cap is providing a little tamponade. We'll irrigate a little bit, and then we'll just apply the coag graspers. Sometimes you can put a little marker or sticker on the instruments to know when it's coming out. So I'm just moving over slightly, and then we'll open. There we go, Perfect. and then close. Okay, uh, we're on soft coag. So when we use soft coag, okay, yeah, we are. Uh, what we want to look for is the bubbling to indicate the bleeding has stopped, and it looks like it hasn't stopped here. So open. So we'll just see, make sure we're on the right place. Sometimes you have to move, yeah, we have to yeah. move the mucosa over a little so we can expose the vessel. Are we completely open? Yeah. You can really, even though it looks like it's close here, uh, I think we're on the mucosa. Open? Open? Yeah. So even though it close, Bleeding good. sometimes good. creates some um, little panic. You really can take your time because what you don't want to do is just be blindly. Uh, we're not seeing much effect here. There we go. So you see that yeah. bubbling? That's what we're looking for. I'm going to keep it closed and irrigate to see if we still have bleeding, which we do. Oh, Open. Yeah. Open. And the patient is intubated. So that we, uh, we can go. be. Open. Um, sure that the uh, respirations and the respiratory, Close. everything is under control. Um, and so, I think we've stopped it. We'll look here. It looks, yeah, yeah, it looks like it stopped. Good. Yep. All right, so we'll take the knife back. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it's really important, you know, that you don't sort of drink too much. Um, look for that source, there's steps that you can take, like I said, the tamponade, and then uh, even injecting to just help visualize. Knife out. Yeah. Knife out. I'm going very nice how you showed how we stop the bleed. Uh, I think what we'll do is we'll go over, as we're continuing with the procedure, we'll go over to room number one, where the problem is ready with another case, and then get back to you. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, 70 hours me. Put Koli Lithiasis on Koli Doko Lithiasis. 
we have seen the RTP as one and underwent open CBD exploration one year back. He now presented with obstructive to underwent fever. His lab showed elevated alkaline phosphatase. Here is an MRCP showing dilated CBD with multiple CBD calculi with a peri-amphalary diverticulum. The plan is to do an ERCP with sprinkletomy and sprinkletoplasty followed by CBD clearance. The learning objectives are here to understand the techniques of selective CVD cannulation and spintrotomy and spintroplasty. Here is a meta-analysis comparing endoscopic spintrotomy balloon, di uh, balloon dilatation and endoscopic papillary balloon dilatation. The risk of pancreatitis is low in ESVD, however, bleeding risk is high. Over to Dr. Chablin. The mic is off. The mic is off. Okay, we're getting back. One second, one second. The mic is switch, being switched on. Just a second. We'll get back. Try to shift just now. We're shifting it. One second. Is it on? Yeah, it's on now. Oh, great. All right. So, um, good afternoon, welcome back. Uh, I'm here again with the Stellar AIG team with Dr. Sona Mathur, who's uh, moderating with me. Uh, Dr. Mohan Ramachandani is in the room, Mr. Srinivas, um, Dr. Tejesh, and Dr. Rubina, they are the anesthesia staff who's going to be helping. So, we heard about this case. Uh, this is a native papilla. I think right away you see this is a generous papilla, which is what we would need for this case, as the stones are anywhere from, um, I think, 12 to 15 millimeter in size. I think you can probably appreciate a different orifices. You can see that's the biliary orifice that I'm looking at. Pancreatic would be at 5 p.m. So I, what I tell all my trainees is it's all about the trajectory. You know, you want to be aiming at 11 a.m. You want to be giving a little bit of a bow and then aim in the biliary trajectory. And then in about 70% uh, of the cases, you get a deep cannulation like this. Um, and then uh, Mr. Srinivas astutely has the guide wire in, uh, which appears to be probably coiling around the stones. Now we have a deep uh, wire cannulation in there. So the goal in this case is to do balloon sphinteroplasty. This is where you would want to do submaximal sphinteromy. Uh, you don't want to do a full sphinteromy because uh, with a full sphinteromy, if you were to do a balloon sphinteroplasty, the risk of perforation would be higher. Um, so we are ready to make the cut and please feel free to uh, stop me, ask any questions anytime or Dr. Mathur if you have any questions. How do you limit your cut? Can you give me, say, how many millimeters? Yeah, so... Mucosal lining or something. Excellent. So, go up all the way, Mr. Srinivas. So, in this case, um, you know, the sphinctotome is all the way bowed up. You can uh, probably appreciate the intraduodenal portion of the bile duct. I haven't cut all the way. I literally stopped about, I would say, 60% or so. Uh, so, the key is identifying the, you know, the intraduodenal portion of the bile duct here. Um, so I haven't gone full, the sphinctotome comes out okay, I estimate I made about 8 millimeter cut, we are going to exchange the wire, um, sure we can inject contrast. So we saw on the MRI already there, we are probably going to see multiple large filling defects like this, so we have seen two, three, four, so this is what we would call as um, difficult stones. <coughs> Uh, multiple stones, large stones, stacked stones. Age more than age more than sixty-five years, altered anatomy, had previous surgery. And would you like to tell us, ma'am, why you choose this pink toto? Um, because Mr. Srinivas asked me to. <laughs> um, well, the real answer is I am uh, uh, used to short wire system at our institution. Um, with the uh, what I'm using here is a long wire system, clever cut, which has multiple advantages. I think the clever cut is good for the biliary cannulation. It points in the biliary direction compared to the short wire system. Um, and then it has an insulated edge which prevents the uh, mucosal injury. Um, so I think that those are the advantages of using the system. But then again, you know, when you're using the long wire system, you need to have an experienced person who is handling the wire on the other end. Madam, can I ask you a learning message? Would you decide on uh, lithotripsy versus balloon plastic? What would be your differentiation or indication? 
yeah good question so i think you know when would you do um uh, lithotripsy generally rule of thumb less than one centimeter you should be able to take it out with simple balloon sweeps anywhere from one to two centimeter uh you largely be able to manage with the balloon sphinteroplasty more than two centimeter i think are the cases where you will need additional like either mechanical lithotripsy or uh, ehl or laser at our institution we have ehl um now, that being said, sometimes you see uh, really calcified stone on images. It's very rare to see calcified stones in the bile duct. But if you do, those are the cases you don't want to do mechanical lithotripsy on because it's going to break the wires of the basket and the basket is going to get trapped. So those are the ones you would want to go if they are large, more than 2 centimeter, uh, with uh, laser or electrohydraulic lithotripsy. Now, in terms of balloon sphinteroplasty, uh, you know, there are different schools of thought here. Um, most people that, are, you know, they would say that once the balloon is fully inflated, you keep it inflated for 60 seconds, 90 seconds. Um, um, I personally just inflate it once the waste is gone, I let it down. The rationale about leaving it uh, longer is uh, it causes hemostasis and prevents the bleeding. Uh, there's some data which showed a study uh, that if you leave it inflated for three minutes, uh, it increases the risk of pancreatitis. So you certainly don't want to leave it inflated and just uh, wait around. So up to what size you are planning to dilate it, ma'am? So this is a 12 to 15 balloon. Uh, the duct we estimated was, uh, you know, very generous, 14 to 15 millimeter in size. We'll inflate with 12 first floor. Yeah, I'm Dr. Uh, balloon down. Uh, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. You said in, uh, inflating the balloon for three minutes, is it, it decreases the risk of pancreatitis? It increases. It increases the risk of pancreatitis. Let me take it out a little bit more. My best of knowledge, it decreases the risk of pancreatitis. What the literature says? No, ah. it increases the risk of pancreatitis because when you keep it inflated, the idea is you are compressing the PD orifices. Uh, one second, Mr. Srinivas, let me take so, it. So, Rajesh has probably missed uh, doing this procedure that controversy came because of the Korean study which was published which showed that if you inflate the balloon for a very long Hello? time, five minutes, yeah. then it decreases the chance. That was the intact papilla, not the post-ventral papilla. And there's been some controversy on that study yeah. also. So, I think uh, we should not take that as a basis. All right. So again, you know, several uh, the different schools of thought. You know, when we are doing, we are to twelve, Mister. Are we going to? Okay. Um, you know, do we inflate it next to the stone? Do we? We can just stop at twelve. We let it down and see. Um, or, uh, sh is it okay to inflate it next to this? We can let it down. I think. I think uh, we should go to fifteen. Probably, I feel because the stones are very large. Twelve may not be sufficient. No. Ma'am, in what your do you experience, mean? have you ever dilated up to eighteen? Yeah, keep it inflated, Mr. Srinivas. Go up to a little bit higher. Uh, I'm sorry, say that again? Have In your experience, have you dilated it up to 18? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you can go up to 18. Depends upon the size of the duct. What is the uh, uh, the ampullary anatomy looks like? Uh, you can certainly go up to 18. Not common. But if you look at the guidelines, you know, in ESGE, they, they recommend the small papillary balloon dilation. I think 8 or 10 millimeter. We are up to 15, right, uh, Mr. Srinivas? Prableen, uh, time-wise, does it make a difference? Half a minute, one minute, two minutes? Yeah, you know, honestly, I, you know, I don't think I'm sold on that, as I said. Uh, that keeping it longer, you know, that being said, the, the moment I deflated a little bit, I did see some heme. So that's why I kept it up a little bit longer. Uh, but the people who keep it inflated longer, they, they are firm believers that it reduces the risk of uh, bleeding. So I think that looks pretty okay. We'll find out. Ready for exchange? Uh, there's some ooze. We'll figure that out. As yesterday it was commented, magnified 10 times, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. So um, the next accessory, you would like to go for the balloon or the basket? Yeah, I'll start with balloon first. Um, see how things go. And then uh, we'll go from there. Uh, Ma'am, one more question about spintroplasty. So, if there is a distal CBD narrowing or if the distal CBD is not that dilated, then will you go ahead with the spintroplasty and what limit? Excellent question. So, it's not uncommon for patients who have these multiple large stones who have a, a fibrotic distal inflammatory stricture. Uh, 
So those are the patients that, you know, they you will not be able to dilate that stricture enough, especially if you're dealing with large stones. Those are the ones you would need to go um, with uh, either mechanical or electrohydraulic laser lithotripsy. Madam, in this case, actually, this is a post-op CBD exploration. W would you be giving a better guideline to use this vincroplasty? I'm sorry, say that again? This is a post-op CBD exploration. Blown up 15. Yeah. So you need to give a little caution about using, uh, you know, balloon dilatation. This so, is, my, uh, yes. yeah, so my understanding is there was no um, change in the uh, anatomy of the bile duct. This is pretty much intact. There is no bypass. Um, yeah, you see multiple stones. I just wanted to see the distal part or right, balloon down. So um, that's why I don't think there would be any, I would be employing any different strategies here, balloon down. So when you're doing the balloon sweep, obviously you don't want to be stacking everything at the papilla. You start at the lower end and try to get them out one at a time. Balloon up, 15. Yeah, and uh, when you are extracting, please show with your hands the strategy balloon of down. dragging down the balloon. Yeah, so as you see, you know, this is, you have an upward trajectory here. This is, uh, this is nice. I really don't have to adjust my scope a whole lot. Um, so I'm pushing balloon down, Mr. Srinivas. I think the stones are above. Um, all right, balloon up here. So duct is very generous. I may have to go to even an 18 balloon. So you can see the actually ability. You saw one stone pop out and then probably another pop out there. That's a balloon coming out. Um, sometimes you just have to push the scope in a little bit and then uh, you, you the right. Uh, clockwise torque, you can torque your right left wheel to the right and then gently pull the balloon out. It's not a yank, it's just gentle traction. Balloon up. Excuse me, I have a question. Uh, if you have a distal CBD stone that is impacted, how do you ensure that the stone is out of the way before the plasty is done? Yeah, so you know the key here is I, I believe first of all the sphincterotomy has to be in a nice trajectory. You know, if your sphincterotomy is at 12 o'clock position, the, the angle and trajectory is nice. You don't have an overhanging fold that you're dealing with. So ensure that. Um, and uh, if there is no stricture, most of the times, you know, there is not a issue with the hanging stone. Of course, if the issue is fibrosis at the bottom, you have balloon up. You have uh, um, a place to extend the sphincterotomy or do balloon sphincteroplasty, I would go ahead with that. And finally, I would like to make a point, don't forget the utility of putting in a plastic or even a fully covered metal stent balloon down. Um, so people have shown that even seven French stent has a high yield of clearing the stones, presumably by the friction. So I think we have done a good yes. job clearing it out, balloon up. Even I feel you have cleared the... Yeah, there's one more coming out. A small one there. No, there may be one more still. All right. Let's go up to 18, get a cholangiogram. Yeah. You know, when the duct is so big, I think your dilatation 15 doesn't do the job. Because oh, there's another one. There's a, yes, there's one and it is slipping between the balloon and the yes. duct yeah. wall. Yeah. So, you know, this brings up a point of um, missed stones on cholangiogram. Is this the case where, you know, you would insert a cholangiogram, make sure you have cleared the duct? Probably not unreasonable, but it's a generous sphincterotomy. Uh, Thank you, Prabhupada. Okay. I think a fantastic demonstration. You cleared all the stones and Thank really you. nice. Right. So, so we'll, go, we'll go to the next case with Dr. Radhika is ready with another case. And again, a very historic moment for women and endoscopies in India. Where Radhika would be doing this on a big international scene. And uh, she's also lucky because she is the world's best assistant with her room. Who is very good at this. Thank you very much. Yeah. So here is a 44 year old male who presented with recent UGI bleed. His endoscopy showed a large bundle varices and small intercalar varices. Triphysic CT showing large bundle varices without pneumonia emulsion and this is the endoscopic image. He is showing large bundle varices. The plan here is to do a US guided coil and blue placement for the obliteration of varices. The only objective is to understand the approach to the management of gastric varices and to understand the technique of EUS guided glue and coil insertion. So here is a large experience over six years which shows that EUS guided combined technique is better and effective for the hemostasis 
in active bleeding and also for primary and secondary prophylaxis. Over to Dr. Radhika. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Reddy sir, Sandeep sir, and AIG team uh, for giving me this opportunity. I think, uh, can you see my uh, screen uh, clearly in auditorium? Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, so you can see the uh, pancreas here. I am rotating clockwise, clockwise. You can see the spleen here. And if I rotate my scope extreme clockwise, you will see the, these are vascular channels coming into the view. So I will put Doppler and you can see very big varics. On endoscopy, if you use a serine classification, these are GOV2. This patient is having a grade 1 esophageal varices and very giant varix into the uh, fundus. And uh, studies have shown that endoscopic uh, obliteration of uh, gastric varix is much safer compared to endoscopic glue. Can I ask one question, basic? Yeah. I belong to the old generation. Ah, uh, sir. Do I really need an endosono for this? Because I see them so beautiful. Uh, sorry, sir, I didn't get your question. So, uh, I, I, I did inject a lot of gastric viruses uh -huh. and I was not a sonologist. Okay, sir. Do you really need uh, guidance for this particular one? Yes, yeah, sir. Can... Uh, we need because uh, if, if we see uh, what we were doing uh, endoscopically uh, was a blind method. Yes. We didn't know the feeder, we didn't know the size. And the obliteration uh, was subjective. We were just touching the vessel whether it is hardened or not yes. uh, on an endoscopy view. But yes. with endosco uh, endosono view, you can see the varix on um, uh, whether it is obliterated or not. And under visualization, you can put the coil. And uh, there are two methods uh, by which uh, uh, you can... Uh, puncture this coil that is transgastric and transesophageal. I like uh, transesophageal way because uh, you are puncturing esophagus muscularis propria and then puncturing gastric muscularis propria and going into the varix. So this will uh, help in giving a tamponade if any bleeding occurs. If you are puncturing a varix directly that is submucosal varix, so uh, chances of bleeding is there and if you are taking another picture and putting a glue that glue will come out through the first puncture. So always uh, see the window if you are able to puncture through the esophagus, that is the best technique I would say. That's a really good point. Um, so you have two ways I of puncturing uh, this and, and you're going to do it through the um, esophagus. So you were talking about the classifications. Are there any different types of classifications where you would not do gastric or should you do esophageal banding then the gastric or should you do gastric then esophageal or what what's how would you choose it uh, okay so it depends on the uh, how big is the esophageal varices is there any uh, stigma of bleed or not if it is uh, the esophageal varices are very big and uh, then i will definitely band the esophageal varix first and uh, if uh, gastric varix no stigmata nothing is there i would uh, tackle it later on so you can see the varix here and uh, okay. these varices are submucosal. You can see the first layer which is uh, uh, Dr. Adhika, can you please explain the water installation method that you have used? Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, whenever you are uh, uh, doing coiling uh, with a US, you always put a water because uh, uh, these varix we are doing, uh, these are in a fundus. And water, uh, water will help in a floating of the varix and uh, as well as it will improve the visualization. So uh, it helps in a better visualization. So always put 100 cc or 150 cc of water, but also take care of patient should not aspirate. Do not put too much. or instill too much water. So before um, when you are planning any US guided coiling or glue, always uh, prepare the accessories or instrument which you require for the uh, use guided coiling uh, plus glue. So I am using a linear eco endoscope here. Uh, this is 180 series from Olympus. You can use a forward view scope also. The advantage of forward view scope that you can retrovert in a fundus. Uh, that we can't do with a linear but the advantage of linear is the, uh, you will get a 180 degree of view with forward view, you will get only 120 yeah. degree. Okay. So without wasting our time, we'll um, 
uh, inject these varies and before that uh, what are the pre uh, preparation I have made. So we are going to use this 19G uh, needle, uh, gauze needle from Olympus. I like this needle because if your scope is angulated, it is very flexible and we have primed this needle already. Second, we are going to use coils from Cook and uh, you can see here, you can focus here, I am going to use this 035, 14 and 16. So what does mean of 35? 3.5 means the thickness of coil. So when you are using a 19 gauge needle, you go with a 3.5. But when you are using a 22 gauge needle, then you have to use 18, 14, 12 like this. 14 suggests the length of coil and 16 suggests the diameter of coil. So this diameter is based on the size of barracks. The size of barracks is almost uh, 25 mm in this. So I may use a two, uh, 2 coils or 3 coils depending on the size of Paris and in addition to that we have kept glue also this uh, n butyl cyanoacrylate and uh, we have also prepared 5 to 10 uh, cc syringes filled with a distilled water so i will so she's fully prepared yeah, i will that you all see uh, Dr. Radhika, this actually looks like a kind of a bunch of grapes appearance. So yeah, yeah. Is there a feeder anywhere? Because yeah, uh, so we try to identify feeder, but it's here, no, it's very difficult to identify which is the feeder inflow or outflow track. You can see multiple uh, extramural uh, varices here. These are extramural and these are intramural. Okay. So in this... Uh, I am not able to identify actually, there were uh, multiple collaterals and I didn't see any uh, big shunt also here. So when you don't see a feeder, what's your technique? Actually, um, my technique is I always uh, do coiling plus glue of uh, uh, this intraluminal uh, varics. I sense. never touch extra yeah. mover part. Yeah. Uh, there are groups, uh, they are advocating to block the feeder vessel. But still it is very controversial and it is very too early to uh, conclude that whether should we block feeder vessel or, or, not. or not. I think the key thing is what you're doing. So you're doing it under visualization. You have the right size coils. You might use more than one and then you'll do glue and then we can reassess if we need to do um, any more. So you're going to preload, you're going to... No, I'm not preloading. So we'll show uh, them how to load the coils in, a in real time. Yeah, in real it, time. It's only that happens here at AIG when people know what they're doing. Sometimes you have to preload everything beforehand so that you save up time. Um, but uh, here you can, you're you're going to see sort of a nice technique of of coiling and loading. So you're trying to find a good site. Okay, to my puncture. sheet is out. Can you sh uh, can you? Uh, can you point out yeah. the sheet? Okay. Okay. And I am going to target distal most. So here's her needle. Yeah. 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 Okay. I need to see. Okay. So you can see she did it in yeah. a very nice controlled fashion. I want to go little deep. Okay, there is one septa which is obstructing my view. So I want to push my needle further. Sometimes what happens, no? When you are trying to push your needle, it goes. a counter puncture happens. Yeah. But you don't have to worry about it, okay? No. So I think it is there. So we'll... Uh, if there are multiple septa, uh, Radhika, you target each uh, loculi or you hit the big one? Sir, I will first go distally and target big one uh -huh. and now load. Hmm? load. Yeah, you can see the bubble there. Uh, we have injected water. And so these are the same coils that you would use um, for IR. Uh, can you... Can you uh, uh, camera, can you point out how they are loading the coils? So the coil is in here. Coil is in an introducer and with stillet we are loading that coil into the needle. And uh, once we have loaded the coil into the needle, we will take out the introducer and we will push it out with the stillet. And so hopefully you will see it 
come out here in the yeah yeah there is a formula sort of for the size of the uh, coil and the size of the varix yeah uh, sir uh, actually we have learned this technique from our uh, radiologist friend uh, what they used to do you can see the hyperechoic yes. coil there can you see very nice yes. so always uh, use uh, uh, coils bigger than a varix so in this uh, i am actually uh, going to target uh, i am going to use two or three coils so you're injecting after each one with distilled yeah. water yeah or the other way I, I've seen Ken Ben Muller do is he aspirates to make sure you're still in a vessel, but you're in a good position, you know you're there, and we can even do some flow as well. Uh, you can see a lot of big varices in there. So what size are you going to do next? Uh, 14, 16, same size, yeah. yeah. This varix is big. I may require two or more coil for further. And you can see here... They were just doing everything without us saying anything. Very efficient. <laughs> and now, okay, the coil should come out. Yeah. Nice. So the the second coil has been loaded, and I will withdraw my needle again. Okay. Can you see the tip of my needle again? Yes. Yes. Yeah. We can okay. So we are loading a third coil. Okay, Radhika, I think fantastic uh, demonstration. So, as you are finishing off, we will go to room number three where Amrita is ready okay. to show us the myotomy. Okay? Okay. We will get back to see the final picture. Yeah. Amrita, yeah. Hi, we're back. Yeah. Uh, I have Asma with me now. Um, so, we've dissected um, down both sides of the septum. I'll just show you here. This is a, was a very vascular... Um, base. Typically, it's not so vascular, but this is the esophageal side of the septum. We've dissected all the way down to about 20, which is where the base of the uh, diverticulum is. And then if we go on this side here, we'll show you the diverticular side in the submucosa. Um, again, dissected all the way down to about 20. So we're ready to start the actual um, myotomy now. Uh, so I'm going to come so, you know, different uh, strategies here. You could switch your knife over to an insulated tip if you wanted to. I think we'll just keep going with this one. The one thing I want to do is make sure I get that mucosa out of the way so that we don't injure it. Um, and then I'm going to use this knife. And, and here, it's a little, like, similar to the G poem we were describing. Um, I'm going to kind of go in layers, um, not try to just you know, get at the entire septum in one shot. I just want to come here. Okay, so now we're going to cut. So initially, sometimes what you have to do is actually, while you're doing the dissection, is to cut um, a little bit of the muscle itself, just to be able to have room to fit the knife in. So it's so thick, you can see here, that it, we actually don't have too much room to fit the cap itself. So I'm just cutting a little bit. Uh, Amrita, do you think using that J Professor Jack DeWare's diverticulotome makes the job easier? So, you know, it's hard for me to say because we don't have that available in the U.S., so I've never actually used it. Okay. Um, but I, I've always found that the cap, even when, it, even when you do a septotomy, works pretty well um, uh, to allow for the uh, separation of space. I think if you're, you know, well-versed and you're used to it and you're just doing a septotomy, it might make the septotomy a little bit easier. Um, because when we watch him, that uh, the two sides just fit onto the septum, you know, yeah. and you cut through. Yeah, no, I think if you have it, well, you do have it available here. They did offer it to me, but again, it's not something I've typically used, so... Um, so what you're seeing, I'm just having a little, there we go. Amrita, do you have a preferable approach like Zipoyam or the septotomy or? Yeah, we were describing earlier that yeah. um, since uh, starting Zipoyam, I like it because I find that um, 
the it, it allows me to really feel confident about doing a complete septotomy as opposed to when you're doing um, the septotomy without the z poem then we have to leave a little bit for safety purposes and there is a described increased recurrence rate when you do it that way so I like doing the z poem but I think if it's a really large diverticulum there is a lot of you know val uh, value in thinking about doing the septotomy instead because then you have a very long flap left over um, which could still create part of the problem. So you see here there's a split in this um, muscle and it's important to recognize that that is part of, still part of the septum um, and to not necessarily stop there. So you can see like this muscle is on the septal side. We want to definitely make sure that we still get this and we don't leave that in place and then being careful not to injure the mucosa so we'll kind of go back and forth starting from one side and cutting in the other direction and Again, sometimes what I like to do is actually cut a little bit more on the um, esophageal side in terms of the muscle because I think pathogenically, I think there's a little there's a little bit of hypertension that is actually causing the diverticulum to form. So, kind of doing a myotomy there may help in decreasing the recurrence, but that's not uh, supported by data. So, how deep would you go? How much from the bottom would you leave the muscle? So I, I wouldn't because I'm going to be know that I know that I'm going to close this. So I'm not worried about um, I'm not worried about uh, you know mediastinitis, which is the concern with the septotomy alone. So even if I cut um, the esophageal, the circular muscle of the esophageal beyond the sept, beyond the diverticulum itself it's actually safe. So I'm going to, I mean, I, I think we haven't reached the bottom here yet. Um, we're almost there. But I'm going to feel confident going a little bit lower than what I would normally do if it was just a septotomy. So I understand it's a little controversial here at AIG. Any thoughts, uh, Nagy, that you'd like to share with us about Septotomy versus Z-POM? My own preference is septotomy. I think uh, the, the reason is that uh, I think uh, this Z-POM is a more, di more difficult way of doing the same procedure. But I, I know the, there is a generational difference in this. Um, Mohan and Zaheer would like to do Z-POM. I like to do a septotomy. But the most important is the outcome studies that we have to look at. If you look at the only one study which is actually published and this study showed clearly well, the effectiveness is similar, but uh, the complications or maybe the learning curve for Z-POIM is higher. So I think this is an area of personal choice. I would personally, subtract mode have taken about a uh, few minutes to finish, whereas you can see so you have to be as skilled as Amrita is to do this procedure and it takes a longer time. So I think there is a little difference in opinion. I would personally do a subtract in the cases that I see. And plus if you have a diverticular scope, it becomes much more easier in a diverticuloscope. It makes it very easy. For sure. And I think it's important to continue to learn both techniques um, in case, you know, the situation renders itself that you really shouldn't do a Z-POM. Um, so that's, you know, I think that's important um, that we don't always do this. So I think we've actually reached the bottom you see it's one single layer that's probably just the circular layer of the esophagus. Uh, we've reached about 21. Uh, the bottom of the diverticulum was at 20. We'll just come out and see. We, we look for obviously any mucosal damage, which I don't see here. And it's much more open. You, could, you saw before it was really close. And you can see here is the, um, tunnel tech, the tunneling and that goes down pretty far. So I think if all agree, we've um, completed that. Well, Amrita, fantastic, you know, this, I think, uh, very skillfully done. 
uh, we'll see your final closure once you put the clips on and we'll just go to Radhika's room and come back to you. Okay, sure thing. Radhika? Yeah, yeah I think uh, that deserves a hand. It's a wonderful procedure done. Uh, sir, uh, can you see this varix which is now completely obliterated? Yes. And there is no single Doppler flow and you can see the coil within also. You injected this, how yeah. much glue Radhika? A uh, 1 cc sir. So that is the advantage of US uh, guided uh, coiling plus glue. It no. decreases the need of uh, glue and uh, definitely uh, with that it decreases the risk of embolization too. Thank you. Well done. Thank you sir. Reem, especially well done. She has been huh? trained at AIG. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We'll okay. have a change of guard here in the in the auditorium. I thank both uh, Setu okay. and Janavi for taking us through these three cases, okay. and I request the next. Okay, session. Yeah, Radhika and Dean, thank you very much. I think fantastic very nice demonstration. That was very good. So we talk. We started taking the selfie also. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll uh, go back yeah. to Amrita's room and Amrita, we are Thanks. going coming we'll, back to you for the clipping part. Yeah, we'll change. Raja. Amrita is on again. We want you to join us on the stage. Asma and Amrita is on. Maybe we should ask Asma also what she's doing. Are you doing here? Uh, Zenka, Sasma, are you doing Zenkers or are you doing a septotomy? Septotomy. Oh, the Rakesh. 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 Diverticulate is quite big and you have like uh, a quiet room for septotomy. I, I do, I am using the, um, like the scissor knife. Uh -huh. yeah. That's actually a good point. Um, yeah. the, there are the scissor type knives which yeah. are ideal for yeah. um, septotomy and it really makes that go very quickly. Theoretically, there's a little bit of an insulated insulation on the um, yeah. back side of that scissor knife. I'll, I'll do the I'll yeah. do the rotation. So the two the clutter knife and the SB knife. In fact, yeah, SB knife. Yeah, we use the SB knife long back. Mm -hmm. We reported a series with Mohan. This is the resolution. And uh, of course, this is insulated. So the it's resolution. Uh, okay. Yeah. So we'll, so here we are. We're going to close. So what I'm going to try to do is to get right up to that apex. Um, and Dr. Amrita. Yes. Yes. Does the size of the diverticulum decide the uh, type of the procedure you are uh, going to take, depending close. upon? Yeah, it does. I mean, uh, the study out of Humanitas said the average size was about um, three centimeters on that one. And I think that they did a, kind of did some analysis. Uh, if Roberta is there, she can um, correct me. But saying that above, above three, close. Yeah, to play. Um, above three that you really, a septotomy is probably a better idea. I think the thought behind that is that the mucosal flap that is left over may continue to um, cause some degree of uh, retention and dysphagia. And if obviously if it's a larger diverticulum, then that you know becomes an issue. Um, how some people are now practicing where they actually cut the mucosal flap either at the time of the pro procedure or bring patients back if they're continuing to have problems. Um, um, which clips are you using? These are resolution clips. Um, and you gave the incision on the diverticulum itself. On, on, the, on the septum. So any difference giving a one centimeter proximal to it and on the diverticulum? Yeah, so the studies show that actually um, it's a much shorter procedure time when you do... Um, close? When deploy, when you do um, the sep the septotomy, the mucosotomy along the septum, um, and sometimes you actually can start to cut the muscle and dissect at the same time. And you know the other, in theory, I think originally there was some concern that maybe the patient could feel the clips. I don't think that's the case. Uh, or there was limited room. I think it's much easier to oppose the mucosa when you're going along the septum because there's already a natural sort of um, ridge to, to work with. 
any problem in creating a submucosal tunneling when you do over the septum if, if you give the incision? Uh, there can be if it's a really wide um, septum and it takes a little bit of time to sort of separate the submucosa, a dissect underneath it. Um, but in that situation, what you can start to do is actually to start to cut the muscle itself. Uh, close a little. Close. Is to cut the, uh, the muscle itself as you're dissecting. Open. Open. Close. Um, and that gives you a little bit of room, a little space to actually then proceed with the dissection. Um, what I experienced in this particular case, rotate a little bit, is that uh, it rolled, it was rolling over the um, septum a little, which made it somewhat difficult, but we overcame that. Okay, open here. Okay, so I, I needed to make sure that clip was kind of out. So what's happening now is the cap is pressing against the clip, and that's helping to kind of oppose the tissue nicely. Close here, and deploy. Um, much like in the, in the esophageal poem, you want to use that prior clip to really pull the tissue up um, so that it gives you a nice tension um, to ensure that you don't really evert the tissue too much or cause it to fold inwards. Amrita, any preference of clips? For Z poem, you have any specific clip and for the regular poem? So, um, I usually use the resolution for everything, but, you know, it's also my at home it would be a question of availability i guess here you have olympus um which has a smaller arm open open um but which the, the here advantage of olympus is you cannot close and open every time yeah and I, I really like that i also when i'm at home i don't have to do it here because we have such a stellar team but when i'm at home i also like to um rotate the clip on my own close here. Yes, nice. So what you saw he did really, really well there was to close slowly and not too quickly because if you close it too quickly, it actually can shift over. Deploy. And we'll do one more clip. Um, but that was very, very nice control. Again, we have the most expert team, expert room at AIG. Um, and so we'll just do one more clip and I think we'll be done. Any question from the audience? Whoever is doing the third space? Oh, we have one. Which of the procedures they are following? A septotomy or a poem? Open. Yeah. We're asking about the procedure. What's that? We're asking about which is uh, Did you ask about which is easier, the poem or the septotomy? Yeah, and now I, we ask the audience opinion what they are doing and which one would they prefer. Oh, uh, he's asking the audience. audience. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. You can ask the question. Amita, that was a fantastic <laughs> job. Would like Thank you very much. Fantastic job. So I think that yeah. is one question from uh, the audience. Yeah. Yeah. I just would like to know, since these clips are much higher, is there any risk of aspiration when they fall off? Yeah, the question is, uh, you got it? Yeah. I, does, I, the, yeah. does the patient That's, have any foreign body sensation after we place because much higher that's a great question i don't know that it's ever been described um but i i suppose theoretically it could be i mean sometimes when we were doing the sep the uh, mucosotomies um higher like two you know two centimeters higher they definitely came up into the oropharynx but i don't think it's been described for a patient to um to aspirate Thank you, Thank you Amrita. That. That's You're a welcome. pretty picture you have there, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. So Thank we you move on to the next case where I think uh, Nantali is Sorry, making Amrita, it. I don't know what the answer is. Okay. So we'll go to the next case. Yeah. The next case is a 46 year old woman who presented with acute pancreatitis eight months ago and now he came with recurrent pain in abdomen with weight loss for one month. His hemogram showed leukocytosis. This is the CT image on the left, which will be large one in the left of that. And on the right, we can see the same in the EUS. Uh, so the plan for this patient is an EUS guided cystogastrostomy using a lens. 
The learning objectives of this session is to understand the indication and techniques of land interruption, to know the timing, indication of necrosectomy and follow-up of such patients. Uh, so this is a large international uh, multi-center study of 189 patients which showed a technical success of 100% in the lambs arm as compared to 98.9% in the uh, plastic stent arm which is comparable. Uh, however, the uh, rate of worm recurrence following the initial success was uh, greater with the plastic stent group as compared to the lambs group. Over to Dr. Manthali for the demonstration. Yeah, uh, Nagi. Rakesh and Dr. Rasha from Oman are on the chair now. Nantari? Okay. Hi. You got. Am I on? Yeah, you are on, and two experts are moderating you. Okay. Well, um, so you've got heard the history. So for this case, what we would like to demonstrate is that number one, we want to show you how well the um, EUS can assess the uh, necrotic tissue within the the. Uh, collection number two we're gonna tell you where would be the best place to puncture and then number three initially i was going to show multi-step technique meaning using a needle wire exchange um cystotome dilation with the balloon and then um uh, uh Stand. But because, you know, um, this, this thing, this lesion here is, is quite big, so I think that we might just change our mind. We might just, what we do is to use a uh, hot spaxes. If you can just give me the, um, if you can just show them. Oh, you know what? I forgot to introduce my team here. Monica, Dr. Monica is here with me and the rest of the team, wonderful team. So Monica, so what you want to tell them about the scent a little bit? This is what we're using, the hot spaxes. If you can, if the camera can, can focus on the, the cover. So the, yeah, go ahead. This is a METS hot spaxes stand. The electrocautery delivery system is there. So this is one point uh, system in which we can directly place the stand inside the uh, one. Right, and the other plan for us today is that besides from using the stent, we're going to place a plastic stent in as well, just in case um, uh, the AIG team want to come back and do necrosectomy so they can just do it. And then, um, so, without so further ado. Nontali, Spaxis, hot Spaxis is not very familiar in for many of the audience here. So, what's your preference and what's the advantage or the difference between hot axios and hot Spaxis? I'm so I'm sorry. I can't I can't hear you very well. Yeah, Can any, you ask? any difference between the hot spaxes and hot axios? Well, I think that um uh, from my standpoint, the in terms of the um the efficacy of the stand, I don't I, I don't think they I, I think they both work well. But in terms of deployment, um the uh, the hot the hot axis I always do intra-channel deployment, but for the hot spaxes I don't always do that. Um, and um, they, they come in different sizes, so, so in general, it's just a matter of the way we deploy it. Yeah. Rantali, how do you decide about the site of insertion of this stent? The site of puncture, right? Okay. So, um, what, what I like to do normally is that I like to be pr as perpendicular to the lesion as much as possible. Um, so, that you can, you can see that the needle is going to come at this blue dot right here, if you can see the... Um, EUS view. So I know that if I, I stay perpendicular, then you know that the stent would come directly and uh, it won't bounce off the lesion. Also, I use double flow to make sure that there's no intervening vessels. Um, I think those are the key things. Oh, and the thickness, the distance between the um, the distance between the distance between the um, the gastric wall and the cyst. Um, if it's too far, like more than one centimeter, that 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 can be um, that can be an issue too. So do you uh, do you confirm an endoscopic view before you get in, um, so that you avoid the GE junction? Suppose if you are above the GE junction. I um, uh, you know, I ha I have looked at the endoscopic view already. I can just show you right here, just a little bit. There. I think for the beginners, a PIP is a better option, isn't it? You are a master, but for the beginners. Well, you know, um, um, yeah. Okay, so so you can see that it's not at the uh, at the G junction or in the esophagus. Why do you avoid G junction? 
I think it's harder to de um uh, to deploy the stand because sometimes the scope has to come up all the way to the um um to this to the esophagus. All right, and um, and my my assistant here is so good that as I was doing my talking, um, the hot spectrum is already inside the scope. Sometimes when the scope is unstable, you can. Um, can you turn the light off just like this a little bit? Can you monitor uh, for the gastric wall so the audience can see it? Just show the gastric wall on the EOS image. Can you, can you turn the light off just a little bit? One with the hole, that's cool. No, oh, I know. Hmm. This is it. So as you can see, what happened just now was that I advanced the, um, actually, can I use the light off just a little bit? What about the wall thickness? Do you have any specific measurement, like if it's more than so much? Yeah, the, the, the classic teaching is that more than, um, oh yeah, I look dark in there, but that's good. Oh, that's perfect. No, Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, I tried to ask them to turn the light off, but they said, you guys won't see me if, I turn, if they turn the light off, but now you see. Okay, so here you guys can see, um, uh, my, here, let, let me just show you real quick where the needle comes. Here, you guys see the needle right here? Yes. Okay, so now, um, without uh, intervening vessel, and the uh, assistant is ready to go. So I'm going to... You don't want the Doppler to be on? Oh, can you hold me? It slipped off, but that's okay. So sometimes the wall gets pushed away when you are pushing the needle. Right. So right. any any tip you give, do like holding the scope. Right. I try to hold the scope. Make sure the scope is as perpendicular as possible, and uh, Monica can help me holding the scope holding as well. Scope. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna try one more time here. No, this is not the, no. the wall is thick, probably. Yeah. yeah, the wall is very thick. It won't go in. So I'm actually going to change my plan. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the multi-step technique. So what I would do is that I would puncture the lesion with a 19-gauge um, uh, needle. Um, uh, Nancy, as you're doing that, we'll go to another room. Mariana is ready with the case. So we'll go to Mariana and we'll come back to you. Okay. 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 I'm gonna keep doing. Yeah. Okay. Next case is a 61 year old female who was colostectomy 20 years back. And now she presented with obstructive jaundice and fever for two weeks. Uh, her hemogram showed leukocytosis, and the LFT showed a bilirubin of 6.7 with raised alkaline phosphatase. So we can see the MRCP with dilated uh, CBD and multiple large calculi with cholangiotic abscesses. The ERCP was done in view of cholangitis, which showed the similar finding. Uh, Bilirubin balloon sphincroplasty was done, partial clearance was achieved, and an MVT was placed. So now the plan is for an MRCP with cholangoscopy and laser lithotripsy. The learning objective of this session is to uh, Understand how to use laser lithotripsy for the management of difficult CBD stones and the indications and contraindications of the same. So here is a randomized trial of 66 patients, um, randomized to laser lithotripsy and large balloon sphincteroplasty, where they found that there is no significant difference in adverse events and costs. However, there was a higher treatment success of 94% versus 73% in the two groups. Uh, over to Dr. Mariana for the presentation. Hello, everybody. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're, you're on. You're on, okay. I am Lakshmi here, and we have, uh, because of our master technician, as well as Rubina from the anesthesia side. So, um, we already uh, did the cholangiogram, as you can see. Uh, on the image, uh, we uh, we took out the the, J, the nasal J, nasal biliary tube. You still see that there's a big stone. We decided it was not important to dilate because it was a pretty good opening, and so we 
pre-handedly introduced the spy with already the laser uh, uh, probe inside it. This is because if you do it, it's easier to insert the, the, the spy on a guide wire, but if you have to do the exchange afterwards to put the laser uh, probe inside, you might have some resistances, so you might uh, damage the, the, the probe. That's why we decided to put free hands with the probe already inside. So this is a single operator technique, but we have teamwork here with three, and we <laughs> are <laughs> doing this in a double operator technique, which also can work very well. So it's already positioned the, the, the probe on the stone, and we already have our uh, yes. laser system but here. If you could uh, show them briefly how the... Ah, it's ready. Yeah. Okay, it's ready. Let me ask. Yeah, could you, sh could you please show the audience how the scope looks like and what yes. are we doing? So, yeah, so here we have the, 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 the Colangio scope is in the operative uh, system. Here you can see the... Um, the, re the, the, the handle with the wheels. There is a, a four wheel deflection with a big wheel and a small wheel and also brakes. So uh, we can use this to uh, really orientate inside the, um, the bile duct and you have the flushing system and you also have the aspiration system. So here it's very important that we use flushing all the time. You see it here and the aspiration uh, and also patient has antibiotics because you uh, might uh, uh, you increase the, 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 the intraberry pressure, so you need to uh, protect for cholangitis. So do you prefer the spy to be attached to the scope or you want the... I go with the flow. <laughs> <laughs> so I know I have a good, great trust here uh, with Sri, so I know he's going to do a great job. Usually it's, it's designed to be put on the scope and to be used on a scope. But of course, uh, uh, experience uh, where you work is very important. So we'll do this like this. Okay. So maybe you can adjust the the image, and we have we can see the laser. Can bring it a bit back. So it's what's a, what's the distance between your laser light and the stone? You start you 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 push it you're on the stone. You have contact on the stone, like we're doing here. So she will push a bit the laser has contact on the stone. You have contact, okay? Should you so, touch the stone or? Yes, it? you can touch the stone. Yes. So I go, you try to avoid uh, the, uh, the bile duct wall, and see now we're doing the hole here. We're perfusing all the time, and we're using uh, 8 hertz and uh, uh, 1200 millijoules. So we are readjust. When you're ready, Sri, you tell me. You put, the, yeah, we see another area of the stone, we see the laser. He's using his... Uh, uh, we can see the laser here. Yeah, I think probably it's hitting the wall. I'm not hitting anything now. Okay. Okay, yeah. it's just a laser probe. You're focusing. Yeah. Actually, I'm the difference with EHL is that in EHL, we are a couple of millimeters away. Yes, yes. On. Yeah. On. So here... Uh, Ma'am, if we have difficulty in visualizing the stone with this uh, cholangioscope, would adjusting the position of the scope help? Uh, we try to keep a stable position of the scope, so not to lose it. But it's mostly the cholangioscope that does the work. So that's why you always keep the little image underneath. To uh, I will go a bit further up. Yes. Uh, okay. So we keep yeah. the image of the scope underneath just to be to, to be sure that we haven't lost it, but you cannot really adjust the image. It's you, mostly the cholangioscope that does it. So if you push the probe a bit... I think this is a better position, Mariana. Yes. We advanced a bit the cholangioscope. So now and then you have to check your, yeah. your scope position, because sometimes you tend to... Yes, play. yes. You'll be focusing on this and then you lose the... Ready go? Okay, ready. We go? Yeah. Yeah, this looks good. Yeah, so we break by sitting. Yeah, we, we could see it beautiful. Yeah, on I the stone, avoiding the wall. Looks That's a little trick. high. All of you should know that a laser wow. buries a burrows a hole, yeah. whereas the EHL disintegrates the calcium. Yeah. Yes. So now we're. Yeah, very nice. Making holes in the stone. Okay. Oh, made a hole. Wow, there. yeah. <laughs> okay. It's like a Star okay, Wars. Okay, I advance a bit. Yeah. It's, uh, you're inside, huh? Okay, I go. Yes. 
Do you need sometimes to increase your? Uh, By here, it's uh, it's it works very well. The setting, so um, I think we don't need to increase. Okay. So flashing is very important. Yes, flashing and aspirating afterwards, and antibiotics. So here. Yeah. Ma'am, no, yeah. what are these soil slightly low? Two pieces now. You want hmm. to come back and do a little bit to the to the one of the piece to. I think you should quarter them. You have half them. You should quarter them. Yeah. So this particular case has got a distal CBD narrow. Ah, three pieces. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Now, what about clicks uh, if you have the stones and relatively in the lower end of the CBD? Yes, that's a good one because you don't you don't have a stable position. Yeah. So you push the bit up. So uh, the spike. Yes, yes, I could work it now. Look, oh, this is not going to be very long, huh? With you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so this is inside the stone, right? Yeah. You want to do a bit more? Yeah. Okay. You can push out the so, pro. So what's the extent of this pi you could go in if it is in the deep left hepatic duct or in the right anterior or posterior? Ah, uh, you can do an intrahepatic as well. Yeah, do you do regularly if it is in the intrahepatic areas? Ah, uh, it's uh, you have to be more careful, huh, because of the perfusion. Actually, the mm. toughest is if it is in the lower one centimeter. That's yes. where your yes. is not stable. Yeah, but here we are. We're in a good in a good stable position in the mid CBD, so it's a perfect uh, indication for for this technique. And as we said earlier, over 10 to 20 millimeters, it will not it will not break. It will not come out with, uh, of course, even with large balloon dilation, and uh, and mechanical lithotripsy can be tricky as well. This is very uh, very efficient. And then what are the risks of infection in the cholangitis? Uh, it's, it's quite high because of the perfusion, uh, and that's why we uh, we put antibiotics, and we try to aspirate as well. But you can have, have an abscess, liver abscess, uh, other other complications as well. So it's very important to take care of that. Uh, Mariana, that was fantastic stone carving that you're doing. And once you finish that, we uh, I think as we're doing that, we'll go to another room where. Uh, yeah, we will work a bit more here, yeah. and then yeah. we'll try to extract everything. Yeah, we'll come back for the final. Okay. Result. Okay. Thank you. Fire the whole time, mm -hmm. right? Nantali, we're with you. Nantali. Hello, we're back. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me here? Yes. Okay, so yes. what we what we did off air was that we um, decided to go back to. Um, uh, using a 19 gauge needle, Olympus needle, we puncture the the collection, and then we advance a, a 0.035 jack wire inside the collection. If you guys notice, you will see that on the left side of the lesion, I'm just gonna use the cursor here on the left side of the lesion, right here. You see that it's becoming more cloudy. Uh, when that happens, you can think of two things. Number one, whether or not there's intra-collection bleeding, or number two, maybe the wire or whatever we were doing just kind of pushed the debris away, and it kind of uh, there's something floating inside the collection as well. But uh, we checked the uh, the Doppler uh, before we um, puncture, and there was no intervening vessel, so I don't think this is bleeding. But if this if this was bleeding, then the metallic stand will have it anyway. So the next step that I'm going to do is to um, uh, puncture this with hot spaxes. And um, so, Nanthi, it's more of a semi-hot now. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry. What were you asking? This is. He said it is already semi. -hot. Yeah. So you guys can see that the stand is already inside. I'm gonna push it inside. Yeah, you can see that. I'm gonna show you be before you deploy. I'm gonna show you real quick. Here, this is where the stand is. Okay, now are you ready to deploy? Okay. Can you show the hand so the tech how he's doing? The hand of the tech, yeah. And I have really good tech with me here today. So if you look at the floral, I think the floral is um. Yeah, floral, please. Yes. Okay. So what are the precautions you take when you are deploying the? 
proximal end strength. You see, you see on the EUS, you see the thing, the stand is deployed, yeah. and you can look at the floral as well. So once the stand is deployed, I'm going to pull back the stand a little bit. The radio pick markers, do you have any? Huh? The radio pick markers, do you follow them? All stand open? Yeah. So here I'm going to pull back the stand a little bit. Monthly, how much to pull back? I, I push back, I pull back until until it hits the wall. Yeah, and then I switch. I switch the um, the uh, uh, the endoscopic view. Any marker on the endoscopic view side on the yeah, it's um side. I'm supposed to see a um yeah or you can deploy inside the uh, the channel but I was gonna show you here real quick probably well, we need to pull the scope a little bit out right I'm pulling back the scope slowly a little bit so that I can see. It's a gush of fluid, I think it's obscuring your vision. Push the stand back. Okay, I'm withdrawing the scope. So what I'm doing here is that I'm withdrawing the scope. You can see that I can't see much of anything. So I'm withdrawing the scope. And if I can't see much of anything, I might just um. Take it down and here we go. Here we go. Down and anticlockwise. And uh, the other thing you can do if you if you uh, if you don't see anything, you can deploy inside the channel, and then you can pull everything back if you deploy inside the channel. Did you deploy? We're gonna pull back the scope. Yeah, I think you can pull back it a little more. Yeah, now we could see something. Now, yeah. okay. Yeah, we yeah. Now, now, it's, now yeah. we can see the pull back strength. Okay, here um, I need to pull a little bit more. Yeah. Is it, is it fluid or is it something uh, which is obscuring? The rent is a little. Okay. I need to pull back the scope a little bit more. Yeah. Is it um Is it inside the um deploy? Deploy? No? Is it going yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we can see it now, but this the stent is deployed, I believe. Is it inside? It? Yeah. So as you can see that the um, the stent might have been inside the the, the cyst. Oops. Let me see here. One second. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna play the view, and then I'm gonna see where the stent is located. I might have um, the stent might have um. <laughs> So, Nantli, uh, uh, can you hear me? So, yeah. as we're doing that, we'll go to another room because yeah. we have uh, room number one. I think uh, Mariana has almost finished her job, so we'll go to her and then. Okay. Okay, Mariana, you're on. Yeah, so we were very efficient here. <laughs> uh, we managed to. Uh, the, the stone was well fragmented uh, with what uh, Shri did here. So, we uh, cleaned already the distal part of the bile duct. So uh, now you see that things are a bit clearer. You That's did, the balloon. You didn't have to use a mechanical, no? Ah, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. You see, this is the, the shell. <laughs> it's like me saying the shell is coming out. Yeah. And so you, uh, can, you can trial the balloon very easily. Yeah, yeah. And the, we have a bit of debris in front of us. Okay. But we're pretty, so it pretty, pretty happy with the job that we're doing here. It looks like a nice occlusion yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Marianne. I think that's a fantastic, very nice job. Thank you.
So we'll then switch. I think this is over now. You can see a very nice. Yeah, yeah. you can see a very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, clean a bit more and then you okay. Okay. put a stent or no? No. You want? <laughs> what does you want? You want a stent? Mm. Yes. <laughs> well, we'll try to clean it maximum, but it's, it's quite nice. I'm not yeah. even sure. We, it's a bit little bit at the end there, a bit distally. We'll still work on it. Okay, thank you, Brian. So, yes, yes. Most of water yeah. perfusion is, is important. Thank you. So, okay. we go to room number three. Okay. Where, uh, we'll work the water the, um, underneath there. Oh, yeah. And then we do perfusion. I'll pass another time here. Okay, Marina, thank you very much. We'll go to room number three. We have a water waiting with the case there. Yeah, thank you. So the next case is a particular area here with multiple comorbidities who had functional dyspepsia and an incidentally standing on the endoscopy was a subepithelial lesion in the antrum. The CT abdomen showed a small isobene solid mass in the pylorus of the stomach with increased vascularity. On the right, we can see the US image uh, which showed a subepithelial hypervascular tumor in the antrum from the muscularis propria. So the plan in this patient is to do a submucosal tunneling endoscopic resection. The so learning objectives are to know the approach and management of subepithelial tumors and to understand the indications, contraindications, and complications. So here is a systematic review and meta-analysis which showed 97% uh, complete resection and 94% on block resection rates of stir. Thank you, Dr. Roberta, for our demonstration. Hello, again, good morning. We have all the friends here and we were discussing you know, how to approach this subepithelial lesion. You'll see we are in the great curvature and the lesion is here and if I try to... Very powerful team you have. Rapata. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because you know that you, we are supposed to demonstrate a stir, but at the same time, because of this... Uh, sub -serosa. we were thinking to just make an incision to go there and to see what's there. And in case we can use the traction to attach that flap on the opposite wall and then see if we can say the adventitia, the serosa. Let me see, let me see, let me say. One basic question, esophageal stir is easier or a gastric stir is easier? Esophageal. Uh, the esophageal cell for sure it's much easier than the gastric one for the vascularity and also for the shape of the organ. You know, in the esophageal everything is straight, it's very easy to go. Needle out. I'm using an hybrid knife T-type. I won't inject with the needle just with this one. I won't make any mark huh, because there's no need. It's a subepithelial lesion. And then we'll see. We will see. Good point, it's already bleeding. <laughs> but it's okay. It's not working. But it's okay, but it's not working. At all. The, the endocard is not working. This is, oh yeah, this is nice. No, it's n nothing is working. Even the blue pedal, it's off. Then I think see the power connection. Yep. Oh. But the part is, is green. Check it. Yeah. <laughs> well. We feel between the four of you, you can get it out without it working on. <laughs> oh, we'll make it cold, um, but no, no oh, current. Yeah, absolutely. We can also make it out. Yeah. Try to go on tunneling, let's see. Go on tunneling. I think get Srinu, who's there assisting you. Rakesh, I think. Okay, I will try. Santosh is there. No. I think the machine, Santosh. machine got scared seeing all the four big. So if you want to go in another room, we'll try to fix it and you come back once we're ready because. 
Yeah, yeah. That sounds good. Okay. Oh, I can tell you a joke. I don't know. Nagi will go to Mariana and see her wind it up. No, actually, then... Mariana has yeah. already winded it up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mariana. Yeah, she is uh, cleared the whole thing. Yeah, I think she's <laughs> getting it now. Just one second. Yeah, I think. It's come. Yeah. It's important to know, I mean, it's important to know the trouble Yeah. Go when is there and then we'll come back again. We'll go okay. to Nantali, just see where the stent is there. Okay, Nantali on. Hi, yeah, I'm back. So the sepsis is there, but it's actually, I misdeployed it, I, I deployed inside the cyst, and I think the problem is that when, when I pull back the scope, and I saw a lot of blood, and I couldn't get a good visualization, and I um I I, I asked the uh, the stent to be deployed, and it's actually migrated inside the, the the collection, which happens, and this is like real life situation here. So what we did off air is that we we discussed about two options. Number one is to put another um uh, spectrum stent because we still have the wire access, and that's very important that you keep the wire there. We could have put uh, another spexus and then try to d uh, dilate it and try to, uh, you know, um, drain and come back later to get the, um, um, the, 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 uh, the, the misdeploy sent out. Or we could, uh, we could put a um, nasal uh, blurry tube or nasal cystic tube and to make sure that the cyst is drained and then bring the patient back later to clear this. And because we have so many cases lined up here in this room, so we decided to put a, um, a nasal cystic tube. If you can just um, the camera, if you can zoom on on the um, on the tube here. Yeah. yeah. So here, this is what we this is what we did. Yeah. Okay. So to drain the fifth, and um, and then we'll come back later, and then we will take care of the uh, retain uh, spexes yeah. other days. Okay, we okay. can. Well, you know, it wasn't it wasn't what I wanted to demonstrate, but at least you see what happens in real situation. No, actually, it's good for the in the real life yeah. scenario. As you said, it's a real so life. I think probably it's good what you are going to do next. Yeah. To dilate if you can just drill briefly in a minute. Right, right, and and and, and I think you can say that when there are lots of blood and you can't you can't get your visualization, and um, th this can happen even even you know in. Uh, so-called enhanced of people who've done this um, uh, a lot already, but we will we'll, we'll fix it, and this is the way one of the ways that we can do. All right, and uh, I think that's um, you, Monica. You want to add anything? I think this is the best way which we can tackle at this moment. We can put a mesocystic uh, mesocystic drain to drain the cyst, and later on we can dilate the tract, and again. Uh, uh, Remove the previous stent and we can replace the next uh, right. stent. Yeah. The one thing that I still puzzle is that why was there so much blood in the lumen? Because we didn't see any intervening vessel at all. The, um, the, the, the puncture was done beautifully. But, you know, it's possible. Maybe it's fibrotic. It's something inflammatory process. That's why we got a lot of blood. Mm. What's the law? Okay. All right. Okay. 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 So, any questions from the audience in, at this juncture? So it's a tricky it's a kind of a complication what you can call so you need to know how to tackle it also right and um i didn't plan to demonstrate this but well uh -huh. it, 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 no, yeah. no, no. it really happened so yeah so when you will bring the patient back yeah so when, so when will you do the next intervention that's a question well you know um it, it you can do it at any time really you can even do it today if you um if you have an opening slot or you can just bring the patient back tomorrow you know you can uh, to me to me i think that if we do it when the cyst is not completely collapsed i feel that it's easier because you have to work in because this had happened to me in the past and i waited until the cyst collapsed and what happened is that it's so hard to try to uh, retrieve the retained stent when the cyst has already collapsed. Yeah. Um, also, so the earlier the best drain would be a okay. better option also to monitor for bleed, and if there is bleeding, this no, patient would be requiring a CT angio. 
Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, say that again. That we can also monitor with the help of a nasocystic okay. drain if there is an ongoing bleed because then the patient will be requiring an yes, urgent no. CT angio. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. That, yeah. that has to be taken care of. If the right. bleed is continuing, then uh, right. I have people has to take care. Right. But uh, it seems like when we were putting in the uh, nasocystic scan, the bleeding has stopped already. It became clot. It was the, the visual was much better than when we were doing the procedure. So, in fact, yeah. if there is a lot of debris inside, then that will be a challenge for you to, you know. Thank you, I and mean, thank you very much for your. Yeah. Well, I think uh, this is very important to show what happens in real life, and I think this is the best solution for those who have displaced the metal stand in the cyst or in the wand. A very good solution is to put a nasocystic tube inside, control the whole situation, come back when you want to, and then do the conical almost always. The two distance, very easy, you just dilate the cavity, it comes out. So thank you very much. Right. Uh, well, as much as I wanted yeah. to show a successful yeah. scan, but this is a different way of showing. Yeah, I think it's also, also important to show this case. Yeah. Thank you very much. So we go back to room number three, where Roboto and the big team of uh, women endoscopists are now take, tackling this case. Thank you. Roboto, yeah. Hello. Roboto. So we fixed the problem. Okay. And now the knife is working. And I'm just make the mucosal incision to check the situation in so, the submucosa. It's very so vascular. What, what was the problem? The audience want to know what happened. Uh, what I tell you, we don't know. <laughs> no, I think what happens sometimes, like I say, is knives. Yeah. When you're putting these knives onto the thing, they some knives work, some don't. And this happens right. uh, often. You just have to change the knife, and then you'll find that suddenly it starts. Yeah. Working. The contact, yeah. Right. Or when the computer is not working, sometimes you have to shut it off and start again. No? So t tell us what you're doing, Roberta. So, so, sorry, say it again? Yeah. Okay, I'm doing yeah, a mucosal yeah. incision to expose the submucosa and to check the situation of this subepithelial lesion. And then from that point, we'll decide how to proceed. Uh, so I changed the strategy, and I think I won't do the stir because the lesion is really completely, from the US point of view, attached to the muscle. And there's a high chance that I can, if I cut, cut full thickness, uh, I can lose the lesion in the peritoneum. I try to have a nice access in the submucosa yeah. to check that. You don't have to. And a lot of vessels, so I have to take care of this small bleeding. So, Roberto, you don't have to worry. Even if you lose it in the peritoneum, GB Rao is there. He'll get it out for you. Yeah. Well, up to now, it's not just as a standard DSD, just exposing the plane and to create. Uh, the space to let enter with my cup. So just proceed step by step because we are in the gastric side and there's a lot of vessels. So nothing special than a simple ESD. I use the water to help me in creating the space. So Robert, how often do you use the coir grass for when you have a thick vessel? Like uh, usually a few times when I really have very big vessels. So, so the rule is the that... Like this? Uh, but you know that if the vessel is bigger than your knife, then you should go for something different. But because I'm using a very big knife, most of the time, well, let me say always, oh, that's a good you point. can be able to make the hemostasis just with the knife. Okay. Sometimes, not always. Uh, what is that? Well, what I'm using? The setting. Is it precise set? Yeah. No, I would like to have swift quag because precise set is not working at its best. Okay. So, Roberta, as you're doing this, we we'll go. Yeah, I think as you're doing this, we'll go. To Jenny okay. for a moment and come back again. Okay. Yeah. The okay, next case history. This will be the last case before lunch. The next case is a 31 year old female who had a history of open cholecystectomy four months back. Now she presented with obstructive rhombus for one month. Her total deliverable is 4.6. This is the MRCP image showing a post 
collapses the uh, building structure. There is a proximal CHB structure with bilateral IHBRD. So the plan for this case is to do multiple plastic building stenting. This is a meta-analysis published in endoscopy of 1200 plus patients which showed comparable success between metal and multiple plastic stents of around 80%. Adverse effects were comparable in both the groups. However, number of ERCP procedures were lesser in the metal stent group. This is Dr. Jamin for demonstration. Again, it's uh, it's good to be back, and so uh, once again, I have really a marvelous team. I have a perfect co-pilot, yeah, and then I have a technician who I just offered to go to Amsterdam, which is really a lovely city. <laughs> Might be a bit cold though, and we don't have lovely spicy cookies, but otherwise it's quite fine. Um, we just, as we were, of course, pushed pushed to be on time already. Did the cannulation? Uh, can you have the floral picture? I can tell you what we did. We used the uh, Omni. We used the tome and we used the soft wire. And I checked if I could, you know, pass with the catheter, and that worked quite okay. Though we see that there's a blitz, bit of blood coming off. So we're going to push in the wire further. So which guide wire are you using, Jenny? We are using a thermal wire, which is really a very flexible wire. And I think here the important is that we had to navigate the structure. So yes, so you have to give a bit of contrast to see where we are. You see the contrast is really coming back. Yeah. Uh, I go in a bit deeper because I would like also to see higher up in the in the liver. So is it an angle tip or a straight thermo? An angle tip. Here they more or less always take an angled uh, tip. Yes, you see yes. now we're nicely going yeah. in deeper. So I yes. think this is important. We're going to give a bit more of contrast to, to show where we are. And but also to see how long the stricture is. So, so um, did you do any special maneuver to get into that left hepatic duct? We have to ask the technician. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a system I do not control. Uh, I have to say also in my own unit we work with long wires. That means that you really have to communicate yeah. very well with your, uh, your, your staff, with your assistants. And I'm wondering here a bit where the stricture is. I mean, it can be completely okay. distal. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, I think the next step should be, as you always should be prepared, we're going to exchange, we're going to take uh, a biliary balloon to really dilate the stricture and then try to uh, get in a second wire and then start to do the stenting. And what I s personally always do, I always prepare all cases, write down what I want, so then we can go quick. So now we're going to exchange. So, so what is your choice of dilatation? Uh, a balloon or a... Yeah. So okay. then one question is, what if the guide wire doesn't go? Do you have any special maneuvers to the if, guide wire? If I have a, a tight structure. Yeah, if I have a problem with my uh, wire, I change for another wire. Um, some are softer than, uh, than others. And I think you also need a bit of patience to try to maneuver your way through. How about the balloon technique? Do you use a tightened balloon to go near and then dilate the track? Uh, negotiate the guide wire. Yes, what I would uh, do now is to use a biliary balloon to uh, to dilate the track. And I think if you look at the image, it's really a very tight structure. Yeah. It's quite long. So that's yeah. one yeah. important point. The balloon you can use sometimes, it's a very tight structure. Yeah, and I think what's also important, I mean, this patient is on a general anesthesia, but we normally have it on the propofol. So I communicate with my anesthesiologist and say, okay, I'm going to... Uh, yes, we can also immediately try another wire, um, that I'm going to hurt the patient. And if they do not know, they might be behind their screens and the patient might really have suffer from pain. Uh, as you might have realized, I really closely listened to the technician who just suggested me to already now put in a second wire. So I'm going to do that. You see here my uh, catheter. We know we have to be really up and... Um, Luckily, this time I could do something myself of at least putting in the catheter. Now we have to see if the wire is going to uh, to follow. Yeah, there's a kind of side there, right? Eh? That's also yeah. where we were before. It's I an come eccentric structure. Yeah. Hi. Okay. Uh, would you like to confirm, is it a benign biliary structure? Because we are presuming yeah, it but could be a malignant, number one, and could be a sometime impacted stone. You can see a crescent sign. Yeah, not the stone, but... Uh, 
if you look at the wire has gone from the left side of that crescent sign and now the wire is going towards the right side yes now, i wonder whether if, if the wire now is just at the side of where the structure is we're going to give a bit of contrast um, or could be a malignancy yeah it can I, I, change our plan from plastic to the metal so would you like to do a cholangioscopy at this moment or not no i mean if i have looked at the mrcp which we had before so i think really we have to take the other one can we enlarge it a slight bit and then see if we can take the other uh, branch i mean if i listen to the story it's the most reasonable that's a benign stricture and you see you're stuck there yeah maybe now i can push you up i try to see if i can you know get here and now we will be going up yeah i come back a bit you see the tip of the candlotome is exactly yeah. like the strip. so i just yeah. so there we are yeah oh. so it does look yeah. like there is a stone impacted there yeah i i think it's really a, a huge structure so now I, I just follow, yes. He wants to go to the other side, you know, it, it's it's really good that you communicate here together. I think I should go a bit more here. So also with pushing, okay, I push in more. Yeah, I, but should I bend a bit or you did in the meantime? So you're trying to go into the right anterior? Yeah, that's also, I mean, we thought if we can have a wire so in the... on again into the left. I push, but I want also to see where my R on the screen. If I'm not going to take, you see, I take too much distance from the papilla. So while talking, I also have to concentrate that I stay close to the papilla, which might yes. help. So now I'm in a bit deeper, but he, as we wanted to go to the right, I come back yes. to see yes. where we can probably go to the right. I slowly come back because somewhere here, I think... We have to make the torque. At the other hand, maybe we are now losing a bit too much time for placing the wire. We could also just dilate over the first wire and then see where we are going. But now, I, I, this is just a debate. I ask my co-pilots, what would, would you do? Uh, I think I would just go dilate the, over the first wire and then try to put a second Okay. Wire. I push so more. So here I feel it slight bit, and now I'm immediately deep. So what would the audience do? Would they now go for uh, dilation, or would they rather try first to go to the right side? Try again for the right side. Okay. Probably you can just pull back your sphincter tone. I just go back slowly. Even a little lower. Yeah, I come back. I come back. So you hear also that I'm saying that I'm yeah. coming back because I think it's important for your team that they know what you're doing. But I think now probably I'm a bit too much back. I wonder if there is a stricture yeah, as well, I just going right. to the right side. So do you, we probably want to have another wire or do we bend the catheter? It's, it's, it's all fine with me, yeah? Jen, you're using the again the term, all right? Yeah. Angle to. So uh, here somewhere I think we should go to the right. But the wire is not really following my thoughts, which is quite annoying <laughs> as they normally do. So um, should we probably uh, enlarge it even a bit more in the high limb? I'm also a bit puzzled that if we really have this structure so high up in the, in the high limb, but that gives another reason to place plastic and not to go for any metal. So I also wonder what the branches over there are. This is really lovely with the iron draw. And you see that we're puzzling with, uh, with the wire to get there. And I go now. More, I go in more. To the same dot. But I also feel resistance here. As you can see on the endoscopic image, I am... Uh, getting away from the papilla yeah so i really have to also concentrate on that one i hang a bit on my scope. position so probably you need to suck in between and then try to lessen the air i can i can do so luckily you have more channels and 
But also there I'm wondering where we are going and what we have on the fluoro, is that only completely the left or is that also the right? I'm not completely convinced that we really filled the right already. Uh, how about you? No, I think it's all the dilated branches yeah. from the left. So yeah. one thought here is uh, if you could change the wire, new wire. I presume it's a new wire, but again, probably it's, an, it's a new wire, and yeah. uh, that in combination with uh, the most experienced technician. <laughs> but okay, if you want to say have another, what do you think you? Okay, so he's going to use another uh, wire. The straight wire. So he's going to take an 025 yeah, uh, angled to see if he can uh, can get in by that. But if you look now at the fluoro, you, what's your impression? Do you think it's it's all left or it's no, right? No, I think generally people who are right are communicating, right anterior and the left are communicating, and that's why you have this. You want me the right anterior and the left are communicating. Okay. And that's why you have this picture. The right is uh, separated out. So I think we should dilate here. And you can put in stents because yeah, I, I think this really remember me of the lecture yesterday, where it was so nicely yeah, explained yeah, yeah. that you have all these kind of different anatomies. Yes. yes. So I would I would suggest that we should dilate this area and put in stents, and then we can get an MR MR CP to see what's happened right posterior. I would believe that right okay. posterior is cut off. So. Uh, there is a very tight but, but you will see now we have a new wire and, yeah, we'll press and we just put it into the other side but then we just follow your plan oh, it's one. yes yes yes, yes. You see? yes. it's always eh? okay yeah. you see we're in the left and in the right, right. So yeah, can, you, can, you, can you inject contrast there and then see where it is actually yes, we yeah. Can. yeah we come contrast so it's the same thing see yeah so what is happening is the right anterior is communicating with Left, and that's a like a problem shot yesterday. This is a little abnormal. So I think if you dilate put in stents here, yeah, and then we can get an MRCP to assess the right. But I'm really here. impressed how tight the structure is and how much yeah. dilated. We're going to exchange. I mean, we should not only uh, talk but also work. So you see, I'm coming back. Eh? You leave the wire in. Let me see. Yeah, we change it a long wire. Let's see if I can have a good view on the papilla. Oh, is a wire still in? Yes, a wire is very far. Okay. So You're not going to tell me that so I'm not allowed to be too fast, eh? Okay. So, so why is it important to have both the wires in place when it is so difficult? Why not dilate first and then try to put the second one? Yeah, that's also an option that you first uh, dilate. Oh, this is really a tiny wire. Yeah, um, at the other hand, I'm a bit afraid if, if you have dilated, that then the contrast is running off so quickly that okay. it's more difficult to see where you have right. to go to the right. right. Okay. And I, I really wonder, is this 025 or it's really feeling very uh, tiny? Yes. Yeah. So we're going to dilate uh, the track and the up front we had to plan to at least place a 10... Uh, centimeter, a uh, 10 French uh, to either the right or the left. I think we sh would be the most easy to use the, the thicker wire to place the 10 French uh, after we have done the dilation. Okay, I do get the dilation balloon over my. So, which balloon are you using? Size and. Uh, yeah, we use an, a four, a four millimeter, six millimeter? Six millimeter, I get That's also uh, fine. I think it's a tight on the balloon. Eh? It's yeah. a it's six millimeters here for dilation. So how do you decide whether to use a balloon catheter, dilator catheter versus a balloon? Yeah, I normally tend to use a balloon for this kind of uh, dilation, at least as my first step. Okay. Is my other wire deep enough? Still, yes, it is. Um, and I tend to use normally an eight millimeters for the CBD, uh, a six millimeters for the hilum, and a four intrahepatic. But this is really a tight stricture. Mm -hmm. So if you would go here for an eight, uh, the patient might jump from the table. And that's not what I appreciate. Though we can navigate quite easily. And I think we can inflate over here. You can nicely appreciate the markers. And I always check them beforehand. I mean, the folks here all know by heart how far we can go. We can go to 11 atmosphere. What I normally do, I would just say, okay, go to 5. Maybe you need to go a little higher up. Your marker is not yet at the I thought my marker is above the stricture. Yeah. And um, 
let's see. And now we are using fluor the whole time, but normally I would only do the fluor if I'm at five. Yeah. So they're going to connect it. Okay. So do you put contrast into the That's balloon? Ah. Oh. So I think it's also important with this kind of materials that you make uh, yourself familiar with it, where the markers are. Be important to yes. make the markers How do you want and to uh, the question you of want to whether will, the balloon down? will you prefer to put contrast? I pull. The marker is the two markers are below. So I think the marker is below. Yeah, below. you you see here how the balloon is uh, it's coming. Yeah. And in the meantime, I also have to take care of the other very floppy wire. It's it's quite deep in. Yeah, it's deep in. You see the balloon? It's uh, but I think this is this kind of structure that might. I mean, if you deflate more or less, immediately jump back. But um, you don't really have to work. This system makes that it's just getting on pressure. You're on eleven by now. Yeah, yeah. So Perfect. How long are you going to keep the balloon inflated? Yeah. So. Uh, I, according to the literature, I have to do that for one minute, which, yeah. in my opinion, is incredibly long. Okay. Um, so but you I have thirty seconds. Uh, so I try to train myself to do it for one minute, and also my nurses by now they start to chat about all kind of things they did in the weekends to keep me at ease. So I will make the one minute. Do you think we are to one minute? Yeah. We are to one minute. Okay. okay. So we're going to deflate. Should we also dilate the lower tract? So I go I down with yes. my balloon, and I'm to be sure that I'm not going to, you know, struggle lower. I'm also going to dilate here. I think you can straight away go to eleven. Yeah, that's. I think that's a very important point. Yeah, sometimes you want to be too quick, and you think, okay, rush, rush, and take it out. But then, if you have resistance to getting your stent, yeah. uh, it's really painful, and you might, for example, lose your position. But this looks really fine. Then the question comes: Do we have to do a string trotomy? What I will do, um, I will see if I can take this balloon through the papilla while it's still inflated. I mean, if I can take this balloon through the papilla, it's four millimeters. I do not need to do a string trotomy. But so what, what if you want to put multiple stents? Yeah, but I think also for two stents, uh, if I have a balloon of four millimeters that can pass through, then but it's fine. I think Srinu has deflated it off. Yeah. He's misguided. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He deflated and then re uh, But now he inflated again. And then you have to listen to the uh, Japanese literature that's saying that you have now to do this for five minutes. Um, yeah. I think I can tell you, I don't make that. <laughs> But I think also nobody here in the team is going to make that five minutes for inflating a balloon. I check around and everybody's like, no, no, it's not going to, to happen. So I think it's fine. It's, it's quite spacey. So I would try now to place the first uh, stand. What about the length? I would think we should go at least to the curve. So either a 12 or a 15. Uh, whatever you like, but a 10 French. Yeah. Okay, I get a 10-12. So, I deflate a balloon. 10-12 straight. Yes, is that okay? Or would you have another suggestion? I think it should be fine because it's a long structure. 10 French anyway is must. So, do you think 12 centimeters would be enough? Or would you go for... I think you are uh, two or five wires coming. I'm worried about come down. Wire. My wire is come down, yes. Yeah, yeah, gosh, my... Five. The one to the so right. So, Jaden, you're going to put one 10 French into the right hepatic system or the left duct? Yeah, now to the left. Uh, but in the meantime, I, when I was talking, I lost, lost the wire yeah. to the right. Yes. Oh. But luckily, I have the best technician, so I will put it back. <laughs> no worries. So, now it should go easily because you dilated it. So, um, and then also we can see if we work it over the, the stiffer wire. So, this wire is not in the right position anymore. Yeah, you need to go. Cannulate again. What? You just do what you think it's okay. So are you going to uh, cannulate again and yeah. put the wire or first put the stent and then try to cannulate? Yeah, so what we decided as this wire is anyhow out of position and you can actually see how it, it got a bit bloody so we really dilated uh, mm, uh, appropriate. So now we're first going to place the 
stand. the stand and then we're going to do it all over again so you were lucky because now you see both the, the ways you can do it so Sukana is she's going to put the stand first yes yeah. yes, yes. Okay. the stand first and then recalculate okay. yeah so one so uh, what about using the loop guide wires you could I, am. You could use, I think they have been fashionable for a bit of time, but I think for your department you have to choose what kind of wires you all have on stock. Yeah. So we do not have the loop wire on stock. Um, Jenny, I presume uh, to push in a 10 French stent, it's a little hard and difficult than a 7 French. Any tips? Uh, yes, it is. So I think it's important you use a stiff wire. You, with your technician, really keep an eye on it. He's going to give pressure. I'm going to try to push in the stent, so he's going to uncouple. Yes, he did already. He can read my mind. Um, so and now it's important to stay really close to the papilla. Yeah. To work slow. And use your big wheel. To yes, th that's also what I do. I make a combination of my big wheel and my elevator. Yeah. And I uh, particularly focus on my pap my umbrella to see that I really stay close, right. because I think if you lose, if you get a distance, then you also lose your power. But here you see this the flange coming. Yeah, and the flap. Yes. The flap is, is there. The point. Yes. So now we can take this one out. Um, does it make sense to cannulate with this system, or you dislike it? Uh, and look at his face. He dislikes it. So we get another system. <laughs> so that's because he didn't even cut the papillary. Yeah, you, you, know, you know, you know. But now I can read his face. So that's <laughs> thanks to working here for three months. So you, uh, you prefer to put the stand, deploy the stand directly, or would you like to use the Oasis to deploy the stand? Um, a 10 French stand. Yeah, uh, we do not work with the Oasis. I think also there you have to make a decision what you like to have on stock. Yeah. Um, we don't have the oasis on stock it's it's an option uh -huh. my bit difficulty now is that of course it's more difficult to see but there's yeah. somebody immediately starting to wrench who knows what my problem is going to be but i think we are in somewhere you're in, you're in. okay and now he's just going to get to the right uh -huh. yeah. yeah and then we are again in this kind of side loop eh? so yeah there you yeah, are yeah. 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 yeah so shall i follow you or at least try Jenny, uh, can, can you pass a 10 French without an Oasis system? I thought the wire is too thin to support a 10 French. Yeah, so we had to change for, uh, for the wire. Okay. So I just have to come back a bit. Now we are again in the same system. I thought I should go in a bit because there you went to, uh, to the right system. Pull down now a little he can, bit. Now he yeah, he is again in eh? uh, Yeah. Yes. You see he's yes, again yes, into yes. the right system. And so, so can I come back now? We exchange? Oh, he's going to. Okay, I go inside. So we're now going to change for a, a stiffer wire. I think also this, this very tiny wire has really a chance of slipping out. Uh, I'm trying to get my catheter deep enough. I think by now I, I managed. So it's really uh, the curve, but we yeah. have to take care. Would otherwise like we go to, to I come back a bit. You're planning Can we have so fluor? 10 French or the 7 French now? I will go for 7 French now. Can we have fluor? Yes, please. Okay. So I will see if I can follow, but it might be a bit of a problem with my... You see, if I push in, you see, this is what happens. So what do you want? It's we could see if we can dent the catheter. It's getting dented. So I think uh, for the audience, this is a real tough case to re do it. You need a literally a good stamina. And I think uh, Janin is proving it. Yes. So that angle pushing, there, I think, is yeah. going to make it's it. Yeah, this forward. angle is really an issue. Yeah. So uh, I am trying to bend the catheter and see if I can. And also, you see You're how I'm uh, up front of the uh, papilla to see if I can change my direction. So if I yeah, can follow. Daniel, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So because this is a structure below the conference, uh, at right and uh, right anterior and uh, left back. Why not just go in again into the left? Seven French also could go into the same duct without any problem. Yeah, that's because, also a possibility. Yeah, because this way what will happen is you slip out, you won't go into the, there will be acute termination yeah. there. Yeah. You see it's in the left and yeah. now we're going to put in a, a stronger uh, yeah. fire. Yeah. And then I have to first dilate again. And this is something you easily forget and you think, ah, oh, nice, we're in, we're going to push in the next tent. But okay, I come back. Let's see if we can really do a quick exchange. Yes. Now we should go in quickly now. So, yeah. so, um, 
Has there ever been an instance where you put more than two step at the first go? Uh, yes, it really depends how tight your structure is. And yeah. I think here it's so tight yeah. that I would not go for two tens. Right. Uh, we want to dilate again, yeah. Uh, whatever. For the show, we're going to take a bougie now. So that size bougie. So I think if we want to place a seven French tens, uh, we should uh, go for a bougie of uh, five to eight if we have that. Do we have a bougie of five to eight? You would have single size. We have six. Okay. Six to six, nine, six four to seven. Nine. Either one will help, I think. So we're going to see there's one other risk if I'm going to dilate and I have uh, friction on the other stand that I might push in the other stand. And we should be aware of that. So if it gives friction, we might consider to take the, the balloon. So if, if you have to put two stands and this is the scenario that you have to dilate after putting the first one, would you prefer to use a pigtail? Uh, a pigtail is also a very good option. Uh, I think also there it's what you uh, what you're used to. We can put in here a seven French pigtail uh, as well. Mm. Um, well. I meant the first tent. Would it be um, um, better to put a pigtail the first one? Yeah, so I think you do not part? have a pigtail of ten French, and I think the, the my main aim is at least to get in a ten French tent. Right. And if I have a picture uh -huh. in and then I won't manage uh, to get another stand in, I'm, I'm not right. completely happy. But here you can see I can get in quite okay. Yeah. I'm not disappointed. I'm here till, uh, till the marker. You see the yes. marker moving yes. in. I yes. think yes. by now we have the dilated perfect. enough. Um, just to recall, this was up to nine. Seven French. Seven French. Okay. Seven so I come back and we have to keep the wire in. Normally, I would now, you know, want to have fluoro, but here this just goes without fluoro. Now, I also have to take care that I don't take the other stand out. The okay. Stand is quite so this, the other stand is good. Yeah. So what do I get? Yeah, perfect. So now I get a seven French and uh, seven straight. straight. I, straight. Uh, uh, I get a straight, but I think there's no data out. There's even not a guideline about it. Which stand I now should uh, should play? So it, it's all fine. So will you guide? Oh, I, I get a, I get a, a pigtail. Will you guide the audience how to prevent the inner migration of the previously placed stand? Yeah. When you're putting the second stand. What step you are going to take that yeah. the first stand should not migrate in? Yeah. So what I will normally do is I would put some uh, lubricant over it. So will you make it a bit wet? And then also at the Pillar, I will try to see if I can keep some distance. So what I do now is a kind of testing how much space I do have. So they're going to, I'm really going to make the second stand very slippery. Yeah, that's, that's a good tip. Okay. Lubricating it. Yeah. And you, I mean, you just use ordinary lubricant. If you use the very uh, medical one, it's incredibly expensive. So uh, we just buy it at a, a normal uh, drugstore. Don't tell my hospital boss, <laughs> but everything that has a medical mark is incredibly expensive. I'm now at my elevator. That's at least the, the feeling I have. Yeah. So now also I try to smoothly uh, move in, see if I have enough space at the papilla. You see me again moving with my oh, yeah. big wheel and my elevator and trying to stay away a bit as far as possible from the other one. So do you have a mark for this? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So now you see the other one is moving yeah. in a bit. Yeah. And you're falling back. And uh, but I think yeah. I can manage. I just should, you know, concentrate now. Go slow. You have a flap, though. Yeah, we have a flap, so that's nice. So I think you have to. You are pulling the scope towards you. And now I really, you know, smoothly try to uh, to move in. Yeah. But you see, it's a bit difficult to, to yeah. keep the other one from staying outside. Maybe if you can juggle the scope with your hand. So I hang on my scope a bit. I do not know how far we are with the pigtail. It should be coming soon. We have a mark. So okay, now we have the mark. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I'm going to take now a bit of a distance. Right, you can leave it there because it's yeah, past the exactly. Because yeah. I do not care if this loop is really outside. So yes. I push it out of my 
Pope. Yeah. As you yeah. can see now, and the other one is nicely also yeah. in. Yes. Fantastic. I think yeah, yeah. she was very good and difficulty. So now we left it here. Yeah. Uh, thanks to the team. Fantastic. Thanks a lot for the fantastic uh, demonstration. I think very nicely shown, and I think there are a lot of uh, issues that came up in this case which you sort of solved on the way. Oh, thanks, thanks for being with me. Yeah, I think we should end here yeah. for lunch and then come back. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Two, two fifteen. Thank you, Rakesh. Okay. Thank you. Okay, yeah, Manu, yeah. Manu, just Thank a second, you. we'll go yeah. to Robata's room. Thank you. Thank you. We'll uh, see Robata because uh, she was uh, doing a lot of dissections, dissections. So we'll go to her before going back to her. Robata, yeah. you're on. Hello. What yeah. we found, I want to show, is that the lesion was inside the muscle, was not laying yeah, the stomach. We can see, we, 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 we we can see the... We can see the... We can see the... We'll get you on the... One, one second, Manu. Yeah, yeah. 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 So what we found was saying that the lesion was at inside the muscle, was not in the submucosa. So I was able to save the flap just uh, above the lesion. I cut here a bit, I'm not inflating because we have a small primoperitoneum that we will decompensate later. I attach a clip uh, plus a rubber band and then a second clip uh, here to have the traction. In this way, not only I have the traction, but once uh, I will end to complete uh, the dissection around the lesion, I will have the lesion attached uh, to the clip and there's no chance to uh, let it fall down in the peritoneum. I'm having an hard time. You can typical lesion, open. And there's a lot of vessels. So, uh, Robata, I mean, it looks very fascinating the way you're keeping your cool uh, over whole process. You know, it's just really fascinating. So, we'll keep the screen on, Manu, and as yeah. you're dissecting, we also want to see how Robata closes this opening. Sorry, it's, uh, close. Can you hear me, Robata? No, so yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so, yeah, very really impressed with the way you are maintaining a cool and directing this whole thing. Open. So we are on the screen all the time. Okay. And uh, we'll uh, watch you closing also as we go. Okay. 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 Thank you. I want to go here and cut it from yeah, yeah. here. Ah, we have a big bleeding. Close. Open. I need to see. No, no, I don't need to the compression now because I need it. You're doing that. I'm not doing that, Zahir. Huh? 
Huh? Don't decompress mm -hmm. now because I need mm -hmm. the pneumo. Yeah. Yeah. Right now. yeah. See how many vessels? Yeah. Mm. I'm really afraid about them. I tell you. Okay, let's do it again. Because now you can even grasp it. It's near it, I mean. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Because we have it attached from yeah. here. Mm. We need to understand how to snare it. It won't be so easy. See how many vessels? This is what I don't like. This one. Open. Mm. Yes, this is exactly this. Okay, give me the co grasper. And oh, then, if you can, excuse me, if you can change the pattern, yeah. yeah, I want to use the co grasper. Co grasper with the uh, co grasper. Okay, close. Did you get us, Mama? Yes, 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 thank you. Open. Turn. Let less, 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 less. Thank you. Close. Did you change your program? It's not yes, working. Yes, soft, soft coagulation. Open. Open. No, no access there. Wait, 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 wait. We'll do it step by step because we are almost there. Thank you. Okay, I think it's the time to grasp it. We have to figure it out how to grasp it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. so give me the snare. This is the concept. I will, with the snare, I will remove the clip, not the one on the tumor, the other yeah, one. Another. Then, follow me. I will use that snare to enter inside the clip in the tumor. Uh, I have one single channel. Give me. And then let's have a foreign body forceps ready. Okay? Where is this clip? <laughs> I touched so well that now it's difficult to find it. Okay. Where is it? Here we are. Um, okay. So we'll let it open, otherwise we'll take the forceps also for this. Open. Emphysema, open. open. Oh, sorry, thank you. I don't want to remove this one, I want to remove that one. Uh. Okay, close, 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 close. Very good. Okay. No, no, don't open. Let me check if I took it out or not. Not yet. Okay, now open. Now. I want to clean the field. I want to understand. Okay, here we are. Now we have to enter here. 
open the snare is it fully open is it 15 you said no okay because I don't like the shape but we'll manage it see it's not no it's okay it's okay we are here wait 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 Yes, exactly. But because of the pneumo, no, 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 no. Come on, let me see. Come on. I'll do it the same, so let me see and do it easy. Okay. Okay, okay, close slowly, 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 slowly. Okay, now all of us pray. Okay, what do you have with setting? So, Nothing, no setting. <laughs> and uh, it's not the other knife, I have the snare. And the curl, come on, here. <laughs> and the yes. oscog, yes, okay. Ready with the forceps. I want the forceps here ready. As soon as I cut, you will remove this and I'll take the forceps, okay? Can I go? Go. No, no, Cog Rasper. Full and body forceps. It's not working. It's not working. There's something. Okay, now it is. Very slowly, okay? Too much tissue, it means. Uh, go for pure cut. Is it pure cut, yeah? No, it's not pure cut. You're, you're using the... No, I, I don't want this. Uh, this is the right first cut. Let okay. me do. Okay. So, I'm just coag a bit. Now, because I have too much tissue, it's only muscle, I want pure cut. Let's say the outer cut, one. Are you there? Yeah. Okay. Done. Forceps. Open. Close. Okay. Now let's see what we have inside. The lesion is out. I don't know if he's watching me. <laughs> we will let you see. It's true that it's out. Uh, all the clips are out. No, we have only one clip still there. Yes, the one that I removed that stay free in the stock. Very nice. Yes. No, no, we had to close it. What? No, no, no. What? Clip. What do you think? If you were here, and the loop at the end, or and the loop before, and then you know, I I, I don't know this teacher. I know, but I never done it. You want and you show me? Oh, please, let's do it together. Or I use the over stitch. Everything it's okay. Huh? Guide me. What is that? What is that flap? Bring it back. Here, yeah, it's not a real flap. Mm. Suck, suck. Huh? 
So I will come out? No. no. Oh, you will, okay, I got it. So I will release. Uh, and what if the loop goes in the peritoneum? You will go and say. He's doing this. He told me now he's doing science. He's doing I thought you wanted me to put the um, the envelope externally and to put it there, so you were ready to. That's a more difficult way. With detachable loop, you can just yeah. leave the loop there. It's not going. See? And it's not going. Does it work this one with the 2.8 channel? Yeah, it's Ah, let me straight the scope. Hmm. Ah. Meanwhile, I will suck everything. Really? We were lucky. We were lucky. Okay. Ready, 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 ready. If you are in Milan, you will do understand? Mm. Not yet. I want to fix the gap. And then we'll see. Till the till the removal part. <laughs> What? No. Which company is this one? Leo Med. Not Olympus. Olympus one is not detachable. We have to use like. Uh, that brings a lot of uh, difficulties in using this technique. Mm. Yes, you have to control it from over What's wrong with this? Yeah. Mm. So this one is like, leave it over the cap, like this. Mm. And hit, 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 and again cast them. Mm. Like a person. Uh, like yeah. It's called Leo, my dear. Yeah. So I need to make the plume again to, to see, and then before pull it. Uh, not yet. <laughs> okay. Wait. Okay. Go. Okay. Yep. Okay, clip. Turn. Now that we wait with small again. Turn right. Uh, three nine. Let's say. Uh, 
I don't want to take this one, but I want to take Where are you? Over there. So it's yeah. So it's better to take this. No? What? You can you can take the other end of the loop. Close. Okay, and then here. Okay. Open. Let's try to catch it. Turn. I like the one that I can rotate by myself. Turn. Close. No, 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 it was okay. This is why. Turn a little bit on the right. Right? A little bit more. Close. Okay. And I have to attach this one on the, li on the left side, no? Yes. Open. Close. I'm okay, no? Tell you that this one is difficult. Open. Much better the future. Close. Yeah, it's much easier. Close. Open. For later, can I have, if it's possible, the... No the clip that kind of rotate by myself. You are very good, but I don't know how used to have something so good. <laughs> go, 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 go. Go. Try to close. Let me check. No. Open. You were closing or not? Close. Yeah, we we'll release this one here. What do you think? Yes or no? Mm. Release. We'll see, we'll see. Because this one now, let me understand. Okay. Okay, now we'll take this one and put here. Oh, this is why I was looting everything. What do you think? Yeah. You can also put it proximal to the... You mean here? Close? Hmm? What do you think? Release? So this one is going in the Palorosa? Don't say. Don't say. And the stitch not safer. And the stitch. Would be safer? Or the same? The same? Mm -hmm. Is it worth a reflection? Same result. I'm just wondering if it the same result as end of stitch. Is the same result as end of stitch? Not if Uh, let me distend a bit. I need to distend to understand. Otherwise, I won't be able to. Okay. Now, we need to take this and put it... Uh, we need at least other two. Let's put this one. Can you rotate and take it? Open. Close. No. Wait, wait, wait. Close now. 
do we have it? Yes, maybe not too much. And then we'll go on that side to grasp that part. But I have to pass on. Correct? Are you following me? No, I lost it. Where is now? I told you that it's difficult. What's happening here? Lupi Lupa. Okay, I came out so maybe it was in the channel. What happened? Let me understand. Take this one and pull it. Yeah, we can grab yes, it pull it yes, way. yes, exactly. This is what I wanted to do. Close. Open because I touched the... Close. Okay. So now open again. Close. Okay. I got it. We have to... Yes, in the middle and I will put there. Yes, yes exactly. Turn before opening. A little bit more on the right. Hi, Why are you laughing? I'm just repeating. Acha, acha, release fire. <laughs> yeah, <try. laughs> You are making do something so difficult. So now we have one, two, three. Do you want more? Yes, yes, I know, but I need to see and then I'll... Uh... But now our orientation is right. Okay. Few minutes and I'll decompensate it. Because if, we decom if, we, if, we, if I do it now, I won't have space to see. I know, I know, I know. Oh, no. What's that one? Give me, give me, give me the perceptions. Maybe it's... Close. Ah, we were in a good... Open. Open, open, open. Close. But is a touch or not? Was not yeah, but it was not completely closed. Okay. Yes, sir. Two clips. Okay, so this one is here. It's a very complicated technique, this one. Yeah. No. Yeah, it is. Okay, so we have one clip still there. Why are you giving us hard time? What is this? Open. What is this uh, case? Close. No, no. Close when I say oh, close. Uh, close. Uh, Zahiri doesn't want to give us two chairs because it's expensive. Uh, 
He gave us the cheaper thing. Let me take it. On the right. on Open. The... Close. Do you feel it? Good. Good. Sure. A little more. more. Open. Close. Much better. Yes. Release. Ah, yes, no good. Mm. Or um, let me just close it with clips, I don't know. I will decompress, yes, yes, I will, I will, I will. Yes, there is a problem. Ah, yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah, maybe, maybe it's better if you are really fast in doing it, uh, it that you do this, I'm, I'm honest. Uh, because it's the first time for me. See, you have clips everywhere. Do you want to? Do you want to? No. Try to give me one more clip. If I can have a clip here, I have a good shot. Wait, wait, wait. I don't want if I want to switch. Let me check. Open, open. So open, open completely. Open completely. Close. Fire. Yeah, one, two, and we'll pull it. This is the problem. The proximal is here. Clip. One, two, three. I'll try to put one there and then I'll try to loop it. Okay? Mm hmm Open. I need to cut this. The um, close. Hmm. Here we are. Okay. Open. I know. I know because I need to put that one in. Okay. Open. Ah, oh, in the lens. Come on, let me see. close okay wait 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 open close 
okay and I need to put this one there I need to catch this okay you got it open that won't be so easy but we'll try to try yeah so we're okay no just see this Open. The fact is that uh, I don't have enough space to see because as soon as I start, uh, uh, this is why I said to suture it from the beginning because this is I I'm this is, I'm not comfortable with this one. What open? Or close? Mm-hmm. Okay, open again. Now the loop came drop. Now it's open. Now very good. Margins are okay. Ha. Robert, are you want some help? Yep. No, no. Um, you said, and this is not my technique. I don't, I don't, I don't know this. Uh, I need you to guide me. Yes, exactly. Are you ready to come? Come. So you need a cap? Yeah, um, we are placing envelope and clips. Uh, You're done? No, it is doing. I was trying to, but uh, it's the first time for me. Uh, usually, I suture it. No, but you took it out. Oh yes. Oh okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, I was having a very hard time in this envelope and clips. So, so that, yeah, I, I don't know, honestly. We'll see and uh, I will learn how to. So we have two more there. This is the hole. The lesion is out. Yeah, it's much more difficult to close it uh, than to remove the lesion. I know, I know, I know, I know. No, no. Not that. Because I already... No, from inside. Yeah, we remove the lesion, but then we have a little bit of time in closing it because they want to close it with envelope clips.
Zaheer, so we watched that. We we were not interacting, but we watched that, and an ideal example of teamwork. I don't think. Yeah, son. Zaheer, uh, just briefly summarize for the audience because they want to know real life situations. Roberta, mic is with. Uh, yeah, you have no mic. Okay, we'll get a mic for Zaheer. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll ask them to put on the mic. Mic is not on. Roberta, wait. Hold on. Paul, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, we were able to remove it and block. Yeah. Without letting fall in the peritoneum, but then I was having a hard time enclosing with underwood and clips because it's not something I used to do at home, yeah. honestly. It was one of the first time for me. So I tried, but it was so hard that finally. He helped me, and uh, let's say that we work in team. Yes. But yeah, the patient is good. That's the, a good example of teamwork. Yeah. And I think all of us need to follow that. So thank you very much. We watched the end. Some part uh, we were not connected, that's all. Okay. 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 Well done. Well, we are ready for the next session as it starts. I'll straight away call the chairpersons because they can take over. Shubra, Shubra is now at Kanpur. She is running her own center, but we are happy to say that she has worked with us for, though for a short time. And with her is Dr. Ramesh Kumar, professor and head of Osmania, well known all over the country. Ramesh and Shubra will carry us through the next session. Huh? Which is ready? Madhura, you are ready? We are ready, we are ready, Ramesh. Yeah, so we will ask Madhura to be on the screen. Okay, yeah, she is there, she is. Uh, and Dr. Ramesh yeah. and Shubra are on the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Ye
uh, going to moderate. We can see you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. Okay, thank yeah. you. I'm just projecting a few slides about indications of manometry. So the main indication is motor dysphagia, and the other indications are non-cardiac chest pain. And before you do a pH metry, you can do a ES localization. And of course, before fundal glycation for gastroesophageal reflux disease, you have to do a manometry. The history that is important to take is for heartburn, regurgitation, dysphagia, chest pain, and weight loss. The next slide, please. So this is the protocol. Yes. We are unable to see you. No, so that will because the slides are being seen. Oh. After the slides are over, the two more slides will be coming back to the uh, live session. Okay, okay. So in the protocol, uh, first you, if you are doing a complete Chicago protocol, you give ten supine water swallows, and then you can do a multiple rapid swallow, which we will be demonstrating today. Then put the patient in the upright position. But with the water perfusion system, you only do the ten supine water swallows and the multiple rapid swallows. Okay. This you do when you suspect whether there is uh, dysphagia and you are suspecting echinacea. If you are suspecting uh, 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 any uh, 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 aperistalsis or a dysmotility, and uh, for the other things like severe dysphagia, whether supine water swallows do not give you an answer, you can either start giving meals. Or giving uh, single solid swallows. Next slide. So this is a water perfuse catheter which we are going to use. The next type of catheter is a solid state catheter which can also measure impedance. Just go to the next slide. So this is the first thing we do, which we've already done. We've already put these two sticks with a lot of uh, jelly in the nose so that the nose is completely anesthetized and the patient doesn't feel terrible when we pass the uh, thing through the nose. The next slide, please. And this is how we check the catheter. We'll sh start showing this to you live. So we got the catheter here. Uh, we can put up the slides. So we've got the catheter here, and you can appreciate that there is water dropping through the all the pots. Uh, can you just focus on the catheter and the water that is dropping through? It's always better. So Anu is with me, uh, who is uh, going to help me do this procedure. And Mr. Upendra is the technician here. So you usually zero this at the level of the anterior axillary line of the patient. Okay. So once you have done this, once you press zero on on the screen, you can see this on the manometry screen. Is the manometry screen visible to you all? No, no, not. So well. the manometry screen has to be visible there. Yes, can you yeah. see that now? Now we can see. So you can see that all the catheters on the right of the screen, you can see that all the tunnels are showing the same light blue color. As I raise the catheter, the pressure in all the channels is going up. So they are becoming yellow. And as you bring it down, they are all becoming green, which means now they are well calibrated and any change in pressure will now be visible when the patient swallows. So after this, we are going to put in the catheter and uh, uh, we will put in jelly on this. Uh, put the jelly not on the pots, but only on the tip of the catheter. Otherwise, the water will stop. It will so what would you do if there would be a block? Like had uh, the calibration been wrong? Then so that is something that uh, I'll, uh, what I will do is, while I answer the questions, Mr. Upendra can put in the catheter. Yeah. So he is a professional, he is very good at putting the catheter. So while uh, the, uh, if there is a block in the channel, usually it is air. Uh, so you will see dark blue color. Right now, of course, they put off the water. So uh, if there is water, the first thing is go and check the channel, uh, flush it as much as you can so that there is a continuous water flow. Remember that as far as water perfuse catheters are concerned, air is the enemy. If there is water in the channel, you will see a dark blue color there and that channel actually is not recording any pressures. So therefore you got to be, you know, you have to check all the channels before you do this. In case some channels are not working, it is better to uh, stop uh, uh, that, I mean, you have to disable those channels when you are analyzing. And uh, then you have to place your catheter in such a way that those blocked channels are not taking any important readings. For example, the uh, uh, LES and the upper sphincter should not be anywhere near the block channels. So in this particular catheter, there are 22 channels. Most of the channels are 
the ones near the lower sphincter are uh, about uh, 1 centimeter apart the rest of the esophagus they are 2 centimeters apart so you can see that mr upendra has already put in the catheter and as you see on the screen uh, anu can you just show it with the mouse with the mouse so uh, anu is just showing us that is the upper sphincter you can see the uh, dark uh, darkness and uh, 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 as you see this uh, you might want to know what is dark and what is light and if you look on the left of the screen you can see a color code uh, anu can you just show that no the mouse uh, can we just see the mouse but no the ah uh, yeah so the mouse is working can you see the mouse no yeah. no 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 uh, we can't see the color code also shobna so on the extreme left of the screen you can see the mouse moving anu is moving the mouse yeah can you there see the mouse now there is a vertical bar oh, on which he is moving the mouse yes there is a vertical bra on the uh, bar on the extreme left and if yeah. you look at those colors uh, remember that in your school you learned the colors with your for uh, rainbow yeah. so violet indigo anu will just show you violet indigo blue green yellow orange red so that is the color so violet is the lowest color that means the pressures are low that means the blues are all low pressures and the reds are all high pressures and uh, right now we have put the catheter in just come this side mr open so i'll just show you all what we are seeing here you can see that this is the high pressure zone in the lower sphincter and how do i know that this is the lower sphincter i am going to use what is called as the pip marker so if you concentrate on the top i am going to first start the investigation what is the depth of the uh, the depth of the catheter is 52 cm from the nose once i put this now as i look here if i use this pip marker you can see two waves on top can you see them on the top of the screen can you see two waves are those waves seen yeah 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 okay so ask the patient to take a deep breath lamba saas lo when they take a deep breath what will happen the pressure in the chest will become negative so you see a dark blue color coming there yes which is the deep breath and now you bring this down to the les and you follow the area where the patient had taken a deep breath and you see this the pressure is inverting is that appreciable yes, yes so what was going down during inspiration is now coming up during inspiration that is the respiratory inversion point okay so if this has inverted it means that the catheter has crossed the les can you see this conversion here can you see this uh, thing which is diamond shaped i don't think my hand is showing here yeah. but i can't show you at the mouse at the same time but if you look at the screen and follow this mouse when the take patient takes a deep breath in the chest it is blue which means the patient has taken a deep breath the chest pressure is negative as you come down the gastric pressure becomes positive which means you have crossed the les and this is the most important thing to show to start with during a manometry if this is not done well you are likely to have coiled the catheter and all such things what we are going to do now is we'll start the procedure we will start with the resting pressure so the first thing is to instruct the patient not to swallow during the resting pressure and how do we do that we make sure by telling the patient to just open the mouth a little bit all of you can try this open your mouth a little bit it's very difficult to swallow so tell her oh, okay so now what we do is i think yeah. you can go to the next room okay. we'll finish the procedure Thank and uh, come back to you yeah okay, okay. so we go to room number 1 yes well amita is uh, ready with another interesting case uh, so we see uh, we have a history first okay This mm -hmm. looks like the stricture. It looks yeah. like stricture. It looks pretty yeah, benign. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We have a sixty-eight year old male with multiple comorbidities presented with obstructive jaundice and weight loss of around twenty kg. Hemogram is showing anemia with leukocytosis. Total hemoglobin and alkaline phosphatases are elevated. The CA ninety-nine is around five hundred. MRCP showing dysmorphic type three stricture. 
Next CT shows FDG as a type 3 hall of structure with vascular involvement and multiple lymph nodes. EOS from the lymph node showed benign tissue. ERCP brush cytology was negative to malignancy. So now we are dealing with an indeterminate biliary structure. The plan is to do an ERCP with cholangioscopy and rapid onset evaluation. And if malignancy will proceed with RSA and biliary stent. Learning objectives are to understand the role of cholangioscopy in the management of indeterminate biliary structures and sense versus plastic stents in the management of malignant obstruction and to understand the technique of bilateral sense placement. Here is a meta analysis of six studies which have shown that single operator cholangioscopy had high sensitivity and specificity of around 95% in the visual interpretation of indeterminate biliary structures and malignancy. Thank you, Dr. Amrita. Hi. So, um, we, we decided we're going to go straight to spy this patient's already had an ERCP, already had a sphincterotomy, um, and really our goal is to try to get tissue and characterize the stricture, so not, no need to sort of do clangiography from the beginning. So, I'm just going to demonstrate um, the freehand technique of the um, of cannulation with SPI, um, which is you know doable if you have already had the sphincterotomy and the pro the stricture is is more uh, proximal, so it's pretty much like putting a stent in. You just uh, use the knobs, the small wheels, to really manipulate the tip of the scope, some very much like you do with the sphincter tone. And then we'll switch over here, and we're going to do intermittent. Uh, um, irrigation and just to manipulate your way up with the spy scope you don't have to really push so much you can also just use your body a little bit small movements at a time we're going to intermittently do suction to get rid of some of this fluid so we have a clear view and then we can stop the suction we can irrigate a little bit and we're going to keep going up here okay so here we arrive at our first uh, decision point um, because I've already gone in, I know that uh, this side is cystic, so I'm going to go um, up here. All right, at least I hope that was the cystic. Um, and you can just look at this mucosa, uh, the epithelium, biliary epithelium here. It's a little bit, it's not smooth, it's not completely regular, um, but certainly nothing alarming. But now we're starting to get, you see some uh, finger-like projections right there. It's a little different, kind of granular epithelium, just making our way up here. And there is certainly narrowing that we're starting to see. But we were not only no really, right? really in our, yeah, no mass. And so far, nothing that I would normally say is a malignant appearance. Um, we're not seeing very dilated, tortuous vessels. Amrita, do you see the yellow appearance? Are they normal? Would you no, I think anyway. these are abnormal. So these are definitely what I might call villous projections. Um, they have been associated with malignancy, but not as a single um, characteristic finding. But definitely, that's a target for our biopsy. How much importance do you pay to visual impression, Amrita? I give a lot of importance to it, um, mostly to uh, really help me target where I'm going to biopsy and how aggressive I'm going to be. But here we are starting to see now some other findings. And remember, it can be very heterogeneous um, findings. You can have some inflammation in one spot, but then high-grade dysplasia or the carcinoma in another, especially if a patient has been stented before. Um, then we, we need to figure out what are stent-related changes and what are um, you know, uh, actual lesional changes. And the blood veins are also very big. So, yeah. And yeah. So here you can see that um, kind of irregular, tortuous uh, little irrigation there, um, vessel there. And also we start to see an increased vascular pattern just beyond it. So we'll just go a little bit more distal here. There is some stone material, which is interesting because maybe this could be a benign uh, stricture from chronic stone disease that would, you know, certainly fit the prior negative biopsies, uh, brushings and um, the lymph node that was negative, but I am s most suspicious of this area right, uh, right here where we see that large vessel. Um, so that's what I'm going to really target. And the other thing is we saw the small opening to 
the other duct. Can we take a spy bite now and take the histology? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the benefit that you have here is that we're going to do on-site, uh, we're going to do rows um, based on the biopsy. And we know from uh, Shyam's data and G's data that you can have excellent results with even just one to three passes. So I'm passing the spy bite forceps up. Sometimes there can be a little bit of difficulty getting it through the distal portion of the duct, um, in which case there's maneuverous irrigate um, that we can do, but it's passing so far okay. There we go. We see that. So I'm just going to line it up a little bit so I can make sure I target that one area. There we go. Can you, can you tell us where exactly is the site now? Yeah, so um, we are likely at bifurcation. Um, I saw a small opening um, for the other duct that I'm not seeing right now. Um, and then I passed more proximally into, I, I think it's probably the right intrahepatic. Um, and so this is actually might be bifurcation itself that I'm going to, uh, or confluence that I'm going to take the biopsy from. But you saw the blanching of the vessels. Um, so that's where I'm going to target open. So we can use the, um, the small wheels to help us direct to kind of, we want to turn into it the way we do with Barrett's Close. Um, you can also apply suction if you want to, but we have a nice bite here. We'll mm -hmm. take that. Um, and then we'll put that on a slide, and we'll have our uh, expert pathologist give us a, a view of that. So, and while she does that, I'm just going to look around a little bit more, because I think that the uh, uh, duct... Another, another is there. So ma'am, do you prefer uh, maneuvering the cholangoscope yourself or <laughs> do you like the technician doing it for you? Yeah, I do. So, um, I, I know, so again, it's what I do at home. I do physician control wire and I, I really do all of the controls myself. In my case, um, I like using the, the effect of the scope, the spy scope on the, on the duodenoscope itself. And I use a lot of body movements to really man maneuver the scope up into the duct. So, um, can you show this here in principle that Amirada is making? Amirada, can you explain what you're doing? Mm, not yeah, audible. Here. Amirada. I hope you can see this uh, tissue. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, the first thing which we will do is take an imprint smears where we'll just gently touch uh, by pressing on another slide and you get the imprints okay. mm -hmm. and we drop it into cytology fixative what? and one more is I'm going to do a smash protocol with one of these biopsies. Yeah. Yeah. How many cells you require to make a diagnosis? Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, for uh, diagnosis at least we will need, there's nothing as a criteria for adequate tissue, any atypical cell uh, which is enough to make a diagnosis can be uh, satisfactory for um, uh, reporting. But the number of cells which we will need for uh, uh, molecular mm -hmm. testing will be there minimum 1,000 to 2,000 yeah, right. yeah. So, we well, should talk about clearing that. Yeah. So now we will do a uh, rapid H and D staining of these imprints, okay. and probably in two minutes we'll be able to. Yeah, another as we are doing that, we'll go to another room where Janine is ready with the case, and uh, we'll go to Janine's room. Yes. Yeah. Learning objective is to understand the tips and tricks to perform EOS guided sister gastrostomy and selecting between metal and plastic stems for peripancreatic fluid collection management. Here is a systematic review which has shown similar overall treatment success rate between plastic and metal stems and there was no difference in the rate of adverse events and recurrences. Go to Dr. Jenin. 
Hi there, good afternoon. Uh, it, it's a great honor to be here uh, with again another great team. I think you only have great people here uh, around who are going to assist uh, with this SIS drainage. I also have a co-pilot who is very experienced in SIS drainage, so if I'm going to crap around, she's going to correct me and say what I should be doing. Um, I think on the EOS image you can appreciate the cysts. Yeah, so yeah. what I normally would do if I would start with such a procedure is first have a close look. I mean, how much debris do you see inside? Uh, I think that that's really limited. I also would check my flow. And I think there are not really any significant vessels in between. And then, of course, we have the story of this patient. And if you listen to the story, it's quite likely that he has a disrupted duct, which means that, in principle, I want to place something that's going to stay in forever. And if you want to go for stay in forever, you have to go for a plastic. Though I see nowadays quite often that people tend to go for metal stents. And I think placing metal stents are easy. But they're not for the long run, and I think if you place metal stands, you should be also proficient in placing plastics, which are more difficult, but it's really a good backup to have it. So you can see here the cyst. I have a 19 gauge needle, and uh, I will go and puncture it. So first we'll uh, position my needle. You will see it coming out at the upper corner of my uh, screen. I fix it and I'm going to push it with my elevator a bit down, as you can appreciate over here. Then I'm going to drop this. They already took out the stylet a bit and now I'm going to try to puncture it. Here you see my uh, needle and yeah. you see me going oh. in. That's a beautiful puncher, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Directly into the cyst. Yes, so now we, I would suggest that we still take a bit of a fluid. We're quite sure where we are. I think this is really the cyst. I have to tell you that I once really made a mistake that I punctured the gallbladder and I only realized too late. So here it's also some brown stuff coming out, but this is definitely no bile. This is, I would say, leftover from a necrotic uh, cyst. I do not know if the camera can zoom in quickly. Uh, this is the liquid we get out and I think this is not a bile. But I, I'm happy to hear other suggestions. No, no, that looks like a sanguineous pancreatic fluid. So now we're going to put in a wire. I think we took a special wire. Just continue. It is a banded wire, and you have to make sure that it's not going to be sheared into uh, the system. And you can do this on the fluoro, but also just on the EOS guided. Uh, we are waiting for the wire to come out. I think there it's starting. I would normally make quite some loops to just be, uh, be safe. And you see he's nicely making lots of loops, so I think we could do with this. Can you show us the uh, endovision, please, once? So the endovision, endo I mean, endoscopically, I'm not looking at really much. So what I would do now is to take back this part of the needle. And in the meantime, the technician is putting in the wire as much I take out the rest. Then I fix it again. I think my colleague wants to uh, make a remark. Uh -huh. I was just saying that we've already checked on endoscopy the position of the scope. Yeah. So we're in the proximal body approximately yeah, 5 centimeters right. below the G junction. Yeah. yeah, so I think that's really an important remark. I checked that I'm not in the esophagus because sometimes those cysts are so high that you might puncture from the esophagus. Now we are really um, quite quickly, as everything here, are removing the um, needle and my wire is really stable. I fix it with my elevator. Now we're there where we should be. So my next step would be now to use a cystotome and to burn my way into, uh, into the cyst. And I think this is the most difficult part, at least for me during the procedure, to have enough tension on the wire and burn in. I normally would go for pure cutting uh, currency. And they're putting it up. If you can see under the fluoro, I have my wire not in a complete straight line. I think it's not too bad, but I'm happy to take your suggestions. Ma'am, we can't see the fluoro yeah. in the auditorium. So, um, they already gave me my cystotome. Yeah. Now we can. Yeah. I think also one of the important things at this moment is, is that you just stay fixed. You stay concentrated. You quite try to keep everything in position. Don't be disturbed about people running into your room. Just 
look at your screen and look where you are. Um, I'm advancing till I can feel my elevator. I have my elevator. I have to look for my pedals. The pedal. And uh, they are still, they're even for me a bit too far away. Uh, just to cross check, I'm going for the yellow pedal. pedal. I am going to push the system out. Oh, I think I have pure cutting current. They're going to connect it for me. Yes. You can also see a bit the endoscopic image, but that's not where I am looking. So what I will do now is I would push it out. There it is. Yeah. And I'm going to put on my pedal. And we're in. Yeah. And you should be in relatively quickly. Um, so now I'm going to exchange. I'm going to take this part out. I can put away the pedal. I always like to do that because sometimes if it's still around, it's not good for your, for your own safety. You see that I'm through a bit of water in the stomach, but that's not really cumbersome. And I have really to get back here to get trained for the speed. Eh? It's, it all goes so fast. And I'm getting older, so it's getting more and more difficult. I really wonder how you folks do that. So I'm back with my wire. I'm now going to dilate. I decided to uh, take a 6 millimeter balloon. And they're going to uh, put that through. You can debate if you take a 6 or you take an 8. Uh, but we weren't only with a 6 French 10. Uh, um, uh, Sistotone. So I was wondering if the aid was passing through and then my co-pilot said, mm, might be tight. So I think there you really have to uh, also listen to each other and take each other's suggestions. So I'm again at the elevator. So we'll now see if I can get the balloon in. Can I have some fluor? Yes, great. So there I am. There's the balloon. So I think I'm in now and I'm going to inflate it till uh, six millimeters. So I think this all you can just do on the EOS image. You can do a quick fluoro to see if the balloon is really inflated. Can I just have a screen? We have a very beautiful EOS image here where we can yeah. see the cyst, the wire, as well as the balloon going through the cyst wall. Yeah, so I think actually so you can stop the fluoro. The image on the EOS is nicer than it's under the fluoro. Yeah. So um, I think it's it's dilated sufficient. Uh, what I will do now, we take we're going to take out the balloon, and then we're going to put in uh, a ten French catheter, so we can place two wires. So you see nicely that the balloon is deflated. And, and now once again we have to concentrate that the technician is keeping an eye on the wire while I am pushing back. So I check. Am I fine to? I just have to wait a sec. So I'm happy to take questions. And for how long did you dilate the track? Um, yeah, also here there is no guidance. I, I just, yeah, okay, my technician is okay. Can we have some fluor? So I would just say that you see that the uh, pressure is gone away and the balloon is nicely inflated. So can I have a shot of fluor to make sure, yeah, perfectly fine. So we can stop the fluor. So I rather have in two wires at this stage because if you have in one stand and you have to cannulate alongside the stand that's in, you sometimes happen to be in between the stomach and the cyst. The advantage here is that this patient has had already uh, a drainage. So in principle, this cyst is already connected to the stomach. So now I have to see if I can get in this 10 French uh, catheter. I'm moving again. As you might realize, I do not look at all at the endoscopic image. I'm controlling by fluoro and by my EOS image. So I'm waiting till I'm at my elevator. I am at the elevator. I open at the elevator. The technician takes care of the wire. Might give me a bit of tension so I can come in. Now you see I have resistance. You suddenly see it also on the endoscopic image but maybe I'm in now it's difficult to see you see here I take a bit of distance yes we are, yeah, in. We are in but you see it's it's really and only 10 French so I should make sure that I stay relatively close with my uh, scope he's going to put in another wire 
And I have to say honest, my main aim is to get in at least one pigtail. And let's see if the other wire is coming in. Yes, yes there you can appreciate the other wire. And then we do another, quite some loops. And then I look if he's fine. I think I should push in my scope a bit more. So that's what I did to secure my position. Am I, are you fine? Yes, he's fine. So I come back. I will have to keep some, quite some traction to get this catheter out. And to say honest, I'm not looking at the wires. I leave that to the technician. Now you can also appreciate the endoscopic image. Yes. So the next aim is to put in hopefully two pigtails, but at least one pigtail. So I'm happy with my position. I'm happy that I can see the wire. I check with my team. Yes, they seem also to be happy. I mean, I think that's really a vital signal. If yeah. your technician or your co-pilot starts to really frown, then you really have to ask, <laughs> okay, what should I do different? Is everything fine? I think it's absolutely fine and just the perfect way to do it. Are you deploying tension? So, uh, you're asking about uh, the size of the stents? Yeah. Yeah, so we are um, having pigtails. I think they are four centimeters. It's seven, seven, seven four centimeters. Yeah. And they put a mark on it. So, I know when I have to, you know, go away from the cyst to deploy the second flange. And in between, they made me uh, take care of the other wire. I have it in between my fingers. Okay. Uh, I think I'm at my elevator. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to push. Can we have some fluoro? Yes, we can. And then you see on the endoscopic image, yes. my yes. first stent is going in. Yes. You're able to see. Okay, that was the mark already, yeah? Okay. So we can take the wire back so we get the curl. Yeah. And now I'm going to take some distance and try to push out the other one. I have to correct a bit with my wheel. So here is the other one. Very nice. So now the question okay. is, do we have to dilate again or should we just try to put in the next stent? I think we can directly put That was a very nice uh, demonstration. So uh, as we finish off with the second stent, we'll go to another room yes. where Shobhana is ready with the manometry. Yeah. And thank you very much for that. Thank you. So thank you. What we have done is we've already given eight swallows. So the last two swallows, we'll just show you the swallow mechanism. Yeah, Anu is going to, going to put the swallow in the mouth and the patient is asked to swallow once and we mark this on the screen as the ninth swallow. And what you will see now is there is absolutely no peristalsis, but there is this uh, dark yellow and green, which is almost simultaneously coming up. You cannot see the lower esophageal sphincter relaxing at all. The LES has not opened at all and this whole thing has lasted for about 10 or 12 seconds. How much and is the LES pressure, ma'am? We haven't yet measured it. The measurement is going to be done after during the analysis. Okay. So now we will give the last swallow as there are 30 se seconds that have elapsed between the previous swallow. So between two swallows, you must keep a gap of about 30 seconds so that the uh, 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 there is no uh, inhibition of the next swallow and that is the last swallow so we have given 10 swallows and in this case since we have the diagnosis almost ready on the screen uh, we will not be doing any extra maneuvers so we will be stopping this taking out the catheter and just showing you the analysis after That's some time in the meantime uh, Nagi we can take them to the next room. Thank you, Shabna, for that nice uh, demonstration. Yes. So, we'll go to room number two. Madhura is ready with Mariana for a, another interesting procedure. So, we'll have the history first. Yeah. We have a 50 year old male with intermittent pain, abdominal weight loss since one month. Black shows iron deficiency anemia, elevated ESR, CRP with fecal calcodectin of more than 800. Endoscopy and colonoscopy were normal. PVD abdomen was done. We showed multifocal short segment stricturing and upstream dilatation of the proximal bubble, suggestive of Crohn's disease. The plan is to perform a motorized spiral endoscopy. Learning objectives are to understand the role of water immersion in achieving maximal depth of insertion and to know the contraindications of motorized spiral endoscopy. Yeah, Madhura, you are on. 
Thank you. Thank you, AG, for this wonderful opportunity. I'm here with Dr. Marian, who is like going to be the doer. I'm just going to be the instrument. <laughs> so I have a lovely team here, Dr. Sindhu, Dr. Rajeshwari, and Rohit assisting me. So we'll, I'll just show the assembly of the scope. So the power spiral endoscope is 168 centimeters long. It has a 3.2 millimeter working channel. And if you see here, this length will be in front of the spirals. Okay, 16 centimeters. And the spiral over tube is a disposable single-use tube. And uh, it's 24 centimeter in length. And we'll show the assembly now. So we'll have to lubricate. The pins, we have to show this. The pins are quite um, flexible, you see, right here. So they're not traumatic, but in a tight space, it can be traumatic. That's why we, we take here and here also the bits in the beginning. So this yeah. one fin alone will be probably like 8 to 9 millimeters. Yes. But if you just push, I think it will give a force of 3, three centimeters, yes. which is not good. So yeah. only the spiral is okay, yeah. especially in two points, the cricopharynx and probably the pylorus and DJ. Reduction, yeah. So a lot of gel. A lot of, lot of gel, yeah. You can put more also. Now what we want to show is very important. Can you focus here? Because to avoid uh, that the spiral over tube uh, is uh, disconnected. So we have two points of connection. One is there, okay? That white line has to disappear and then the yellow has to disappear. So it is a very, uh, very safe one. But now it's locked. Yeah. Because when you see this publication about the disconnected uh, overtube spirit is not well connected in the beginning. Exactly. So this is yeah. very important. And yeah. we advise the endoscopist to do it as much as possible. So here, there is also a check which we have to do. Uh, otherwise, it won't allow you to proceed. First, you have to do the backward and then the forward. Even when the scope is, gets switched off in between or something, first, you when you start, again, you have to do the backward and forward check. And you also have to check for the... So this one is a backward check which I'm doing. So I'll be bending it and I'll ask uh, Siro to apply some pressure on top. And you can see, you can just see the motor, yeah. it stops. And so the, uh, the, 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 the spiral rotation force, it goes and then it stops. It stops. Yeah. So this is a wonderful technology and that will not allow you to traumatize whatever be the looping. So that is what caused all the trouble previously. So I think they've really rectified. Now I'm going forward. You can see the spiral, uh, the, the force gauge with the forward. The in, and when you start, the force gauge should not show maximum because there is no pressure here. Is it going right? So you're taking on it. I'm bending it. It should still not show maximum. But when you apply pressure, it should show maximum. So, And it stops. <coughs> and we should always remember that the fins are 16 centimeter behind. And so if you're having any resistance, think a little bit behind. Don't think what you're seeing in the screen. Think a little more with jelly on top. Yeah. You have to imagine you imagine how your endoscope is in the patient, exactly. Right. So. so again here the patient is under general anesthesia with uh, uh, tracheal intubation through the nose. And also this is important, there is a specific mouthpiece to put this uh, endoscope. You cannot use it uh, a simple mouthpiece, it's a little bit larger to allow the, the endoscope to pass through. So now I'm starting to use, it's gone in, but not yet in the chicopharynx. I will feel a resistance when I start using a bit vicious a chicopharynx. You can start using right from the beginning. Can so I also really have to give a disclaimer that I was trained at AIG by Dr. Mohan Ramchandani. So if I do well, the credit goes to him. If I don't do well, so. <laughs> so, so can so I ask you a question? Yes, yes. No, I know this is for the demonstration purpose, but when a patient has a multiple structure, yes. you know this is a case of Crohn's disease. Diagnosis is already there. Yes. And patient must be on the treatment. So yes. the plan is to dilate the structure. Yes. So your choice of instrument versus spiral versus balloon assisted endoscopy. What is your choice of instrument in that case? What, uh, can you repeat the question? So if we uh, you know this is the case of... Uh, Rajos, Rajos, this is not diagnosis. This is the this is diagnosis. Diagnosis. This is the diagnosis. 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 Yeah. And if you want to dilate, we want to be sure there are no ulcers and uh, it doesn't look 
really uh, because we don't want to perforate also so we want if it's a if it's more of a, there are no ulcers and it looks all right then we'll try to dilate so I'll, I'll ask see now the spirus is probably at cricopharynx so i'm going to ask them to extend the neck and deflate the et cuff this is where we'll have trouble so we'll have to be gentle it's still not passing deflate the cuff you have deflated the cuff the balloon yeah you can deflate it with the balloon when there's resistance uh, sometimes that can help yes hyperextension then we so, go a uh, little bit forwards yeah so we also ask if they have any neck problem because we know that especially in anti grip can deflate completely yeah, yeah. just for a few seconds oh. yeah So we take our time to do this, even if there's resistance, we go a little bit in. If you have high resistances, you can go a bit full backwards again and back in. All the scoops, huh? It really depends on the anatomy. Uh, there's some yeah. patients that it goes easily in, some that it takes a little bit of time, but you have to be patient. Madura just passed. So now we can... Seems uh, to have it already later. given away. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Just finish the whole spider scan pass through. Hold the scope. Hold the scope. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think you can re inflate yeah, now. Yeah. You can re inflate it. So, really, I haven't done single balloon or double balloon. So, we directly plunged into spiral endoscopy in ITAR center and uh, only if you're very careful I think it's all all right. So these are little tricks, hyperextension, uh, lots of lots of gel and deflating the endotracheal cuff. You have some if water. You, uh, if you uh, have resistance and also putting oh, in the left uh, lateral position mm -hmm. I think it's also helpful for uh, to get through. Right now surgical candidate. Madhura is the same, same uh, maneuver that we do with forward. Yeah, so it's uh, the same movements until so we pass the, the D2. And at one point, I'm ready to help with abdominal compressions when you ask me. Yes, yes, we call it uh, external motor. motor. <laughs> the internal motors on the scope. And I might have a little bit of pressure on the stomach, so we have uh, the direction in the duodenum. Oh, let's go. Oh, let's go. And we use, of course, CO2 and uh, water, uh, water immersion. The water immersion, once you're in the small bowel, really helps to uh, kind of soften the angles and uh, pass the, the, the tight angles better. So really, the the once we pass the the bulb, which is a bit tricky because you have the, the angulation, and it's yeah, still it's a bit more. Uh, uh, Madhura, thank you. I will come back to you as you're going the lesion. Okay. We'll go to another room where the histology is ready. We'll okay. check the histology and get back to you. Yeah. So we'll go to Anuradha. I think Anuradha has got the specimen ready. Anuradha. Yeah, you're on the nice camera. Nice to someone who is the guy. Can you see yeah, the someone hold him up? Yeah, yeah, we can. We can yeah. see the slide. Yeah. So this uh, is this. You yep, see. Yeah. This and the uh, voice is breaking, Anuradha. Yeah. This is the squash smear, which we have made of one of the biopsy bits, which we have taken earlier. If you see this uh, focus, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is a stromal fragment, and in the edge of the stromal fragment, if I just go on to the next magnification. You can see that there are epithelial cells which are infiltrating into this dense desmoplastic stromal tissue. And if you see these high power of these cells, there is atypia. There you are. Yeah. So there is minimal atypia and there is overlap of the cells. And another feature to say that it is not benign. 
is if you see this discohesion of the cells and you have single cells and here a disordered I'm sheet doing that. <laughs> so this was um, showing mild to moderate cellularity with abundant desmoplastic stromal tissue and these cells were infiltrating into the stromal fragments and here you can appreciate the ATP of the cells um, there is complete loss of normal polarity of the cells anisonucleosis and you can even appreciate the small nucleoli and at the base you can see that the cells are starting to, uh, to uh, fragment off and you have some bare nuclei so this is a positive for malignancy and this is a well differentiated um, adenocarcinoma there are some papillary fragments in the background, but here the uh, smears are too thick, so I do not think you are able to appreciate, but here again you can see that the fragments are infiltrating into the stromal tissue. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank I think it is very clear cut, uh, it is adenocarcinoma. Amrita, this patient also is having chronic liver disease, not operable, so best would be to I think uh, put in permanent stents. So, indeterminate structure has turned out to be malignancy. Yeah, so this patient had uh, earlier outside several biopsies done, but all were indeterminate. And the reason we know now is because of the severe desmoplastic reaction, <laughs> the biopsies were negative. And because Amrita did a directed these biopsies very well and got it from the right place, it, uh, the histology is very clear now. Are we so going I, for RFA, sir? Uh, we would, uh, depend on what she wants to do. Amrita, what do you want to do now? No, the Dr. Madhura screen is visible actually. So just one second, we will go to Amrita now. We will go to room number one, Amrita, and then she will tell us. Uh, yeah, we'll just wait. Okay. Yeah, just one second. Yeah. yeah. So what's funny is that not only and I convinced ourselves that this might actually be benign in some form of autoimmune disease because the patient's no longer jaundice and we didn't find incredible findings there. So that this is a fantastic example of directed biopsies. Um, the second question to ask once we found out it was malignant was whether the patient is a surgical candidate because if they were then we would just place plastic stents but as you pointed out liver disease whatnot he's not so I do think it's worth doing RFA and um, we have the RFA probe up here and then um, I was planning on bilateral stents I'm not sure if we want to debate that a little bit but um, uh, I think we're going to proceed with RFA using the same probe that you saw yesterday um, and uh, we can show that again if you want or if you wanted to go together, but the, it uses the heat um, sensitive uh, generator, so it, it measures the temperature and stops if it crosses the threshold, and otherwise we plan for two minutes. And you can see on the fluoro screen the four rings um, of the, the catheter where the ablation will occur, and I think we're centered pretty well across the area of stricture. What is the length of the stricture here? Uh, so the stricture here is about, um, I think it looks like, yeah, 1.5 to 2 centimeters. Yeah. We'll bring it down just a little bit. Can we bring the probe down a little? We'll bring it down just a touch to maybe right here. Okay. Okay. And then we'll start. Can you explain something about this? Uh, what is the settings yeah so the settings that you can see um, we're measuring impedance as well as temperature on the, the 74 and then uh, as well as the wattage and then the timer is going on so what we're going to look for is the temperature um, actually I'm not sure what the threshold is for the temperature on this um, Nagi if you can remind us yeah but what's the threshold in terms of if the temperature goes above a certain amount uh, then it will stop, the generator will stop. So, Amrita, what we'll do is as you're finishing this procedure, we'll go back to remember two. I think Monica Jay is ready with another case and then come back to you when you're putting in the stents, okay? Okay, sure. Dr. Nagi, we are changing the, the next case is a 30 year old male who presented with history of recurrent post prandial abdominal pain for two years and recent, uh, with recent onset of diabetes mellitus. On further evaluation, uh, this is the CT scan which showed it an atrophic pancreas with multiple radio opaque stones with a dilated PD. And uh, we can see the uh, floral image of uh, radio opaque stones. This patient underwent ESWL and now the plan is for ERCP plus pancreatic duct clearing plus CD stenting. The learning objectives of this session are to know the management of radio opaque PD stones, to know the role of ESWL and how to identify patients and the tips and tricks with the of the procedure. 
so this is large data from uh, AIG uh, of more than 5,000 patients. Uh, majority of them radiopaque stem. Uh, 85% of these patients required less than three sessions for the uh, fragmentation, and complete st stone clearance was achieved in only 73% of the cases. Before we actually go to the case, we will show you a video of what happened in this patient that extracorporeal shock with this. This is actually a very important component. Dr. You can Nagi. see multiple pancreatic calculi there. Dr. Nagi, yeah. one second. Um, uh, we just thank Dr. Ramesh Kumar and Dr. Shubhra for uh, moderating the previous session. We have now Dr. Rajesh Puri coming. Okay. And Dr. Goldie will be taking over for this. Uh, session okay, that. so as they're coming up, we'll just show the video of this extracorporeal shock polythetrypsy that is done in the patient. You can see the multiple pancreatic calculi, and unless you do this, you can't do an ERCP remove this calculi. Dr. Vinod here is focusing on these stones and then he's going to uh, use this extracorporeal. Usually, between five to 10,000 shocks are required in larger stones, but small stones, uh, even 5,000 is sufficient. We actually follow this extracorporeal shock wave, which is done under epidural anesthesia with ERCP either on the same day or the next day. This patient had it, I think, yesterday. So now it's, it's set up for an ERCP, and I'm sure once the stones are fragmented, you can see that we can uh, go in. And Monica is there along with Pablin to show us the final part of the procedure here. Monica? You are on the screen. Good afternoon. Uh, Good afternoon. I am Dr. Monica. With me, Dr. Pebelin, uh, very uh, experienced endoscopic technicians and the big team. Dr. Uh, Rakesh, Dr. Are, Dr. Goldie are here. Okay. This is a case of chronic pancreatitis who had ESWL done and now we are doing a pancreatic sphincterotomy and to clear the fragments which are there in the MPD. Dr. Dr. Nagi has already uh, told about the ESWL, which is the treatment of choice in patients who have chronic calcific pancreatitis with stones predominantly in head and body area. In those cases, ES, the stones which are more than 5 millimeter, they should directly go for ESWL and then clearance of uh, MPD should be done. I have just cannulated the pancreatic duct, you can see my guide wire, you show the chloro, busco pen. So, I am railroading my uh, sphincterotom inside and my guide wire is deep inside the pancreatic duct and uh, for cannulating pancreatic duct, we need to, the basic is from left to right and from above downward. This is the direction which we should take for cannulating main pancreatic duct. And for pancreatic sphincterotomy, the direction of cut should be in the 1 to 3 o'clock direction. So, we are, go, go please. So, we are cutting full bow. So, Dr. Monica, any, any tips regarding the pancreatic prophylotomy? Uh, pancreatic sphincterotomy, actually, uh, for pancreatic sphincterotomy, the direction should be between 1 and 3 o'clock. We should try to take clever cut uh, sphincterotom because the current dissipation is uh, not there, and uh, that is the endocut current is taken. Otherwise, the direction is the main thing which... And when do you decide to do the balloon spinteroplasty of the pancreatic spinter or you directly take the balloon or the basket for removing the uh, For pancreatic uh, endotherapy, I think spinteroplasty is must because directly doing uh, spinteroplasty or balloon dilatation that causes more risk of pancreatitis. So, some pancreatic sphincterotomy is required. So, we are doing sphincterotomy in the direction of... I don't know if the audience can appreciate the difference in the scout films from before and after. Um, the film that was shown by Dr. Reddy before, there was a significant stone burden and as you can see now, um, you don't see the large uh, opacities 
Uh, yeah, so this is the question. If you have seen the radio stones prior to USWL, and when you recheck with the fluoroscope and you don't find any stone, so would you like to go for an ERCP or ESWL? Yeah, okay, this is the right. That is a uh, very uh, good uh, question because if the stones are already uh, not there, uh, there is a uh, trial which shows that, that we can leave these patients without doing endotherapy. But definitely by adding ERCP and clearing, we are sure that we have removed all the particles. So, Dr. Monica, how do you define the success? Is it 80% clearance or you aim for 100%? How do you uh, do for your patients? We, we try for 100%, but in uh, I think in one session, 80 to 90% of these stones can be removed. Uh, uh, Ravleen, yes. we, we presented uh, some no, data no. because we have a lot no. of experience. If we clear more than 90% of the stone load, we call it good complete clearance. 50 to 90 is partial and less than 50 is incomplete or unsuccessful. That is how we are classified. Thank and you. It's been validated in three, four studies. Okay. So, approximately 5 to 7 millimeter syncotomy has been done. Now, I would like to dilate this area because in patients with chronic pancreatitis, sometimes in addition we have pre-papillary stenosis. Ha. The wire, you please change the wire. So how do you decide the size of the balloon for a spintoplasty? Pardon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you decide the size of the balloon for dilatation? 6 the millimeter, eight millimeter, eight millimeter, eight millimeter. Eight millimeter. Eight millimeter. Uh, that depends on the size of main pancreatic duct. If duct is dilated around 10 to 12 millimeters, generally dilatation can be done up to 10 millimeters safely. So I have exchanged my wire and put the balloon. I don't know if the audience noticed when the wire was going in, there was a huge, big, wide loop that was formed. That gives you an idea how wide the duct is in that area. Yeah, or a prior MRCP can guide, or a loop the wire can guide the size of the balloon. This pre-papillary stenosis, this part, if that is removed, the clearance of uh, hmm? pancreatic duct from fragments of uh, stones <coughs> is better. So, what by dilating it? the papilla, in this case, helps in uh, enlarging the papillary size as well as removing the pre-papillary stenosis, which is very commonly seen in patients with tropical pancreatitis. Another thing I would like to point is for those who don't perform ERCP and thinking about is Dr. Monica has a nice loop towards the tail of the wire. This is always good to have because it minimizes the risk of wire guided injury in the tail of the pancreas. If you have a loop, keep it, take it. Yeah, both for the uh, taking the wire deep inside the pancreatic duct to prevent going to the side branches. If the technician make a loop in the beginning, it is going to help you preventing the pancreatic episode. One important point here is instead of taking a uh, straight wire, if we take an angled wire, that is always better. And what size of the balloon you have taken? Is that this a is 4, four, four mm. Titan? Titan. Okay. Ajal Tamma, we go there. We good. Yeah. So I think after doing this, uh, we'll come back to Madhika because uh, I think uh, Madhura and uh, Mariana reached the lesion. Uh, in fact, uh, I think we'll go go to the spiral room, spiral endoscopy room. Yeah. So we are, uh, Mariana, we saw you doing some vigorous massage. And once uh, we get out the C, the shape of the duodenum and pass the trait angle, we uh, have to pass through it or not? No, no right? No, not even with the Maybe proof, right? Right? Uh, we, go, uh, we go very, very nicely uh, to the to the distal jejun, I would say. Uh, first, we saw a bit of uh, debris. So that's already a sign that there's something a baby obstructing downstream. And then we saw 
that the, 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 the mean, dilated, dilated. And then we found the, the stricture. It's a very the smooth stricture. Yes. Yes. And yes. a smooth one, very smooth. So I think here the, uh, the idea is to take biopsies. Does it look healthy enough for you to dilate? No, right? No, uh, no, no. I, I wouldn't dilate. We'll go to room. So you want to do um, Just biopsies, have to biopsies, biopsies and then uh, we have to see uh, to give him... Yeah. Active ulcerations uh, are there, mm -hmm. so you should avoid dilatation. Much yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. So I think that's a very nice picture, Madhra, that we're seeing, and uh, thank you for thank you, thank you. reaching that area. I think once the biopsy comes, we will get the answer for what the pathology is. Thank you very much, uh, Madhra thank and Madhra. So thank you very much. So Let we, give them a hand. Yeah. Reach the, yes. Work. Thank you. Like it hardly took any time. <laughs> that's so yeah. amazing. Thank you very much. So we'll go to, I think now we'll... Uh, go to room number one where uh, Amrita is ready. I think to, uh, ready for putting questions. And yeah, before that, maybe you want to see Monica. Maybe Amrita, you are on the screen. Okay, great. So what we did was we did the RFA, and then we also um, dilated with a four millimeter because it was pretty tight. So we tried to dilate on both sides. But one thing we're going to do now is just fix the wire. So. We had, we had lost one of the side wire access. We replaced it, but we're not really that happy with these wire placements right now. So we're just going to go back um, and place that second wire. And then our plan is to do um, a stent, uh, stent by stent, um, using the eight millimeter uh, diameter stent. Um, we can have a little discussion about that if there's time. But because the other option would be to do a stent in stent. Um, using the large cell um, diameter stent. I don't have a lot of experience with that, but would love to hear some thoughts on, in this case, you know, what, what we think would be, would be best. Dr. Amrita? Yes. Uh, MRCP shown in this case shows type 3 a block. Yeah. And the wire which is shown on the fluoroscopy is not 100% convinced that one wire is in the left ductal system. That's it right. may be an anterior ductal system which is going down. So, uh, how for the audience to learn that we are in the left ductal system only, uh, not in the lower down branch of the right anterior ductal system? Uh, yeah, so that, that's exactly why we're why we're repositioning it because we, we weren't as satisfied as with how we had the wires before. Um, so one way is to look again at your clangiogram. The other is to manipulate the fluoroscopy a little bit to help open up the ducts um, to make sure that you're going into the right system. We could also inject a little bit um, to really see where that takeoff is. Or you have an expert. Uh, technician here who's actually going to get us into the right duct. <laughs> um, so we're just playing around trying to get, we know that the takeoff okay. is somewhere yeah. around. So uh, Amrita will just go over to room number two where okay. I think Monica is finishing, finishing her case yeah. and then come back later. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Monica, you're on the screen. What we have yeah. done, we have done a pancreaticogram and we have uh, past a uh, balloon, there were a few small fragments which came out and now we are putting a pancreatic stand. This is the marker, radio opaque marker which we can see. They are making a loop in, inside the lumen. Huh. So what is the protocol you follow while doing the pancreatic box stenting? Slightly pull out. Uh, what I can see my End of my uh, stent is inside branch, so I am pulling out my stent. Dr. Monica? Yes. In a pancreatic duct structure, what protocol you follow for the stenting? For the benign pancreatic structures, we... Is it out? You see that up front? Okay, now it's out. It is a contrast. Oh, open, open. Oh, I think it's still there. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but now is it show the floro i think that that is a side is, branch which looks like a stent to me no no, no okay yeah. this is now this is okay yeah so the protocol what dr puri was asking for uh, benign pancreatic stricture we uh, put a stent and uh, there are two ways in which a single stent versus multiple plastic stents then uh, or putting a self expandable metallic stent so all these uh, they can be done for single stent the pain relief is in around 60 to 70% cases and for dilating the strictures we can put multiple plastic stents or we can uh, exchange these stents every 3 months for one year uh, or we can put directly self expandable metallic stent which uh, has a risk of migration but uh, uh, otherwise this is a very good stent to prevent migration there are bumpy stents also i don't have any personal experience with them dr nagi reddy sir said something about biodegradable stents also uh, in one of his uh, talks i have not used them personally so they can also be used for these cases thank you thank you monica and thank monica thank you for that excellent demonstration thank you sir. i think again a very good demonstration so we'll go to the next one where dr anuradha is ready with the history of the case that uh, robota did a very difficult case we did a, i think a full thickness resection they closed it uh, with a loop and uh, clips and uh, fantastic case so she is ready to install it now anuradha can you tell us what that was Uh, yes sir so this was the uh, gastric subepithelial uh, lesion which we have received first i would like to say the size of the lesion was 1.4 cm and if you see here this is uh, this is a circumscribed lesion uh, in the lower magnification which is infiltrating in between the splayed and thickened muscle fibers of muscularis mucosa into submucosa if we just go on to the higher magnification so the uh, the differential diagnosis was thought of as a gist but the morphology here is entirely that of a round cell lesion and um, the arrangement of these cells is in ness trabecular pattern and you have focal uh, rosettes there is not much of uh, atypia uh, and uh, if you go on to the next magnification uh, you can see that uh, atypia is minimal and they have uh, uniform round nucleus plasma cytoid appearance and uh, this is a so called stippled or the pepper chromatin uh, which we usually see in uh, some specific type of tumors and there was no necrosis so based on the morphology it looks like a well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor the mitotic figures were less than uh, 2 per 10 hyperfields there was no necrosis and uh, because of the size the size was more than 1 cm so irrespective of whether it involves the muscularis propria it falls into pt2 and if we saw the uh, low power images we saw that it was circumscribed and limited to the um, muscle so obviously here the the whatever margins which we have got here you can see the margins and the submucosal loose connective tissue and the blood vessels and they are free so that's why it was lighten up in the contrast ct complete tumor was lighten up in the ct it was not appear like a gist on the ct scan if you look at his ct scan films so that corroborate this could be neuro endocrine tumor also yeah yes sir so this is an nt and of course we have to do ki67 uh, for to further grade the tumor whether it was grade 1 or 2 or 3 because uh, based on ki67 the grade would change Uh, I am not able to hear, sir. I think it's excellent and so fast and quick result. And uh, thank you, thank, thank you, you, thank you. I think sir. this was thank very good. Yeah. So that it determines what we do next. So what uh, we'll do now is we'll uh, go to Amrita back again to see what she's doing with the wires. Uh, okay. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. So we are ha we have we were having a little debate. Um. There was a controversy about whether we should just do one stent or two stents. I firmly believe that we need to get at least a stent into the right side. Okay, okay that's, that's better. Good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Okay. All right. So coming out. Looks like you're waiting for us before the wire went in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's it? 
No. So, so yeah, what, um, Amrita and I are thinking that bilateral stem would be a good idea in this case, especially on the right side when we have a difficult time trying to get the wire through. So, what what do you guys think? No, I think no, we must, no, yeah, no, it's a good idea, but we must inject, yeah, okay, we can see that now. It's communicating, but still, I think it'll be good to put in, yeah, you can put in, if you can get in two, it'll be good. But this looks yeah. like the entire right system, the yeah, entire right system, system. yeah, yeah. And if you're going to use scans, I'll lose the things. No, I think uh, if you can put it, they can put in maybe even three also, doesn't matter, but basically we'll be draining more than 50% of the liver if we can drain these segments, I think. And which one will you put first, Amrita? Um, I would, if we think both of these are into the right, I would put the one. Yeah, here we go. That's where, anterior. Yeah. 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 Uh. Withdraw? Okay. So, the... um, so usually I would put the one that has the more of an angulation first. So yeah. that's the le left-sided one. The left-sided one. And actually, then, that, that is segment 4, I think. Segment 4, which yeah, is I actually think, draining yeah. into the right uh, I right think it track, probably yeah. is. Yeah. If we really have a hard time, I guess we could just do one stent. No, but uh, I think if you put one on the right side and one in segment 4, that will drain 50% of the yeah, I, think okay. so, yeah. Yeah. I think that's an important point that you're making. Um, yeah. Can you hear And that's why I'm about putting the two stents. Yeah. And what uh, technique you are going to say patient require a reintervention. <laughs> So how we are going to place the two stand that second intervention is required in the future can be taken care of. So if you can guide the audience for this. You want me to place this? Um, as as Amrita is, is, is um, trying to get the wire in, maybe I can just um, help answering that question. Um, we were planning to put um, uh, side by side bilateral stands, and I think that is um, easier to come back and do re-intervention if need to. Um, we, you know, we, we, we discussed the, uh, the advantage and disadvantages of doing side-by-side -side stent placement and uh, stent instant placement. Yeah, and as Prableen said yesterday, sometimes there can be more pain with the stent side-by-side. -side. Um, however, I think we'll use, a smaller di we'll use a smaller diameter. And one thing that I like to do when I do side-by-side -side is to, yeah, is to actually load both stents onto the wires so that the second stent is ready to go as soon as you come out with the catheter. Yeah. Um, again, going with the leftward going stent um, first so that you you um, don't have to struggle with the curvature. Hold on one sec. And also one of the things that we learned over years is that when you look at MRCPs, we generally look at uh, one uh, reconstructed image. But it's better to look at both coronal, coronal and sagittal sections separately in a dynamic way. Yeah. And we often see that the, uh, the intrahepatic yeah. segments are very different from what is conventionally described. Uh, spot. So we get anatomy then and then it becomes easy to know which duct to go into. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no. Eight, yeah. eight by eight by ten. So, um, uh, right, right now we are uh, selecting the stents. So, what, what we would like to do is to put a smaller diameter stents, um, side by side, and that you know that that um okay. that's, that's going to be like eight millimeter diameter stents. Yeah. That, that's what we want. Um, and uh, I think that so we're gonna we're just gonna pull. So we're gonna use the Taiwu stent. Right. Um. And one thing I, I was just going to comment before on what you were saying, even if this is entirely the right system, I think that's an important distinction to make um, when you're talking about, that's the marker for the end of the stent. Okay. Yeah. Um, when you're talking about what percentage, you know, like, bi it's not really bilateral, right? It's, it's a ductal. Um, right. Because oftentimes you can place three stents even into the same system. It's a question of, what percentage of the liver you're going to drain and you know there's always um, anatomical abnormalities can we load the other stent on here uh, same size so now we're using um, 10 by 80 right 10 by 80 10, 10, 10 by 80 millimeter millimeter stents and we're going to load uh, two stents and eight millimeter I'm sorry, by 10 eight millimeter by 10 and we're going to load two stents at the same time so before we deploy, we'll just have the second stand ready to go. And for in terms of thinking about the length, um, you remember that all 
uncovered stents tend to foreshorten about 30 percent. So in terms of where we'll place that the end of the stent, can we open, uh, can we change the floor a little bit so that we can open that duct up? Can you, uh, do you want them to magnify it a little bit? No, I just want them to turn it. Oh, can, can you rotate the floor just a little bit? In this case, any advantage of putting the two strand in the right ductal system? I'm sorry? Any added advantage of putting the two strand or we can go ahead with the one strand also? Yeah, that's the discussion that we were having. Um, because my worry is that in the future, if the patient has a blocked strand, uh, yeah. Mm, Maybe so we should. The procedure will be difficult if we put a one stand. Both, both, both of these wires now look like they're in the same system, basically. Um, so I, I guess we can just proceed with one. If the left becomes obstructed, you could always do an EUS guided um, hepatico-gastrostomy. So maybe we'll just proceed with this stent. How does? What do you think? I think one stent will be sufficient. Yeah, okay. we could. Although we need to go. So we're just trying to understand the markers here. Um, I think we are high enough, certainly. Well, the, the marker is not out yet, I think. Can, can you lower the uh, the floor just a little bit so that we can see the tip of the scope, so we can see the distal mark? I don't see the yellow here, anyway. Yeah. Uh, okay, there, there you go, there okay. you go, yeah. All right, okay. so we're, we're going to start here. Okay, so go ahead, start. So I'm just putting, oh, stop. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, Rapid is over. One stent is getting deployed. Only one stent. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So I'm just keeping this yellow marker, it's just the end of the stent, just in view. Okay, all right. Okay, I think Amita, great job. Thank you very much. So, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So what we do is we'll go to another room where uh, Dr. Pablin is waiting with an interesting case. Yeah, can you have the history there? Okay. The stent looks like it's in second. Can you go to the history, please? Yeah. The next case is a 33-year-old need. His main case of recurrent acute pancreatitis since two years. His uh, bilirubin is normal. OTPT is mildly elevated. ALP is normal. This is the MRCP image showing the type 1 pancreas division and prominent CBD. Uh, the EOS image showed was suggestive of total bilopathy. There are small esophageal varices and multiple pericolodocal peripancreatic collaterals. The many, uh, so the plan for this case is to do an ERCP and PD stent through the minor papilla. The many objectives are to understand the approach to symptomatic pancreas division and the technique of minor papilla carnivation and spintrotomy. Uh, this is a systematic review of 838 patients which showed a response to endoscopy in 528 patients um, that is 63% of, of the cases with symptomatic pancreas division. Over to Dr. Prabhuji for demonstration. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay. So um, uh, I'm here um, in in my uh, with a new team. I have Dr. Shubha, uh, co-pilot, and then we have Dr. Bhargavi, Dr. Aisha, uh, helping with anesthesia. Mr. Santosh, we have two Mr. Santosh helping me with the uh, with the wire manipulation. So I would like to start by the scope position here, as you notice, um, you know, when we are doing uh, the minor work, you know, you, you go directly into the duodenum, you are not reducing your endoscope. You stay in a long scope position, and oftentimes you see the minor papilla about two-folds proximal to the major. I'll show you major down there. I hope you guys can appreciate it. It's at like at 7 o'clock position. 
Um, so this is the most conducive way of, uh, of finding the minor papilla. In this case, I think I'm fortunate. I was able to find the minor papilla. Sometimes it's just a pinhole opening and you can uh, try a variety of techniques um, in order to find it, uh, including secretin. Uh, I've also used endoscopic ultrasound. I've even gone down with the EUS into the duct, injected method in blue to see if it comes out. Or you can do EUS guided rendezvous. Uh, you can use mini probes. So a variety of techniques that you can use to find the minor papilla. In this case, you can op uh, appreciate a slight opening here in a, uh, in a front area. So uh, let's advance the wire. So we're going to do wire guided cannulation. Mr. Santosh, advance the wire. Prabhleen, let us have a fluoro to see the long loop position here. Okay, can you see it? No, yes, that's the long Perfect. Loop. And you are already in the tail. Yes. Right, we are. So, you know, I didn't uh, meet a whole lot of resistance advancing my sphintrotome in it. Sometimes it's extremely tight where you're not able to advance the, uh, the catheter, cannula, and sphintotome. In this case, it doesn't look like that's the case. Actually, the dorsa didn't look all that dilated. I would like to hear the opinion from uh, Dr. Shubra and the people in the panel um, in the audience. I personally feel I think if the dorsal duct is more dilated, they tend to respond more, especially patients with ARP, compared to a non-dilated duct. So what are your thoughts? Go up a little bit. That's true, ma'am. It's 60% if dilated, 40% if it's a normal duct. Pancreatic, pap, minor papilla sphincter. Little more bow. But also depends upon uh, if you demonstrate recurrent attacks of acute pancreatitis, raised amylase lipase, there's 80% chance that these people will respond with respect to the duct size. The only 100% positivity is if there's a centenary seal. If there's anniversary, you can be very, very sure that this patient is going to respond definitely to spintrotin. But oh, I think all the way. Uh, sometimes, uh, like uh, what Pablin said, uh, very tight resistance, and then you do a spintrotin, they do respond very well. Yeah. Yeah, even in the okay. non-dilated duct, doing a minor papilla spintrotin, they help. So another question that we have is, do I really need to inject contrast in there? I mean, I think the MRCP was so beautiful. I personally don't feel strongly yeah. about injecting the dye. I'm very comfortable wire is into the tail. As long as we maintain the position, I'm okay leaving the stent in. What are your thoughts? No, ma'am. I always prefer taking a real-time pancreatogram and then deciding that what length of the Little length bit. and what diameter of the stent yeah. would be. The problem, uh, we, people in the panel think. Yeah, we also don't inject problem. If you have a very clear cut, uh, because if there's a danger of the wire being in a side branch, the next That's blood said we sometimes would inject. But if you're very clear like this, Spiral. we don't inject. We just pick yeah. up it. If the duct is not dilated, we don't inject. If the duct is dilated, MRCP can miss the small stones. Correct. In this situation, we put the dye and we do a cleaning of the... Uh, pancreatic yeah. duct. The question to you is important. Like so you is lucky when you find yeah, a very good minor papilla. That's good. But what other accessories you use Ready for exchange. while cannulating the minor papilla? Seven ten is good. Um, so yeah, so this is you know usually I start with the my my sphincterotome actually. So if that doesn't work, you can uh, you can try the cannula balloon because this this is a straight shot. Uh, actually, I've used the balloon for cannulation as well, and then of course the Kremer catheter, which takes a one-eight wire only. So those are the usual tools that I go for. Um, and then there's a question of: Do you do freehand needle knife if you are not able to get in? Uh, which yes, I have. If I'm very comfortable that this is the minor, um, I'm 100% sure this is the minor. If nothing goes in, uh, you can do the freehand pre-cut in that situation. Um, any other thoughts? So we are just ready to put the stent in. I think uh, we are going to put in a 710 um, with internal flap, ex uh, external pigtail. And we are going to uh, push this stent with the balloon. How often do you um, come across a uh, spontaneous migration of the stent from the pancreatic duct? So the question is, how often do we see spontaneous migration? Of course, if you're dealing with a short stent without internal flap, the migration rate is going to be high. I did an RCT looking at five versus three, five without internal flap, migration rate was 95%. So it depends upon the length of the stents. 
caliber of the stent, uh, whether they have internal flap or not. So this is a 710, fairly long, with internal flap. The chances of this migrating out are fairly low. So you choose a 10 centimeter stand, the length of the stand, how you decide when you leave the lunar papilla so I uh, wire out. Um, so again, the goal should be, you shouldn't be leaving anything at the genu. You know, you want to put the stent, uh, leave the uh, proximal end of the stent into the straighter part of the duct. So I've gone with the 77789, Yes, absolutely. So we just had a 710 out and I went with that. So last few tips while doing the pancreatic uh, cannulation, what is your uh, tips? Position of the scope, using the accessories, manipulation, what is your take home on that? So I'm sorry for the minor? Or uh, for the minor, for the minor. Oh, for the cannulation. Oh, for the manipulation. Oh, yeah. So I think, I mean, as we saw, uh, this this was fairly simple and easy. We saw it um, for the minor papilla. It's more of a straight shot compared to when we are doing the uh, major papilla work. Um, and I wouldn't recommend sticking with one accessory for long periods of time. If, the, if you are noticing that you're not able to get in, I would quickly uh, go to plan B or C. We talked about different accessories that I would use starting from sphincterotome moving to the cannula, moving to the criminal, or to a balloon. Uh, and to finally, I, I leave the freehand pre-cut for the last. And um, probably, we, I feel that in case the opening is very small in a small papilla, buscopan always helps, it steadies the duodenum and it's easier to then carry. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, anytime we are, we are working at the uh, papillary orifice, you want to have a clear view uh, if there is, uh, you know, uh, some bubbly stuff, you, we use amethicone uh, and, of course, we use uh, glucagon or buscopan to arrest the motility. Uh, those are the ancillary stuff we use. And if you are not sure where the orifice is, we give secretin, which is a weight-based dose. Um, and uh, you spray methylene blue before you give the secretin so you are ready to see where it is clearing out. Maintain in a long scope position. Stay two folds proximal to the major papilla in the area vicinity that we showed and then if nothing is working switch to EUS at that point so oftentimes we consent the patient for possibility of EUS guided rendezvous in these cases thank you thank you for the nice demonstration and our discussion thank you so much guys thank you thank you Prem, for a very nice smooth demonstration thank you guys so we go on to another room thank you uh, well uh, Nagi, we'll, yeah we're having a change of guard here okay we'll wait for it thank you Rajesh thank you Goldie thank you. For the last change, session, change. may I request Dr. Kyle, please. Kyle is from the SRM Institute, Chennai, and with her, Dr. Manohar Reddy from Asian Institute of Gastroenterology will take the chair. Okay. Okay. Manohar and uh, Kyle are okay. on the stage. Nagi, we can start. Okay. Okay. So we'll talk to We'll go to Reem through. Reem is ready now. Please, please. This is a 40-year-old male with alcohol use disorder who presented with recurrent pain, abdomen, and weight loss for four months. On evaluating further, his MRCP showed chronic pancreatitis. The CD was dilated with radiopaque small calculus in the pancreatic head. Uh, deep cannulation by ERCP failed. Uh, the EOS was done, which showed an atrophic pancreas with, uh, in the PD, uh, and the PD head stone with upstream dilated PD. So the plan for this case is an EOS guided PD drainage. In this multi-center uh, study, uh, they found uh, 80 patients that underwent EOS PD. Uh, they had a technical success of 89% and clinical success of 81%, and immediate adverse events occurred in 20% of the cases. Over to Dr. Reem for demonstration. Reem, you are on. Oh, my God. Um, yeah. So, on. turn over here. Yeah, mic, Reem. Mic is not in position. Can you? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Oh? Uh, uh, when she body. talks, I'll be able to tell you, but I can say hello. Yes, hello. Hello. 
I've got the bell under my finger anyway. Okay. So I was saying that you guys, the room turnover is faster than anything. The patient's not asleep, but the scope is down. Um, I'm just trying to find the pancreas. Hang on. So you heard the story, um, and the um, the uh, uh, the two different ways of trying to access the pancreatic duct is either um, is either through uh, uh, a rendezvous technique, or we can place a stent to integrate. I'm just suctioning fluid from uh, air from the stomach to try and get a be better visualization of, of, of anything. Yeah, if I can see the antrum. So here's kidney, and there's, there's the pancreatic duct should be here. It's like not... Yeah, can I turn him a little bit? Yeah, so I'm having trouble just pushing into the, yeah, he has a big J-shaped stomach. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, Anatomy 101, <laughs> trying to find the different stations. So here we go. So, I mean, key thing here is that we could obviously see the kidney um, and the, the pancreas should be just above it. There we go. Maybe. So, it's going to be really easy. This guy doesn't have a pancreas. Correct. Yeah. And that's Correct. why we couldn't get in. We assume it's going to be a trophic. With just the so duct here. to be seen. Yeah. You'll have a bigger duct, lesser parenchyma, you know. Yeah. One would hope. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Left adrenal already. No, it should be. So I've also realized my eyesight that, is bad. There. That's the one. That's it. Yeah, let's do this. Is magnification? Shall I just adjust the focus yeah. as well? Yeah, that would be focus good. at the right point. Yeah, that's it. So here we go. Mm. So that's we can one. see the duct here very. Um, But I was told it was a little bit of a bigger duct. There we <laughs> We'll magnify it to make it bigger. And then do you want to put flow and a show with yeah. an arrow where it is? So you can see it just... Ideally, what diameter below which you shouldn't attempt a U.S. guided procedure? So I don't think there's any, uh, let's take that off. I don't think there's any um, any guidance on, on that. It's what you feel comfortable with. We've done four or five millimeter ducts. The key thing is you can access it and then just try and inject fluid in there um, to make the duct a little bit bigger. I, I don't know if I can get a good angle here. It's... But I'm just not seeing it as nice there. Like I see it here, and then it's, uh, I'm just trying to trace it uh, into the genu. And it should go down, but it disappears here a little bit. This turn. I don't know if I could turn him maybe a little bit more left lateral. Um, uh -huh. It'll help me a little bit better. So, me and, me and I was thinking that if you can't see this back, maybe it's getting decompressed. You want to try the ERCP route once? See? That's, yeah, that's actually a good point because maybe 
when you did you saw yeah. the, so the pictures maybe the the wire through it yeah, uh, opened yeah. it up a little bit because it was thing. an eight millimeter duct and yeah. i'm not that bad at eus <laughs> <laughs> i would see it that yeah no, because uh brother i said who did the pre previous time for this patient says that he saw a nice big duct yeah so here yeah so the here the following the stones it, in the yeah following you can the see here the stones, stones a little yeah. bit on the duct but there's no big duct so i think it got decompressed after the previous year so okay. i think what well still if you can't get this way to do a side wing and see yeah. yeah, if you can okay. get in that way i love that suggestion <laughs> okay <laughs> so let's do that so yeah. while they are changing we'll go to the other room nagi they are changing the scope yeah so we'll uh, we'll do that. Uh, I think in room we have one room number two life. where uh, <laughs> wa there's a one case. Like, with, look uh, like smile. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. Okay. So we'll go to the history now in this patient room number two. I think um, G is being pushed hurriedly to do this case, so she's getting ready. So we'll yeah go. We have a computer here. He had history of acute necrotizing pancreatitis six months ago. He has history now of recurrent pain in abdomen with weight loss and intermittent fever for two months. Uh, his uh, hemogram showed leukocytosis. Uh, this is the CECT image which shows a large band in the distal body of the pancreas extending into the lesser sac and the left subdiaphragmatic region with chronic SMV thrombosis. On the right, we can see the EUS image. The plan for this patient is to do an EOS guided uh, sister gastrostomy. The learning objectives in this case is, uh, in this session is to know the tips and tricks to perform this procedure and uh, to understand the endoscopic management of pancreatic fluid collections. In this uh, international uh, multi center study published in endoscopy, 189 patients underwent LAMS placement. Uh, and plastic stem placement, and they found that the technical success rate was comparable in both the groups. Uh, but the rate of LAM recurrence following the initial clinical success was greater in the plastic stem arm as compared to the LAM arm. The demonstration of this session will be done by uh, Dr. G. Over to you, Doctor. Dr. G. Bang, you are on. Oh, hello. Yes. So um, this gentleman has um, a ward of necrosis. We are going to go down and take a look at this collection together. We have Dr. Saleh with us today. Um, we are going to figure out how we're going to drain this ward of necrosis. Just bear with me as I go through the G junction. So, uh, all right. So we've reached the proximal stomach. Nope. How do I change the viewer switch button? Oh, perfect. Thank you. All right. So, all right. So this collection is supposed to be in the distal body, so we should be able to see it from the gastric lumen. Figure this out first. All right. Um, so let's take a look. So this collection, I can see it fleeting into view. There it is. So we are quite close to the G junction at the moment. So let me see if there's a better window. G junction at 40, I'm at like 41, 42. So just in case this patient needs a necrosectomy, um, we want to try and put it as distal into the stomach as possible. Um, but if we can only go proximal, then we have no choice. So here we go. Oh, now we can see what you want. Yeah. I'm just gonna decrease the depth and yeah. we'll take a look. So there is some solid component. It's a nice collection, has a nice wall around it. I'm just gonna put some flow on, make sure there's no intervening vessel. Uh, 
Okay. And I always like to examine Okay. Yeah. So, Dr. G, what do you prefer, metallic or plastic stent? Yeah, so I think in the interest of time, more than likely we'll just put in an Axio stent. Um, like we discussed earlier in the lecture, there's no difference. We could yeah. go either way. Um, and I like to do a full exam um, for every pseudocyst we drain. As you know, you can get pseudocysts or of necrosis collections with malignancy, so I think a full exam is important. Um, so I'm in the bulk now. Any questions or comments from the moderators? No, no. I think you should be participating. Yes. Uh, since this patient has fever in his clinical symptoms, do you consider uh, endonecrosectomy also in the first session when you place the lamps? Could you repeat that for me? I can't hear. Can I have the volume loud possible? Vol volume louder? I can't hear the moderators at all. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to have the screen closer? Uh, oh, if can you the screen you the closer? No, the uh, question also is, if you have fever, would you like to do necrosectomy in the first sitting itself? or yeah. just put a cystrogastrostomy? I think, again, for the interest of time today, we'll just put in a stent um, and we'll see how that goes. The patient can have a necrosectomy if needed at a later time. So always first session, just a stent placement? Uh, no, nobody really knows the answer to that question. So um, until our study results are fully analyzed, we won't really know. I think it's at the moment depends on personal preference at this stage. Um, if there's a lot of necrosis that's occluding the lumen of the uh, axios, I like to do a necrosectomy because I know that the uh, lumen will get occluded. Uh, uh, can we otherwise... request the control room to show us the endo view also that's getting hidden under the camera? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's very proximal though, it's the problem. Okay, all right, Axios, thank you. So, Dr. G, what is the size that you choose for this case? Yeah. The size of a stent? So, thank you. We have a 20 millimeter diameter Axios. Could someone pass, push the pedal towards my foot? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Could you hold this for me while I turn to me? Thank you. All right. Okay, so again, yeah. we're going to check with flow. Can you put Doppler on, please? Check with vessels. This looks not bad. Okay. Yeah. You can put the watery on. Thank you. Could you hold the scope for me? So it's kind of very good. All right. So I like to make sure the most important thing is make sure the axios is on tightly. The design of this is such it doesn't sometimes sit properly on the scope. So that's what you want to make sure you want to be stable. Thank you. Uh, if needed, you want someone bracing your scope so you're closest to the gastric wall as possible. There's yeah. a question from the audience. Uh, what is the diameter of the uh, 20 lines? millimeter axios? Yeah. All right, you can see the catheter tip coming in the corner. Yeah. All right, and so the important thing is that you apply cautery. We're applying the pad. And one more thing to make a note of is that um, you give antibiotics for this procedure. If this collection is not infected now, it will get secondarily infected after you intervene. Okay, ready? All right. Okay. So the important thing to remember when you're applying cautery is that you want to press the pedal and then press the pedal down. Oh, okay.
Ready? Okay. So thank you very much. So what we'll do is press on the pedal and then we'll just gently go through the wall. Good. Okay. I like to put this down quite deep. As you know, Axios, when you, when you deploy it, once you deploy the Proxima flange, has a tendency to migrate up. So I want to check where the tip of the catheter is. Got it. Thank you so much. And then we're going to deploy the proximal flange nice and slowly. Okay. And then I'm going to come out a little bit. Good. Then we're going to try and go endoscopic view. There we go. And for cases like this, we have a lot of room and it's a necrotic collection, so I know. that there's a lot of room. I like to look for the black mark. Okay, hold the screen for me. Thank you. Yeah, hold it. Then now it's locked. I'm going to deploy the distal flange. You can let go. Very good. Okay, and they like to push out the flange and they just gently pull back. So as you can see, the deployment of the stent is quite proximal, um, which may be a bit of an issue but it's straining. Uh, so let me see how this looks. What I like to do in this situation is go down with a gastroscope and really check the position and make sure. Um, I, we can, I tend not to, but with this position might not be a bad idea. I suspect that food and things will go into the axios, but yeah, we can. Would you like to put a pigtail for migration and support? Um, so um, I usually don't, um, okay. but because of the position of the stent being so proximal and right at the GE junction, I think it's probably not a bad idea. I think when he eats, I think food might migrate into the collection. So, yeah, we can. I think with the angle of this, uh, angle of this, um, camera i think i might change over to gastroscope so i can get a better view and we'll do can you get me a 1t scope so you want to use a 1t because you want to make sure a seven french stent will go through okay and i like to suck uh, i send a uh, sample of the collection for culture and we'll push uh, we'll pass the gastroscope down and we'll just take a look to see exactly where the stent is and then we'll put in a plastic stent um, just because I think um, food and things will migrate into the collection. Okay. So if you want to come back, go to a different room and come back. We'll Fine. have it ready. We'll go to the next room. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so, gee, that was a fantastic job. No? Very nicely done. Made it look very simple. Yes. She may put a plastic stand later, Nagi. Yeah, so what yeah. we do is, I think we'll go to yeah. see what oh, uh, Neem is doing. Yeah. yeah, so room number one. So Neem, yeah. with you. Yeah. yeah, so what we've done is we went uh, into the minor and, oh my God, <laughs> we just needed to hear your voice. <laughs> um, so we went into the minor, we injected and you can see that the duct is very dilated, yeah. super tight stricture at the minor. Excellent <laughs> job. Um, obviously, we have excellent people in the room. Um, and uh, yeah, you can see we got in, but it's actually su very tight. I can't even get the tome in. Oh my God, so tight. So you want to try a 6.5 cystotome and then you can dilate the stricture so with that? To dilate through? Yeah, because I think uh, the stent don't go through, which is very tight. So if you probably use a sister room and dilate, then you can put up a stent. So I can't hear what you said? Uh, no, I was thinking that if you dilate the stricture with a sister tome, if you can't, then you can probably put in a stent. Otherwise, it will be difficult to get a stent through this. Yeah, I can't tight. even get the tome across. Yeah, the so tome is so, so tight. Yes. So we can either try, I mean, these tight strictures... Um, the different things that we would use. Obviously, we don't have a system available in the state, so what I would try is a 4 millimeter.
working. If that okay. doesn't work, um, okay. Sahendra screw uh, or uh, Sahendra dilator. But uh, I'm happy to do whatever. I but, think they'll have a bougie there, uh, Reem. You can try push in a bougie. Okay. Uh, I think uh, the easiest would be sister problem, but you know, you'll decide. I think it's a sister term. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And with burn it? Yeah. Burn it, burn it. The cutting current, yeah. Okay. Wait, floral? Yeah. Okay, I, I panicked for a second. I thought I lost all the wire. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> So just go in. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, you you sort of distended the duct now with the screen. Yeah. So we had to pray a little bit and use a lot of good. <laughs> yeah. Your job is not over yet. <laughs> All right. All right. So here we know that the stricture is at this point here. I'm just going to go as close as possible, and then we're connected. It's the pure cut, and I'm going to go in and a little bit of tension. Yeah. Actually, is it hooked up properly? It's um. So the other thing is, remember, we're using a busy glide wire. I've heard that with the sister tone, it's not work. It doesn't work as well. So, any suggestions from? Yeah, maybe Swahendra screw. This doesn't work. Swahendra screw is something that. Oh, I'm going. Yeah, I think you're going. I'm going very slowly, and I think I'm waking the patient. Up. Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. All right, we got okay, in. Yeah, yeah. So that's fantastic. Uh, we can just go in a little bit, and we should. Um, you think just a stent should we dilate first? No, I think we dilate. I think yeah, and let's do a four milliliter yeah, hurricane. Yeah. Uh, or a four milliliter bougie. And so now we're doing an exchange again. And then, um, I mean, this duct is very dilated. When would you use a metal stent here? Would you just go straight for plastic here? Would you? Uh, we, we actually have been trying to use bumpy stents. Sometimes bumpy stents are very helpful here. This is a Korean stent made from Tevo. Okay. If maybe if you want to try but it. Now, okay, yeah, yeah we, we should try it because I think it's a good indication for this. Yeah. There's a really tight stricture. It's a minor papilla. The duct is very dilated. Yeah. Um, and it may be a good indication uh, for that. We've, we've shown in a small U.S. series that, you know, the 10 and 8 millimeter also works, but, um, you know, Obviously, when you do it in the major papilla, you have to make sure that, uh, okay, we're in, uh, that you dilate the, um, uh, that you do a biliary stent at the yeah. same time. Yeah. So you can see a little bit contrast, and now we're going to dilate. Okay. So sometimes I like just to pull back just to see. So it's still tight, but it's uh, it's it's nice here. So before you came on camera, we also tried to um, go through the major, but there was complete disruption. Um, so it may have been an incomplete divism because it wasn't a very obvious divism. So which, no, can we put the other the Taiwan scent? Fully covered, completely covered. Bumpy. So we're going to go get the scent uh, across. So we typically um, would give this patient also indomethacin <laughs> and a lot of fluid in the recovery area. All right. So I'm just doing a slow exchange. Oops. Wait. 
So you want to make sure the position stays stable as well. So what? So um, uh, Reem, what do you think happened in this case? Why was the duct not visualized in the EAS and but when you put in contrast, so it has probably collapsed at that point of time? Yeah, and then uh, as soon as we put in contrast, I was like, oh, maybe I should go back and do a rendezvous now. <laughs> Um, so I think it had collapsed. I had heard uh, that also um, he also underwent an as well four days ago. Yeah so, yeah. so I think that may have also decompressed the duct further. Yeah. Um, but it made it easier to get in today. So it's like good and bad at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, I thought maybe I couldn't see the pancreas and I needed to go back to US 101. <laughs> yeah. Maybe there's another case for USPD later. A fully covered, right? The bumpy is, is yeah, fully, fully covered. It's fully covered. So you don't believe as well? I take it in the fact that you might close or block off side branches. I think in such a dilated duct. No, in, no, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. And then also, I think uh, we've had a huge experience with this, and also the Korean group. Uh, more than uh, one, we, I think we have had about 150 cents. Uh, it doesn't block the, they, we have actually used to, for a short period of time the regular covered stents which we are using for billion stenting. And one of the problems with that was the end of the stent is flayed in such a way that invariably there is damage to the pancreatic duct at that stage. Some fibrosis, secondary strictures. So when we remove the stent, we would have secondary strictures. But this stent is constrained. Uh, in such a way that the distal part is having a silicon coating so that uh, it doesn't cause this type of damage. Any, so, okay. Yeah, yeah, so. And then typically I've left these stents in for six, exactly. six, six months. months or so. Yes, Sometimes yes. you can leave them up to a year. Yes. We're just going to go uh, get the stent. Yes. I think the room turnover is faster than finding the yeah. stent. That's so, one, one thing. <laughs> yeah, so they, as they're getting the stent room, what we'll do is we'll go to... Oh, Ready. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I should say now I want to win the lottery and then maybe <laughs> this will happen. <laughs> okay. So, so, yeah, so maybe the camera can zoom on that. You can see the, yeah, I'm mean, just a sec. So we're using a, a six, yeah, yeah, yeah. six centimeter by um, a ten, ten millimeter yeah. Uh, yeah. stent. I mean, the duct diameter is almost ten millimeter. So it should be okay. So as, uh, yeah, once you put it, then we... And then the key thing here is obviously to see the markings so that we don't... Uh, yeah. Can we show the other image in the meantime, Dr. Sambi? The, the side branch dilatation with the multiple calculi? Okay. Oh, yeah, you could definitely do that. <laughs> yeah. So you can see here, it obviously ah. straightened up okay. really, really nicely. Before uh, we came on camera, we tried different wires uh, and different tomes to get in. Um, all right. So use, usually using a little bit of slow push and sometimes use the shaft maneuver to push it up even more. So I am just... It's got a nice tapered tip, so you see how it's yeah, I like one that. advantage of this, yeah. All right, so it's now the key thing is we want to make sure we see the end. This is the middle, so there's, a, there's actually a marker in the middle also. If you're seeing now, that's just going up and it's at the length of the structure. So we have a lot of room. Yeah. Okay. This also shortens by one third, so you probably have to have a little thing outside now. Yeah. So... Um, so that's a good point. So now we see where the centers, you see the proximal flange, and it's going to probably move forward, so I'm going to yeah. pull back. I think the wire has to push it a little more. Sula has to push the wire a little more. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good, good. Yeah. Yep. All right. So as he's pulling, uh, uh, deploying it, I'm. Uh, you're yeah. going to see it open, and I'm going to pull back. Hmm. No. So we're just opening it, but sometimes if it's too tight, yeah, it takes, it takes oh, oh, okay, all right, keep 
Keep going. You pull back. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, now I need to pull back more. This is made in such yeah. a way that uh, this tent uh, has got unequal pressures of uh, tightness around it. So it has got areas which get very tight and yeah, some yeah. areas are okay, very... Keep going. Yeah. Okay, stop. Yeah, keep going. I'm pulling back now. Huh? Which one? Yeah. No, no, bump. So it's a little bit yeah. of a dance yeah. with me to try and make sure that you're okay, very nice. Very nice. Fantastic job. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Very nice uh, job. I think with this patient definitely will have good relief now. So, okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very Reen much. And we will go on to the room. Yeah, G is ready with a case in room 4. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we have the clinical history of this patient. We have a 35 year old male with class 3 obesity with a BMI of 42 with obstructive sleep apnea. We have investigations are unremarkable. His liver stiffness is 9.2 kilopascal. Autonomous hepatitis workup is negative. He has failed dietary and lifestyle interventions and not willing for surgery. He used to be an EOS guided liver biopsy followed by intragastric balloon placement. This is a meta-analysis showing the efficacy of EOS by the liver biopsy. 94% of the people have some successful histological diagnosis with very minimal adverse events. And 19 gate needle, FMA needle provides significant better biopsy specimens compared to other core biopsy needles. And this RCT has shown new body body weight loss with around 15% of 32 weeks using adjustable intragastric balloons. And intolerance causing the removal of the device was seen in only 17% of the patients. Over to Dr. G. Hello. Um, hi again. So we are going to be doing an EOS guide liver biopsy um, for this patient. Um, so um, I will tell you from my experience that I think the most important thing when doing a liver biopsy is make sure you don't do a splenic biopsy. It has happened um, with sometimes fatal consequences. Um, so what I like to do is um, take a look at find the liver, which obviously is easy to find. We're at the proximal stomach um, and you're just going to rotate clockwise. And here this gentleman has quite a fatty liver. You can tell by the hyperechoic um, uh, hyper nature of the liver. And I always like to take a look at the spleen as well to make sure it looks different. So here, I've already taken a look. Actually, the spleen is easier to see in this gentleman. It's the spleen here. And you can see why it can be quite confusing. They can look very similar, especially if the patient has chronic liver disease or cirrhosis. So we are back to our liver. Next important thing to remember is to make sure you're avoiding major vessels. So here you can see tiny little structures. So we're going to apply flow and just make sure they are not vessels. So here, um, so I just want to avoid this three o'clock area. And I think this is a good spot to go. So the technique wise, um, there is some variability in what is performed. I think they probably perform all similarly. What I like to use in our 19 gauge FMB needle. So the acquire or shark core, I think, are pretty probably quite similar. I have a 19 gauge Aquine needle here. Uh, what do you like to use? Um, I generally use 22 gauge needle and I use um, a wet heparin okay. suction technique. Yeah, what, what do you what do you do? So I like to keep it simple as always. So I just use a 19 gauge FNB needle because radiologists use 16 gauge. So um, when we did our randomized trial with 19 gauge FMB and compared it with percutaneous liver biopsy from IR, um, they were superior in terms of being able to um, get adequate tissue, be able to stage degree of fibrosis, um, etc. So I used the largest needle size available to us, which is 19 gauge for EUS. And then uh, I just use a regular technique. I don't do, I try not to fan in the liver. 
um, and uh, I don't use any wet suction. Um, as the tech is pulling out the stylet, naturally there's a little bit of a slow pour technique, um, but we will see how this goes. So you're going to check where the needle's coming out. As you can see, it's here. With the 19 gauge, always it's, the needle's always a little stiffer. I always have someone brace the scope to make sure we don't bounce back. Sometimes the capsule can be difficult to puncture. So again, apply flow before I make my final um, puncture. And so I think we are in a good spot. So Madhu, if you could just hold the scope for me. It's a little towards you. Thank you so much. And then Doppler again. Okay. So How many actuations and passes are needed to ensure? Yeah. So in the liver, I think it's important not to do too many. Uh, it's a little different to biopsying a pancreatic mass, for example. In a pancreatic mass or any other solid mass lesions, you want to do fanning. We go 12 to 16 times, I think, in the liver. Um, that will cause fragmentation of your specimen. So uh, we'll go four to six times. So, and you're going to make very long, smooth movements through the liver parenchyma. So here we go. All right. Sometimes the applied little tip can be difficult to see. I want to make sure we can see it. Here we go, Maddie. Just hold it for a second. And then, can you, someone pull? Yeah, okay. Pull it out. Pull. No, pull, 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 pull. pull. Yeah, pull. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, slowly. Good. All right. So, and then, as he's pulling, I am gently. So, how many twos and fours would you do? Yes, I'm doing four to six. So, I've already done three. So, we'll do another. Yeah, I do and three. Maybe... How many do you do? I do one more. Three, like yeah. just one, two, three. Yeah, that's it. Then... Yeah, I think there's a lot of variations in terms yeah. of liver biopsy, right? Yeah. As you mentioned. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. On, the right. <laughs> pull the... on the right. Yeah. So, I think the main thing is you can pull the whole thing out. Pull. Yeah. So, the main thing is that you don't do too many. So, you don't cause fragmentation. So, I've done five accentuations now. So, I'm going to pull the needle out. And I'm going to give it to my tank. Here we go, my dude. Thank you. All right, I got it. Thank you. So your study that you were talking about, the one that compared IR to um, this, it would make sense if you're only doing just the liver biopsy that IR would be okay. But if you're doing multiple things on the patient in terms of like the endoscopy, and today we're going to do the balloon placement. Yes, absolutely. That it would. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, the US community as well, uh, we're yeah. all sensitive about the results of our study. I know we always like to think that we're best at everything. That's not necessarily the yeah. Anubhava, can you tell us what you're doing? Anubhava, can you tell us what you're doing? Look at the core. Looks great. Looks great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Looks great. The mic there, uh, Nagi. Yeah, what I wanted to show here was uh, the most important step at the site of the endoscopy room is to retrieve the uh, white tissues from the blood clots. So I'll just show you in a second. Please hold this. So we have got here a, a big long core of tissue, but the most important part is to separate the white cores from the hemorrhagic tissues. So I'll just show. So this is the, you can see this is the tissue which we have got. Very impressive tissue. Even the other one, long one is the same liver tissue and rather. So uh, this is a, a liver tissue admixed with the blood clot sir. Okay. But if you see here the paler whiter ones, can you see this? Uh, Okay, Can yes. you please focus here? So the paler whiter ones are the actual liver yeah, tissues yeah, and the rest are the hemorrhagic cores. Yeah. So when we attempt to separate these pale white cores from the hemorrhagic cores, we actually tend to retrieve the liver tissue in a better way and uh, we will be able to process um, the liver tissue without uh, uh, cutting it and, uh, and easily identify the portal tracts in the parenchyma rather than when it is enmeshed into the blood clot. So the most important step which we feel is to separate the hemorrhagic cores and the white cores. So the next step will be to, re to remove these uh, white cores and put it separately.
So I'll just show you here. Can you see this paler white tissue? Yes. Yes. So that is actually the main liver tissue and the and the edges are the hemorrhagic cords. Yeah. So when we tend to separate this, we can process them uh, adequately and we get a fair uh, number of portal tracts and adequate parenchyma. This will come on the description of you will get more than 11 triads. Yeah, portal. so an adequate um, biopsy should show more than um, 11 portal tracts. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we have seen that most of these biopsies have a fair number of uh, portal tracts. But the most important part is the processing which should be done at the level of the endoscopic suit. So, I think, G, uh, that was a, uh, the pathologist has approved your procedure now. <laughs> so, I think uh, we, I'm sure we, um, the second part of the procedure will go on, but we'll go to another room where uh, Shannon, I think, is ready with an interesting case. We'll have the history of this case, yeah. We have a 76 year old male who presented with obstructive jaundice and weight loss. His lab showing the total volume of 25 with elevated alkaline phosphatase with CA 99 of around uh, 580. CCD abdomen showing the mass in the head of the pancreas which is encasing the CBD and main proteome with diagonal infiltration. MRCP showing the same calcium in the head of the pancreas with bilateral ISBRD. ERCP could not be performed due to diagonal infiltration. Yes, showing the same with bilateral ISBRD. Plan is to perform an inward viral hepatico-gastrostomy. Running objectives is to understand the tips and tricks of achieving risky biliary drainage in palliative cases, technique and complications of hepatico-gastrostomy, and choosing the appropriate stent. Here is the long-term outcome of HAS using long partially covered metal stent. Technical success was achieved in 100% with functional success in 50%. Recurrent biliary obstruction in the form of stent occlusion or migration was seen in 33%. However, reintervention was techni technically possible in most of the cases. Court Dr. Shaman. So, hi, uh, I have Nan Puli here with me and the best uh, technician in the center, I was told. Um, so, he will be the key to success uh, to this HGS procedure. Um, so, as you can see, my routine patient position is a supine or a little bit uh, um, la uh, lateral with the pillow behind the patient to prevent aspiration. But now, in this case, um, it's done in a supine position. So, it's a linear echo endoscope that I'm using. So while uh, we've been looking around, uh, the patient does have a lot of a liver cysts here, as you can see. So this is the um, portal hilum, uh, where you can see uh, the uh, duct, which is uh, joining into the hilum. So if you trace back to look for uh, potential puncturable ducts, so you see here this uh, long duct is... Um, that is a, is quite dilated. Uh, this uh, measures for mm just now, but the problem with this dot um, is that it's a little bit far away uh, from the liver parenchyma. So, if you take this measurement, it's um, almost about three centimeters. So the thing is, uh, the stand we're using today is uh, going to be a geobor stand, which is um, a stand that uh, I usually use at home. Um, it, we are going to use a 10 centimeter stand, which means that there will be three centimeter uncovered portion which has to be completely in the bow dot, and then you will have a seven centimeter of covered portion. So if you're liver parenchyma, is already three centimeter, meaning that you will only have four centimeter of space to deploy into the stomach. And uh, it is um, a little, the margin here is a little bit um, close. Uh, but I, we looked around to see if we have other options, but um, I wasn't able to find another um, closer uh, option. Or maybe this is a better option. What do you think, Nanzali? Right yeah, this one. This one might be a better option. What do you think, Sandeep? Because this one is a little bit too deep, I think. So this actually, um, apart from the vessel, yeah. 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 But then if you rotate a little, you actually, um, uh, you actually get away from the vessel. So 
So this could be a trajectory. Your needle would be here. And it would be only less than two centimeters. So maybe this uh, should be uh, the one that we're aiming for. So let us put ourselves into position. So this one, let's see. Yeah, this one, this one right here. Yeah, so maybe that's someone that's needs that's to hold the scope. Yeah. Oh. So you see the needle here. So before um, I do the puncture, I usually take away the flow so then it doesn't scare you so much. So it doesn't really matter to overshoot a little bit. So my needle is right here. So let's aspirate to see if we have a uh, bow. So we don't have any bow yet. Oh. Okay, we don't have bow yet. Let's rotate a little and see. It seems that it's yeah, right in. in. Yeah. Let's, uh, can you aspirate and see if there's bow? So usually I'd like to confirm uh, by the presence of bow. Uh, something is coming out. So uh, let's inject. Okay, so we're in. So can we have more contrast? Uh, uh, yeah, a little bit more contrast. Okay, and then enough. And then let's, uh, can you give me a bit of saline? So you don't want the contrast to be too deep in color because you'd have difficulty um, seeing the wire. So now, okay, can we have the wire? Thank you. So you see now that the hilum is clearly shown. And the path seems to be a straight path. So hopefully with the best technician here, uh, we'll be able to get the wire down. So usually in Hong Kong, um, the endoscopists manage to wire ourselves um, so that things are more under control. Can we have the floral? Yeah, so it seems that the wire is going through. So it's uh, the best thing to have the wire at the distal CBD. Uh, can we have a see on look in the, uh, can I, can I do it? Yeah, because uh, if you have the wire in the distal CBD, um, it's actually quite a secure um, location for your wire to be. But it seems like there's a stricture there, I think. Um, uh, yeah, so let's uh, loop the wire in the distal CBD and it will exchange. So during exchange, um, we might need a bit more sedation for the patient. No, no, don't turn, don't turn. Okay, so Simon, fantastic. Uh, we'll come back to you as you're exchanging. Wait, 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 wait. The patient, wait, 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 wait. The patient is moving. Simon, for the us, yeah, we'll, yes. we'll come back to you because we have one more case ready. We will go to uh, the room. I think we will be ready with the case. So we'll have. Yeah. No, no, I know, but then we can exchange. Um, Green? Green, yeah, yeah, green, you're on. Can we not see? I've moved. You just saw a beautiful liver biopsy uh, done. So this is the study where we're doing a paired liver biopsy and balloon insertion. So we talked about the different types of balloons. This is the Spatz balloon. Um, so it's a fluid-filled balloon, but the difference that it, it also has an adjustable strap. And you can see it here. It's adjusted to the balloon, and the balloon is sort of attached to the scope with sort of a, a, a sheet that looks uh, like a balloon sheet as well. And so we're just going to go in. Now, the advantage of um, a spats balloon is that what happens, the way a, a balloon works is that you, uh, can you give me a draw? Yeah. Um, you have um, a little bit of a um, accommodation that can happen. I'm just going to wait for him to yeah. speak a little bit. Yeah. You have accommodation symptoms that can happen when you put a balloon in. So, uh, namely, it, it uh, causes nausea and uh, vomiting and pain, especially at the beginning. So the way this balloon was done was that if the patient has a lot of these symptoms, you can go back in and take some fluid out. And 
The other way around is that if they don't have enough weight, you can go back in and um, put more fluid in to increase uh, their fluid fill. Okay, just, uh, yeah. And so the balloon can stay in up to a year, uh, but we've noticed, and I don't know what uh, people think, is that a lot of times the majority of the weight loss happens at, uh, at four, four to six months. Um, and so we're just pushing the balloon and the scope down. Um, so the Obera is the other balloon that's inserted like this, uh, that's also available. And the way you insert it is, is sort of similar. It has an NG catheter attached to it. So now we're in the GE junction. I'm going to retroflex. And the reason you do that is you want to make sure that the balloon is also in the stomach. And not uh, and not uh, in the esophagus. So the key thing is that you, um, with all these balloon placements, you want to make sure you're uh, inflating below the GE junction. And so as I'm talking, we're putting in 500 cc's of fluid mixed with methylene blue. Uh, and the reason, no, you can keep going. Yeah. Um, and so the reason we're doing that is uh, methylene blue is there as an indicator if the balloon leaks. Uh, you can, um, uh, they, they change the urine color um, into green or, you know, slightly bluish discoloration so you, you know that the balloon is discolored. Um, so this is probably the longest part of any balloon inflation is, is filling in with fluid. Um, the fill is usually anywhere between 400 to 700 cc's. And um, you do that. Now, the patient will have these symptoms of spasm, pain, and nausea, especially at the beginning. So we give them, and I think the protocol here is the same, amend or apoprecent, which is a chemotherapeutic agent that is for nausea. And it really changed the way people react with the balloon. Uh, they have to be on PPIs, but not a very high dose. And uh, they have to be checked for H. pylori beforehand because the balloon can cause pressure ulceration as well. Um, and we give them steroids as well. If they were intubated, they would have uh, dexamethasone, or now they just get a shot of dexamethasone. And they go home on anti-nausea medication and um, boscopan for about one to two days just to uh, learn the accommodative symptoms. So now once we've done 400, and I wasn't counting, were you? Okay. <laughs> um, we'll basically pull uh, the scope. It'll detach from that like catheter sheet that you saw. And uh, we'll pull it out. And the expected weight loss, like we showed earlier on in the study, is about 10 to 14% total body weight loss. But as with everything, they can't just do it alone. I tell patients if they have, you know, crackers, cheese, ice cream, that's going to go around the balloon or pasta, and you're not going to feel full. So you still need to really eat well and uh, have a, a good diet with this. So we're at 350, and this will make 400. This is 350, okay. Um, and so you can see here, I'm going to retroflex even more, if I can. See how... It looks really mm. good, and there's no leakage, which is the other thing you want to uh, check. So um, typically, sometimes I could give a little bit more fluid. There have been reported cases of hyperinflation. Um, the thought is that maybe it happens because of too much PPI. All right, so now we are um, done with the balloon, so I'm going to try and separate myself. Mm by pulling the scope out without taking the balloon with me. Hmm. And so you can see it coming out. Oh, and this perfect. is the uh, sheath. This is the sheath that um, we use to... Um, so now we're going to pull that as well. And then we're going to pull... The, that's the sheath that, has the, that had the balloon on it. So that's out. And then we're going to pull the sheath. So if you can get the camera... I'll go. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, we're going to pull the sheets very slowly up. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So now it's out. 
And then I'm going to un, un uh, twist it. And then we're going to put this cap on top. So this is basically the, um, the adjustable strap of this balloon. And so you can see here that if we want to grab it again, we could go in and grab it with a snare or a rat tooth um, and fill it with more fluid or take, yeah, sorry, or take more fluid out if they have a lot of uh, symptoms. And so now it's here. Tighten it more, but my hands are lubed. <laughs> So he's going to tighten it a little bit more. Okay. My hands are dry. Yeah. This way? Yeah. And this is um, my contribution to the procedure. <laughs> Very important <laughs> to also tight. Yeah. Really tight. Yeah. So ho hold it. Yeah. And so now it will oh. just Maybe. go back in. Let so it go. Let it go like a, j a bungee jump. <laughs> and so now we're going to go back in with this scope to make sure it went in and beyond the G junction. Uh, oh. It's a chin issue. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so now it's here. It's in this, uh, the esophagus. So, so I'm just going to push it down very gently oh. into the stomach. Oh. So you can I see here wow. the 10 minute procedure, oh. very easy, and hopefully he loses more than 10%. Yeah. And you can see here in retroflexion, it looks. Uh, very good. So he goes home. What's the maximum amount of fluid? That thank you. Thank you for the fantastic uh, demonstration. Thank you very much. So, uh, William and you, thank you. So we go on to the next room where I think uh, we have thank actually two hot rooms there. One with Shannon is ready. With, uh, she's uh, doing the HC yeah. and we have our Amrita ready. So Shannon. The two black dots. Yeah. Yes. You want to show us? What do you want to show us? Uh, so uh, we have uh, cannulated it through into the distal CBD. And just now we tried the six friend systotome, but yeah. it didn't go through um, because we're using an O25 Visiglide. Yeah. Uh, with the Visiglide, sometimes uh, the systotome doesn't really go through. And uh, miraculously, uh, Sandeep has the ES dilator, which I thought is exclusive in Japan. And they actually have it in AIG, so I guess AIG has everything. Uh, so with the ES dilator, Dilator, uh, we've dilated the tract already, and uh, we have already inserted the stent, as you can see on the floral. Yeah. And uh, maybe uh, Nantali can uh, explain a little bit about the stent. Yeah, so here we're using the um, geobore stent, which is, um, the size is 8 millimeters by um, uh, 10 centimeters. And see, this is the, um, uh, the portion of uncover, and you can see on the floral that the, the area between the first and the uh, second marker, that's the um, uncovered part, and the rest of it, it's, um, it's covered. No. Okay, so the trick about deploying the stents is that it's like an ERCP stent, so it tends to go in. So you have to um, coordinate well with your nurse or your technician um, so that uh, you know um, how much to deploy. So we can start deploying. So the trick is, has to go slow. And uh, you can see that the sheath is gradually coming back. Yes, yes. So this is a good position. So you can continue to deploy. So sometimes if you want to adjust the position, um, the stent tends to go in. So if he deploys and you don't pull back, then your stent will gradually um, go in. So I think you can go. Yeah, you can go. Go, uh, go cannot stop. Keep, keep. Okay. Oh, okay. So the floor is a little bit heated up. Um, at the uh, at the very important part of the experience. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So that. let's okay. Uh, continue. Okay. So can you continue? Continue X-ray. X-ray. Don't 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 stop. 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 So you must deploy it under X-ray control. So now we're halfway through. So what I usually do is that I deploy in channel. So keep the floor on and you can continue to deploy. And uh, what you're expected to see on the floor is that while he deploys, the stent does not move. 
So that is that is like the perfect way. And now we can switch to Luminal View, uh, which is this one. This one. Okay. And now uh, can you continue the flow? So what I typically do is that you see the stand right here. You give a gentle right torque. And uh, for me, I like to pull the stand back into the esophagus. Uh, because if you do it in the stomach, you lose um, the tract and you cannot do a cholangiogram afterwards. So I would gradually push the stand out while pulling back the uh, scope a little. Push out, pull it a little. Um, can we continue to have the floor, please? <coughs> Yeah, so you see that we're going into the esophagus, which is uh, good. And you can see that the stent is deployed here, uh, which is very nice. So normally, I would exchange it with a cystotome and do a cholangiogram and make sure it doesn't... Um... Uh, can we have the floral, please? Yeah. So sometimes uh, you can see that the tip here um, gets stuck um, in, the, in the stent itself. So um, try not to just pull and jag it out because um, I've had experience where the stent was, uh, was uh, pulled out um, during this maneuver. So you have to be uh, gentle while you pull out the tip of the stent. And now we'll exchange to a cystotome and we'll inject contrast to make sure there is no leak. Um, although I'm pretty confident there is no um, leak. Yes, I mean, thank I you very much for that fantastic demonstration. Thank you. And very nicely demonstrated. Uh, I think uh, this uh, this patient definitely will get some relief from this uh, obstructive jaundice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll go on to another room where I think uh, we have Amrita waiting now. So can you have the history? We have a 67 year old female who presented with dysphagia, weight loss, and regurgitation. There is a man in the showing manifestations of polarization with uh, impaired and low relaxation. There is a barium swallow showing dilated esophagus with whole lot of barium with 5 minutes. So here they are going to perform the oral endoscopic myotomy. Over to Dr. Amrita. Hi there. So, um, yeah, I'm honored I'm getting to show you the full alphabet of, uh, of poems. Yes. <laughs> of course. So just to show you, this is very consistent with what your manometry found. There's a nice pop that goes through. Um, uh, we measured this at about um, 37 or so, so I'm going to, this is a type 2, I'll do a standard um, 8 centimeter above, two, 1 to 2 below, so we're going to come up to about 29 or so here on the, um, on the body, and um, I'm going to do a horizontal incision, that's what I typically do, we'll do the needle out, um, and so we just do a little bit of drop, inject a little just to confirm where posterior is okay stop stop okay and um okay and so we'll inject here we'll make a nice big blub to start with so to make sure we get in the right space okay you know and then i'll take the knife we're going to again use a t-type hybrid knife um, and this is, a, this is the same patient that for which the manometry was done earlier, I believe, um, which really shows you the efficiency here. You can get your manometry and your palm done all in the same day. It's fantastic. Um, so hopefully we'll have this go quickly. Okay, knife out. Great. And I'm going to start here. Okay, we don't have uh, any energy. And I'm not seeing any effect. Can you try to change it to endocut? Q? Okay. And... I think there's something defective there that happened earlier. <laughs> yeah, I know it did. All right, let's... Um, Let's uh, do one quick turn it on and turn it off. Let's just make sure that trick doesn't work. Okay. Knife in. Knife in. Ask Mariana what she did to get it on, you know, when she was doing it as well. On. <laughs> yeah, that was when Roberta was doing uh, her case. There was a little bit of magic Roberta, happening. Roberta was doing it. Roberta, yeah, yeah. 
No, we do, you know, you run through all of the tricks, like turning on, turning it off, doing a little dance, um, changing the knife, which is what we just did. Sometimes these are the things that can take the longest to figure out, but it's better to make sure everything is set um, so that you don't run into trouble later in the case. Okay, knife up. Yeah, okay. Okay. And we're going to... Okay, that didn't work. Hmm? <laughs> I think it's the processor which is set for... Yeah, let's try it. We're going to try it. Um, Okay, there we go. Yes, yes. Okay. So you are you are doing a transposition. Right? Yeah. So that's different. I think that's what the audience should actually see. It's yeah. different from what G did. So it's yeah. a long period of transfers. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be a transverse incision, but the closure will be a vertical closure. And I'll I'll hopefully we get are able to get to that point. But I if not, I'll just explain it um, before we finish go off air um, and I will say that this was a technique that I actually um, learned when I was part of an all women endoscopy video webinar where we were showing different techniques around, from around the world and it was um, Carolina Ladd from uh, Brazil who demonstrated a beautiful video of this uh, vertical incision She's, um, that, I mean, the horizontal incision with very nice results because it really um, facilitates, what setting is it? And look like Does it make your tunneling easier, the horizontal? It makes the entry into the tunnel easier. Okay. Um, a little bit faster. And uh, we're getting a lot of charring effect with this um, setting here. Can you try it, change it to dry cut, please? Okay, so I'll just, say that again? No, can you change it to dry cut, please? Change the setting to dry cut, please? Dry cut, yeah. Yeah, uh, it certainly looks like this is easier to get in than a long-term incision. I'm not getting any... Um, not getting the effect of the cut there, you know. There we go. Yeah, so you'll see in just one second why it um, is easier. So just as we do with the longitudinal, we'll do a little dissection here of the submucosa. Okay. And then we'll clean the screen. Always good to see where you're going. And so I kind of am going to do the same thing that G showed us, um, where you go anterior and start to dissect a little bit, and it lets you in pretty quickly, hopefully. So we're just dissecting out this submucosa to really open it up, um, allow ourselves in. The more you clean here, the better. And you'll see we should get in here. Just dissect a little bit here. We're technically in. I'm just opening that a little bit more. And now we are in the tunnel. Okay, so you see that was pretty quick. Um, and we'll slip out right here, we'll, but we're technically in. And so what happens is that this uh, incision kind of turns a little bit into a box. Um, and 
actually turns into like a vertical incision by the end of it so that it actually allows you to close it in a vertical fashion. Okay. Sometimes, um, yeah, I mean, you can see that it looks very nice, easy to get in, but you make it look, it e look, make it look <laughs> easy also. Right. So what we'll do is we'll go to another room where Mariana now is waiting with her case yeah. and then come back to you as a dissection. Okay. okay, sounds good. We have a specific clearance female who underwent complicated colpistectomy and had a surgical drain placement, which is showing persistent output. Her hemogram is showing leukocytosis. Her scan showing bile leak from cystic duct stump. Plan is to run ERCP on multiple biliary stem placement. Learning objective is, is to understand the approach to the management of biliary leaks and to understand the algorithm for the endoscopic management of biliary leaks. In the study, where 30 biliary leaks were managed, 14 using ES transmural drainage, out of which 83% showed clinical success, and 16 were managed using transpapillary transvascular approach, in which clinical success was seen in 80% of the patients. Over to Dr. Mariana. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Yes, welcome. So in this case, we have Dr. Mariana, who is the main pilot. Along with them, we have Mr. Santosh, one of the senior most technician, anesthetist, Dr. Tejas, and doc Dr. Rubina. So as we have seen in the history, the uh, we are we are seeing a case of uh, bile leak, and it's Strasbourg type A, according to the HEDA scan. And uh, Dr. Mariana is already inside with a balloon and uh, we are going to do a cholangiogram. So we already, yes, we already dilated a bit the, the, the sphincterotomy, uh, did an 8 millimeter uh, dilation uh, because it was a bit tight, huh? So yeah, it was a yep. bit tight. And uh, we will show you now the, the cholangiogram. You ready? The clip looks very far away from the CBD, you know, the clip mm -hmm. is... Yeah, there's a long distance yes. that you'll see the cholangiogram. It's, uh, it's very interesting. So you can uh, inject. Uh, I will come a bit down. Yes, I think the clip has migrated, you know, and the leak is there only. So the cystic duct is very uh, thin, yeah. tortuous. Uh, so at the beginning, the plan was to put a double pigtail stent in the cystic duct to drain uh, the leak. But when we saw this very thin, tortuous uh, cystic duct, I think it's maybe not the best uh, strategy, even with the seven French uh, double pigtail stent. So uh, we, we discussed and we decided maybe we should just try to really optimize the drainage of the CBD. That's why we dilated. And, and we're going uh, to put uh, two uh, double pigtail stents uh, in, the, in the CBD. And Mariana, the insertion of the cystic duct is on the right side. Yeah, and it's a bit further down now. Huh? Yes, it's really on the, the uh, lower third. And also, I think maybe the reason why this leak is not healing properly is that the drain is really at the at the at contact with the, the with the leak. So uh, once we've drained the, the the CBD, I think it will make sense to bring back a bit the drain, so it it's a bit one centimeter for two centimeters further down, but not in contact with the leak. So the choice of the stent usually depends on uh, two things mainly, whether uh, the bile, the, the leak can be bridged or not. And the second thing is whether the gallbladder or the collection can be drained or not. Hmm? You put, yeah, we put the first stent. So the, our plan is to put multiple plastic stent. We are planning for seven French 10 centimeter, two stents. So, Mariana, would you put two wires in the beginning itself or you put a stent and a wire after that? That's your policy? Uh, I, will, I will put them, uh, I'll put first uh, uh, one after the other in the CBD. Yeah. Put the first one, then I'll cannulate next to it. And, then so, and the also the scope position looks a little straight and not like Yeah, standard. I know. Why is that? It's... Oh, no, so now it has taken the yeah. place, yeah. yeah, yeah, inverted hockey stick we call it. Yeah, it was not too, too hockey, Achha. it was a straight stick. Can you have some bush coupon, please? Yeah. Also, is there leakage, air leakage or something from the So we have channel. the first stent here, 
No distension, you mean, Nagi? Distension is not good. I think buscopan. Buscopanistalis. Lot of peristalsis. Peristal Maybe sonum buscopan. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are we are giving we buscopan. Uh -huh. And you prepare. Uh, what do you have out a near CP catheter or a sphincterotome? To put again the guide wire next to it. Okay. So we have the first step going in. So meanwhile, I would like to ask uh, people in the hall, what would be their policy, whether they always do the occlusion cholangiogram or they uh, don't do the occlusion cholangiogram? Huh? Yes, okay. Uh, well, uh, how many of you can <laughs> answer that? Huh? Well, I'll answer, we do an occlusion cholangiogram. Yeah. We what? like to show the leak. I'll just see where my but i have a question there. for okay. mariana if you're putting two stents would you like to put two guide wires first or do them one by one i'll do them one by one okay that's one okay we dilated a bit before for that reason as well So the, the draining the cystic duct could be a good uh, a good option as well, but this is a bit uh, anatomy a bit challenging. So uh, no, it's and too thin, thin too, cystic too thin duct. and very tortuous. Yes, very uh, tortuous. Yeah. You will go across the lumen. You know, I think it's the best. You're inside. We don't even have time to see. You guys are already inside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wire change. You are on the left. Okay, you good. Now. You want me to? You both put. I good? have a question for Mariana. Yes. Push more inside. Okay. Okay. Answer. Take the yeah. question. So, Tell us. Uh, even if cystic duct leak is there, do you always prefer to place a cystic duct stent or CBD stent is fine? Push, push. Uh, it, it, if if the anatomy is uh, suitable, yes. <laughs> if it's a persistent. Um, yeah. So, uh, so the I recent article the from GIE of Dr. Mariana, it was like, uh, it's always better if we could uh, heal, uh, stand the cystic duct leak also. If you have a collection with a large uh, cystic duct and it's short, I think it's a good idea to put the, the double pigtail. But here it's a... Uh, and you... I think that if we dra drain properly, the CBD will be enough. Yes, and you leave the okay. cystic duct stent, how proximal to the leak? It can go in the leak. It can go up to the leak. Yes, it can go up to the leak and then you, you, you still have to stent your CBD. And then we leave them for uh, three months. We come back. If there's no more uh, collection, uh, we, we can take out the drain, of course, in the meantime. Then we come back. And if, it's, if there's no more collection in the CT scan, then we will take the... Um, Double pigtail from the cystic duct out and just leave the, the again two stents in the CBD for another three months and then we can uh, go back after three months and check if everything is good. When and would you, you consider fully covered stems? Uh, that's also a, a, a alternative. Uh, the major problem is the migration. Huh? So uh, there are some tricks for that. You can put a double pigtail stent inside the um, the fully covered stent or even next to it. Um, there was an interesting study that, that showed that if you put the fully covered stent and next to it a double pigtail stent, it will anchor it and it will still provide drainage if the, if the fully covered stent uh, migrates in the meantime. So that's also uh, something that uh, can be considered. And when would you refer the case for surgery? Uh, when uh, nothing works. Complex. <laughs> but very usually rare. we find the solutions. Yes, very uh, Okay, we go up. I think we are through with this also. Nagi, we, Mariana has done a quick, good job. So, 
That would be done. Yeah, yeah, you can uh, release uh, your inner prerogative. Okay. Yes. So are you pulling back the external drain also now? Yes, I think that we should uh, re uh, readjust a bit the drain. Yeah. So it's not in contact with, uh, with that area. Yes. Not take it out, of course, immediately. But uh, maybe, you know, two centimeters. We'll Thank you. As well. Yeah. Thank you, Mariana, yeah. for the fantastic demonstration. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you. So we'll go to now Amrita's room we'll to see what's happening there. Yes, yes. Yeah. She was Amrita, Thank you on. very much. So we've just been uh, tunneling along here. I'll just show you, come back, show you the tunnel. I try to keep it a little bit on the wider side just to make sure I keep orientation and also try to cut, uh, dissect very close to the muscle. And I mean, the other thing is what we just said, you said, I guess we find shorter myotomy is uh, better. What, what is your feeling on that? Yeah, so I, I think that's currently the area of study. Um, I think for type 1, certainly, we can do shorter myotomies. Um, for type 3 are the ones that you really want to be long, and type th 2 are somewhere in the middle. I think that there's a lot of interest in seeing if we can get away with even three centimeter esophageal side myotomies, um, three to five, possibly uh, thinking that we don't need to do the full length. You know, my until the, we have the data, uh, we are going to be part of a study to look at that. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see what it shows. Actually, um, we published a randomized control trial you did. Okay. comparing six with three centimeters in patients with uh, sigmoid and well, it's type two with sigmoid and uh, three was as good as uh, six. There's no difference between short. That, and that was um, both sigmoid and type two, or um, patients who had both of those conditions, or uh, just even naive treatment, naive type two. So uh, Amrita uh, Mohan here. I, I, we did. Uh, we excluded type 3 and we uh, included type 1 and 2 irrespective of sigmoid present or not uh -huh. and we thought that or we found that type 2 uh, the the even a short myotomy was equally efficacious and then we followed this patient for 6 months to see if there is any less reflux with short myotomy because if you can if you do a long myotomy unnecessarily in type 2 uh, the emptying may be, uh, uh, you know, delayed. So we want a good emptying. If there is a good uh, uh, contractions, uh, even if they are not coordinated, they can still help us in uh, emptying. And we found that there was some trend of less reflux if you do shorter myotomy. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what we want a more uh, a larger number of patients to prove this because uh, uh, there were few events we saw that. There was a return of peristalsis in uh, two cases. Okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, so idea was not to cut unnecessary in type two. Okay. Well, the good thing about the tunnel length is that you can still adjust the um, how you know the uh, length of the actual myotomy. Um, so we can still plan to do that. Is to have a shorter uh, myotomy for this case. Are you at the D junction? Yeah, we're we are here. We're we are here. And one of the things I was going to point out was that sometimes it's actually can be difficult to dissect beyond it in very tight. Um, if the you know the sphincter is tight, and you actually have to start a little bit of the myotomy to help you uh, get down onto the cardiac side, um, right here. So what I'm going to do is take this with the precise sect, um, which I'm using. It's really allowed us to kind of not have to necessarily change out for the coag graspers. So these are the two sets of perforating vessels. They usually uh, indicate that you're close down to the GE junction. Um, but yeah, it's definitely tighter, and on the measurement on the scope, I'm very close. Oh, Dr. Ramit, uh, what are the signs that you are crossing the G junction and you are in the stoma? So a few signs. One is that you can feel the tightness and you can actually see the, the junction narrowing. The other is uh, presence of the spindle uh, vessels. Mm -hmm. um, they are the small sort of squiggly vessels. And then, of course, when we, when we feel like we're getting there, 
we'll go in and check with our um, scope and look for the blob on the cardia side. But I'm definitely feeling resistance here as I go down. It can be a little become harder to sort of separate the mucosa um, from the muscle. Right here, we want to be careful not to kind of cut into the um, middle of the muscle fibers and split the muscle fibers. So I definitely want to go above this strand here. How much you go down into a stoma? So, um, so it's definitely been shown that a shorter, a one to two centimeter, um, keeping the, the cardia myotomy shorter is helps with the reflux. Um, so we don't want to make it too long. Uh, so I would only go one to two centimeters into the cardia. Um, and then other techniques for palm that have been demonstrated to help as anti, what we call an anti-reflux palm, um, are to preserve the sling fibers. If you do see the perforating vessels, is to perform the myotomy on the right side, a little more anti, staying a little more anterior. Um, and then as the group here has shown, perhaps a smaller mine. You can see right here, I think, is the junction. You see that? And so yeah, we what, we, what we might do, what I might do is actually take a little bit of the muscle here just to help. Can we depend on G junction uh, that we measured before? No, so, uh, that's a good point. So one thing that's important to do is to sort of measure it in a couple of ways. Um, you, you don't want to just do it with pu pushing the scope in, because sometimes the scope, as it goes through the GE junction, will sort of start to buckle. Yeah. Um, so passing it into the stomach and then withdrawing. Um, and then I find that you know once you're just in the tunnel, the scope, uh, the GE junction measurement comes to be, can change. I think Amal has showed, Papaya from Pune has showed some work looking at measuring the esophagram. Uh, there's a formula involved that can help determine. So I'm just cutting the muscle a little bit here to help us get into the cardia. As you can see how tight it is. And I want to be careful because the mucosa is, is pretty close. And of course, I'm not going to stop here because we're not there yet. But at least it will help us get down onto the cardia side. So the most important not to injure the mucosa. Absolutely. So that's the one thing that can lead to the complications. So it's of course we're going to take the muscle anyways. So we always that's why I dissect closer to the muscle side. And you can see there beneath us it's opening it up nicely. The right below is definitely on the cardia. And can you all see that as we go down through this space? Yeah, it's very really nicely seen. I think how yeah. it's opening up now. Yeah. I'm going to cut a little bit more here. And I tend to do my um, myotomy as a retrograde myotomy. Uh, so I don't mind that I'm cutting the muscle uh, now. Uh, what is the difference or advantage of retrograde myotomy? No, no, um, no significant adva advantage um, in terms of outcomes. But for me, I've I've always felt that as you go down. Okay, so this is actually the next, the second perforating vessel here. So technically, if we wanted to. We should do it on this side of the. Um. So what I see, you do transverse incision, and you do retrograde myotomy. Yeah, <laughs> I, a little bit different, I guess, than the classic techniques. But you know, the techniques evolve, I think, and also what you feel more comfortable. With. So the the reason I was saying that I like to do the retrograde is because. I find that, um, so I, I don't always do a uh, full thickness, especially with, when, I, when we're doing the like, longer myotomies. 
and the body of the esophagus. Um, so let's see. I'm just going to measure this to yeah. see whether I think I can make it through. So you're, you're going to the right to decrease the chance of reflex. Yeah, exactly. And I didn't know, I, it's a good thing I sort of saw this. Okay. So, um, yeah, I hadn't seen it before, but uh, because I saw it now, I'm just adjusting a little bit more right word. Um, so what I was saying about the retrograde is that I, what I find is that when you are pushing through, when you start antegrade, I find that it splits the... Um, puts the longitudinal muscles quickly, and you have sort of more chance of having uh, capno, uh, thorax, mediastinum, which just can, you know, sometimes complicate things a little bit. Um, and so, and if I run into a complication, I would rather have completed the myotomy of the GE junction where it's needed the most, as opposed to higher up. Now, if we're doing shorter myotomies, maybe that's not going to be as important. You could, uh, if you come to complication, what is the most serious complication of poem? I wouldn't say most serious, but certainly severe ones can be large vessel bleeding of large vessels. Yeah. Um, if you you know do have uh, a significant amount of pneumomyist of uh, capnos mediastinum or thorax, you can get sometimes effects, but those are usually manageable by decompression. Okay, so I think we've dissected probably deep enough. We'll just... Yeah, I think you know, It almost yeah. looks like the G-palm, right? Um, we're just going to inject here, and then we'll go back and look at the, um, the bleb, and then we'll plan for a short myotomy. Uh, needle in, knife in. So here's the tunnel. You can you always want to make sure you haven't gone too far off track. It looks pretty straight to me. Pretty nice tunnel. Thank you. And you can see yeah. the bleb here all the way down. We see it crossing the GE junction. And sometimes it can be difficult to appreciate. Again, other techniques to check this site could be a double scope technique. So you always check. I always check before doing myotomy. Before doing my, but you can see there. Yeah, you can see. Okay, good. So we're well into that space. So we're going to go back now and start the myotomy. And you mentioned you don't do full sickness myotomy, isn't it? So I. I I don't necessarily do it, like if, for example, if I'm doing a, a type 3, a long one, I don't do it in the body of the esophagus. Uh, I don't think it's necessary. Mm -hmm. And as someone, I think G was mentioning yesterday, the, the longitudinal fibers tend to split on their own. So it's not really a myotomy of the longitudinal fibers. Um, but patients who, for example, are post heller um, I do tend to do those ones full thickness. Um, at home, I use EndoFlip a lot to, to just take that out for one second, um, to really measure whether we've done enough. And, um, okay, so we're just going to hop in here. Okay. So, is it entity to the tunnel in transverse incision? I think so. Um, okay, here we go. Um, actually, it's down here. And we'll just take the knife back. Okay. Okay, and we're going to, like I said, do retrograde. Knife out. Okay. Oops. There we go. So I'm going to start down here. Thank you. And what I do, similar to the G palm, I kind of do it in a little bit of a layer. And 
and then I'll go back and see what I have to cut more. And I'm using cautery in case there are vessels underneath. And there you can see, I think, the longitudinal showing. Dr. Amelta, what is your advice for the beginners? Do you advise to start with transverse incision and retrograde myotomy or like longitudinal and antigrade? So the, I think the difference in the um, incision orientation has to do with the closure. I do think it's easier to get in. So if you don't want to struggle, um, yeah, yeah. that's a good place to start as long as you, you know, know how to close. Um, I would probably start antigrade in terms of the myotomy to really, you know, understand the, the depth that you have to go to when you're first starting the procedure. You can see, you see the longitudinal behind there? Yeah, really nicely, really yeah. nice. So then it's kind of like keeping that plane and just pulling back the way when your a boat is going through the water and you see the current splitting right behind you. And then we'll just go back and take a look. There. You see a little bit of full thickness there, which is perfectly yeah. fine. When you get towards the top, then you can run into a little bit of difficulty keeping your tip deflected down enough. So we said we're going to keep it relatively short. So I'm now at 33, which would be more or less a five centimeter, um, my a five total, a length in total. So if we did it um, five above GE junction, then 32 is where I would come to. Getting close. Just go back check here and then cut here so we are cutting just circular muscle um mostly circular there's a few spots where there is full thickness but that's i think okay yeah But it's, it kind of allows you to continue on without having to start and stop too many times. Okay, and I think we're close. We're just yeah. going to look here. Looks good. Maybe a few fibers there. I'm the What's that? And there are some few fibers there which look a little... Circular. Yeah, so these, what's interesting, I think... The question is, are these circular fibers or oblique fibers? Mm -hmm. So if I follow and look like this, to me they look like oblique fibers yeah. and not necessarily circular. Yes. Um, but then right here you'll see that we get run into, there's the circular layer right here. So we want to make sure we cut these fibers. And we're pretty close to um, the end. Whoops. And we're now at 30, this is, I think, the end of the myotomy, the other, I guess the beginning of the myotomy. Um, but I think that's pretty complete. We'll just cut these fibers right here. Go back, anterograde. Okay. And what about proximal extent of myotomy? How much it should be far from the... Uh, incision, mucosal incision? Well, um, it depends on how long you want your myotomy to be. So, 
technically it should be at least two to three centimeters below the, the um, mucosal incision. Um, but in this case where we made the tunnel a little bit longer than we are doing the myotomy, uh, we just want to go on the length of the myotomy itself. So this is see, these are split longitudinal, little fold thickness. It is tight going through here, so I'm going to go ahead and take these fibers. Okay, and then going back down. Now it's it looks like maybe just a couple of fibers here. How long do you think was the myotomy? I think it's about um, five. Five. So a uh, five uh, in the in the uh, esophagus. esophagus, yeah. And two below. Yeah, I think two, one or two below. Maybe we'll just cut a little bit more on this side. Right here. Any advantage of doing the reverse method of doing the myotomy? Nathan? Like we go from incision side to the yeah. cardia and you are coming from the cardia to the yeah. incision side. Any advantage you feel in this? So for me, I, I think I would prefer that any complication and, and sort of full thickness happens. Oh, actually, can I have the knife again? Um, ha happens on the distal side where... You know, the most important thing here is the myotomy, and I think if the, sh the data about shorter myotomy length pans out, then really it, you're just cutting uh, slightly above and below the sphincter. So that's the most important aspect of what we have to cut. And um, what we don't want is for some complications. Oops, what's happening here? Uh, knife out? Okay. Uh, we don't want a complication to occur too early on that makes the rest of the procedure. Yeah, something interesting has happened. Let's just try. Mohan is there and also what we have seen at the OG junction, the LES gastric side is not always constant. It varies from 1 cm to 3 cm. So the length of the myotomy we do according to the manometry finding, it may be 1 cm, it may be 2 cm. We have sent our abstract to DDW also this year. Uh, the length of the gastric myotomy should be decided upon the manometry finding. Um, so I think this looks pretty good. My the top of the um, the top of yeah. the myotomy is at actually here is at thirty four, mm -hmm. um, and it extends down to forty. And the incision is at 31. And the incision, you know, we, we tunneled a little extra. I just wanted to tunnel. Well, my, I tunneled with the in intent that we have a longer myotomy, but we adjusted it based on uh, the study that you mentioned. So the, the incision is way up at higher, actually. Anyway, the longer this, the safer you are. Yeah, yeah, I would say that's true, too. Um, how do you all feel about um, this myotomy? You think that's enough, or you want me to cut a little more? No, I think that's good enough, yeah. Okay. So then we'll just, um, we, you always inspect, make sure there's no bleeding. Um, okay. And we'll decompress and then we'll get ready to close. Can we have some clips, please? Clips? So any preference for any particular clips or resolution you are using again? We are going to use resolution. Um, I don't think it, it really matters. Um, again, I like to control the clip. I do something a little, actually, G did demonstrate it yesterday. We'll, we'll start at sort of on normal tissue, and then right before the second to last clip, clip the top to make sure that we don't have any um, issues here. But actually doing it this way, we've, I've been able to reduce the number of clips we need sometimes to about four. So let's see if that works out. So now you can also even don't get to the man. Yeah, exactly. Okay, oops. So I'll, do, I'll, I'll turn it. Thanks. It's okay. Okay. So I'm going to go sort of normal tissue here, tip deflect down, close. 
Okay, uh, actually open. I just want to make sure. Is there any risk for luminal narrowing after the Close. incision and then closure? Good. The point? Um, no, I don't think so. Thank you. So then we'll do, we'll use the cap to kind of push the clip away. And you can see that how the mucosa is, can be made a little taut so that we have actual apposition of the edges as opposed to letting it invert, which can cause some problems uh, towards the end of the closure. Yes, and your horizontal cut has become vertical now. Exactly. It looks just like the vertical. I'll, I'll do it. The standard one would be a... I'll YouTube. turn. I'll turn. Let me, just let me turn. No, no. I'll, <laughs> I'll turn it. Thank you. Thanks. In our place, everything is on autopilot. Okay. You just stand there and they turn it for you. <laughs> I know. I, I, I see that. Um, you know, at ERCP, we just have to pass the scope. The rest is done by them, you know. I know. Open all the way. Okay. So I'm just going to push the clip away a little bit so it, it um, helps lift the mucosa. Okay. Can you turn it? Okay. Rotate, yes. The other way. Okay, good. Stop. Open. You're open all the way. Uh, rotate, please. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Close here. Good. Deploy. Why do you want to close horizontally? What is the reason behind? So it's a little difficult to actually close horizontally because you can't really get the other end of the clip to dip down. Yeah. So um, that's why, that's why if I do, when I do horizontal example, for example, in the stomach, I'll turn it. Yeah. I will turn, I'll turn it. Okay. Um, uh, that's why I use suturing. So open here. So what I'm gonna do here is actually get this side Close. Yep. Good. Deploy. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And then we're going to go in between and place another clip in there. Um, so hopefully this, we only need one clip here. But yeah, so it can be difficult to close um, horizontally if you can if you don't have sort of a ridge. You see that in the duodenum a lot um, when you're trying to close. That if it's over a fold, you can't get the the other end to to go down. Okay. So I'll just get inside here. I think the number okay. of clips is less in comparison to vertical incision. Yeah. So the key will be just making sure I can get it deep enough. And then I suction a little. Close here. And we just always want to check before we deploy. So I think I have both sides here. Yes. Deploy. And I'm going to do one more just for safety. One more clip here. But you can see the tissue 
uh, there, it allows it to really um, expose both edges. Okay. Hopefully this should be the last one. Open. Open. Let's, well, let's make sure. Close here. I think we have both sides. I think. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. And I think that that should be closed. Yeah. So thank you, Amrita. That was a fantastic uh, demonstration. We started today with you and ending with you. <laughs> so this is the last case for the day. And thank you very much for that very nice demonstration. Thank you. So, Manu, I think so. We should end this. I'll just say for everyone. Yeah. So we'll give everyone a big hand for the wonderful demonstrations we have had. Amrita. Yes. You can hear that. That was for a wonderful. Thank you. Not the last one. That was for the one and a half days. And I, and I, on behalf of all of the faculty, um, we really want to thank all of you for again for this wonderful opportunity. It's been a fantastic experience um, to be here at AIG with you. And thank you so much for the opportunity for all of us. Yes, and Alton, thanks for being with us. Yes, thank you for AIG, for Dr. Reddy, and for all of you. It was a great opportunity. Okay, so we close down from this end, and all of you, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you all. And I hope you have enjoyed the entire day. <laughs>